Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, pursuant to Standing Order 12, I lay on the table a warrant nominating senators as additional temporary chairs of committees when the deputy president and chair of committees is absent. I'll now call on the clerk. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Senator Seaworth. Senator Rice wants to uh, seek leave. Okay, Senator Rice, you'll see, you're seeking leave. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to seek leave um, to have a speech that I was giving last night and got cut off um, because of technical difficulties to be incorporated into Hansard. Yep. Yet I understand that uh, that was granted for Senator Di Natale, and it's now being sought by Senator Rice for her own speech. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Rice. Thank you. Uh, call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment prohibiting academic cheating services bill 2019 resumption of second reading debate. Um, Senator Billy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, as I was saying yesterday when I started my speech, university students, both domestic and international, need to know that when they make the largest investment of their young lives, they are investing in a quality product which is untainted by scandal and deliberate attempts to deceive. Because every time a student gets away with cheating, they devalue the qualifications of everyone who has graduated from that institute of higher learning. They devalue the institution itself and they devalue Australia's higher education sector more broadly. And I was saying that I just started speaking yesterday um, before I had to uh, be interrupted that in my home state, the University of Tasmania has managed to leverage quality education with the livability of the cities of Hobart, Launceston and Burnie. And this brings um, income into our state. Education has become uh, a, a, an export industry in the same way that um, exporting our manufactured goods or our raw products has. Nationally in 2014-15, the Australian Bureau of Statistics valued exports from international education at $18.8 billion, making it Australia's third largest export. There were more than 350,000 international students enrolled in the higher education sector in Australia through 2017. And according to an Australian Government Department of Education and Training research snapshot published in November 2016, international education provided Tasmanians $211 million in goods and services export revenue, um, uh, to, sorry, $211 million in goods and services export revenue in 2015-2016 making my home state uh, the fourth largest making it my home state's fourth largest sort of source of export income sorry we must secure the integrity of the service that this revenue is based upon so labor supports the intention of this bill to implement the recommendations of the higher education standards panel or hesp to introduce deterrence to third party academic cheating services in higher education HESP, in their advice to the Minister for Education in March 2017, considered that inadequately constrained cheating activity has the potential to cause great damage to the domestic and international reputation of Australian higher education. 
HESP was asked by the Education Minister for advice on opportunities to deter and prevent organised and commercial cheating in Australian higher education following the My Master cheating scandal, which was revealed in 2015. And those listening may recall that the My Master company was hired by up to 1,000 students from 16 universities to ghostwrite their assignments and sit online tests. Thankfully, it appeared that students from UTAS had no involvement in this scandal. There is currently no Australian jurisdiction with offences specifically aimed at deterring or punishing cheating by students or organised cheating services. HESP considered that organised commercial cheating presents possibly the greatest current reputational risk to Australian higher education. And this bill seeks to create an offence by providing, offering to provide or arranging for a third party to provide an academic cheating service to a student undertaking an Australian higher education course of study or an overseas higher education course of study provided at Australian premises. To fall within the definition of academic cheating service, a provider must work to provide to or undertake work for students where the work forms a substantial part of an assessment task that students are required to personally undertake. The explanatory memorandum particularly notes that the incidental or inconsequential assistance, advice or example answers that might be offered to a student are not at risk of being captured by the new offence provisions. Labor understands that there is a strong stakeholder support for legislation to safeguard academic integrity in Australia's university sector. And this includes from the group of eight universities, the Council of Australian Postgraduate Associations and the National Union of Students, as well as other universities and TAFEs. The offences in this bill are accompanied by harsh penalties in order to deter and combat the detrimental consequences that academic cheating services have on the reputation of Australia's higher education product. Where an academic cheating service operates for a commercial purpose, strict liability will apply to the physical element of the offence, and both criminal and civil penalties will apply, including a maximum penalty of two years in prison. Where an academic cheating service is not operating for a commercial purpose, only civil penalties will be incurred. The business model of academic cheating services is becoming more insidious. The explanatory memorandum to the bill suggests that the persu persuasive advertisements for their services may exploit vulnerable students by promoting themselves as altruistic enterprises, even acting in the interests of students under academic stress. The bill creates offences for advertising or publishing or broadcasting an advertisement for an academic cheating service to students. And these offences also carry a, maxim, a maximum penalty of two years in prison if the academic cheating service that is advertised is operating for a commercial purpose. Madam Deputy, uh, Madam Deputy President, Labor is very concerned about vulnerable students being targeted by academic cheating services. As well as deterrence provided through the offences in the bill, Labor would encourage universities and higher education providers to provide and publicise support services for these students so when they are struggling they will have somewhere to turn. This is particularly important for international students who may be away from family and friends for the first time. As I said earlier, Labor support this bill. What we do not support and cannot support are the attacks on the higher education sector that have come from this government. Labor knows all too well that investing in and maintaining our world-class universities is good for us all. The value that university education has added to Australia's productive capacity is estimated at $140 billion in GDP. We know that Australia will require an additional 3.8 million university qualifications by 2025, according to a report prepared for Universities Australia. And it's why Labor invested in the university sector when we were in government. After years of neglect under the previous Howard government, Labor boosted investment in universities from $8 billion in 2007 to $14 billion in 2013. We also opened up the system with demand-driven funding in 2012, which saw an additional 190,000 Australians able to get a place at university before the government ended 
demand-driven funding. We also wanted to ensure that the opportunity to go to university was made available to all Australians, particularly those who have to overcome structural disadvantages. And it worked. Labor policy saw an extra 220,000 Australians have the opportunity of going to univ of, of university education. Financially disadvantaged students' enrolments increased by 66 per cent. Indigenous undergraduate student enrolments increased by 105 per cent. Enrolments of undergraduate students with disability grew by 123 per cent. And enrolments of students from regional and remote areas increased by 50 per cent. Yet when it comes to our higher education system, this government's approach is cut, cut, cut. They have capped university places, cut $2.2 billion from the system and locked more than 200,000 students out of the opportunity of a university qualification. They have cut $328.5 million from university research. The minister himself said to the National Press Club that productivity improvements in the higher education sector can deliver $2.7 billion to Australia's GDP per annum. How will this be achieved when the government's policy is to destroy the sector? Universities are also economic powerhouses within the community, particularly in our regions. They provide jobs, train regional workers and prepare our young people for the future challenges that our country is facing and will face. Research has found that seven in ten regional university graduates take up work outside of metropolitan areas. Those universities and students reinvest more than $2 billion a year in regional communities with university campuses. And I know that UTAS makes an important contribution to my home state of Tasmania. However, it's facing very rocky times following the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been reported recently in the media that the University of Tasmania has taken on debt of $130 million and frozen salaries. It was also reported that their financial modelling shows that they face revenue losses in 2020 of between $30 to $34 million and between $60 to $120 million per year in 2021 and 2022. Vice-Chancellor Rufus Black said the institution will take on $130 million in debt over the next four years in a bid to share the costs between current and future generations. Apparently $40 million to $50 million a year would need to come, out, um, would need to come from salaries and it is prioritising a voluntary redundancy process over forced layoffs. It's clear that the Morrison government is not adequately supporting our university sector. Workers shouldn't have to bear the brunt of failed government policies. Australia cannot afford to let our universities fall off a cliff. The Australian government must act now to shore up our universities. The COVID-19 pandemic and global travel restrictions have led to a crisis in this funding model, with income from international students plummeting over recent months. And the government cannot and has yet to explain why a full-time university worker, many with families to support, are not eligible for JobKeeper when other sectors are. Universities across Australia employ 260,000 people. That's an enormous sector and it does great work. Research conducted at Australian universities is saving lives and leading the world. Already this year, the University of Melbourne researchers were the first to develop a lab-grown coronavirus outside China in a major breakthrough that will speed up work towards a vaccine for the disease. The University of Queensland has been asked to use its recently developed rapid response technology to develop a new vaccine for the coronavirus outbreak, which could be available worldwide in as little as six months. And universities train the doctors, nurses and health experts that Australia has relied upon during this pandemic. For months now, Labor has been urging the Morrison government to act to help universities and to save jobs. But the Prime Minister hasn't done anything to help, and now jobs are being lost with thousands more to come. And of course, we do not know how many voluntary redundancies will occur at UTAS, nor what would happen if enough people don't volunteer. 
The Morrison government changed JobKeeper eligibility criteria for universities after they were initially announced, which has stopped staff at many universities from getting fair access to the scheme. And this is putting tens of thousands of jobs at risk, including many in regional Australia. Already we have seen announcements that hundreds of jobs will go at Deakin University, Central Queensland University and Latrobe University, and the impact on regional communities will be devastating. Universities supporting 14,000 jobs Thank you, in country Thank you, Senator Your time Australia. has expired. Minister. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Urquhart. To your attention, the State of the Chamber. Um, yes, quorum required. Thank you. Ring the bell for quorum. If you wonder what we're doing. Thank you. Um, quorum has been reached, um, and I'm going to call the minister. Unless anyone else is jumping, minister. Thanks, um, thanks, deputy president. And uh, look, I thank senators for their contribution to the detail of the debate on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency amendment prohibiting academic cheating services bill 2019. Uh, I note there are a range of other. Uh, more extraneous and unrelated uh, comments and contributions made during the debate as well. Uh, I would just on, uh, on that front uh, again remind senators that, uh, that in terms of support for uh, higher education in Australia uh, that continues to receive record levels of funding, that continues to grow in the forward years of the, uh, of the Australian budget uh, and, uh, and that indeed the government has provided guarantees in relation to uh, the flow of taxpayer support to Australian universities uh, during the pandemic. But those matters are not what this bill seeks to address. Uh, this bill seeks to ensure uh, that uh, we deliver, uh, as a nation, a strong stand against uh, cheating in Australian universities, uh, which tarnish the reputation of our very valuable higher education sector. Our efforts here are designed to ensure that we continue to deliver uh, a world-class higher education offering to students from Australia and from around the world who choose to study with Australian institutions. The penalties in this bill are designed to deter the undertaking of cheating and particularly to deter the provision and advertising of cheating, especially for academic cheating services. The capacity to block cheating websites will make it harder for students in Australia to access those services and for them to provide their scurrilous offering. I would like to thank the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills for their consideration of this bill. As requested by the committees, an addendum to the explanatory memorandum was tabled to explain the compatibility of the civil penalties in the bill with the processes used in criminal law and reasons for placing the burden of proof on the defendant for particular offences. I would also like to thank the opposition for their constructive engagement on the bill. 
Several other amendments to the explanatory memorandum were made to provide additional clarification on matters they and other stakeholders raised. These include clarifying that students who publish their old essays will not be subject to prosecution under the bill and that people who inadvertently promote academic cheating services on social media will also not be, not be affected. Uh, the development of this bill has, uh, has been indeed uh, a lengthy process. It commenced uh, with consideration uh, by the Higher Education Standards Panel uh, of the issue of contract cheating. Uh, back during 2016 and 2017, I was pleased to have initiated uh, those considerations by the panel at the time. The panel found the complex array of state, territory and Commonwealth laws relevant to cheating offences makes it difficult to pursue legal solutions against providers of cheating services. The panel's advice uh, was that additional legislative backing was needed to more effectively deal with such risks and the panel advocated uh, that this should be modelled on New Zealand's approach, uh, which ensures legislation is aimed particularly at those who provide the cheating services rather than students who might use those cheating services. I thank the Higher Education Standards Panel, uh, which reviewed this issue uh, and whose work under the then Chair, Professor Peter Shergold, has provided the strong basis for our government's actions in this bill. Uh, I thank the, thank the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency uh, under its leadership uh, for their work and advice, uh, as well as uh, various universities, advisers and other stakeholders uh, to government, uh, including uh, previous advisers, Professor Don Markville and Darren Brown, who have helped to drive this. Uh, I note the very uh, valuable consultation and work uh, that my successor in this portfolio, Minister Tian, has continued to undertake uh, with his advisers and team to ensure that we have uh, a bill uh, that will give public confidence in the quality of graduates from our higher education institutions and stop unscrupulous cheating services preying on vulnerable students. Once again, I thank senators for the engagement on this topic and commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. And I believe there are amendments, so we will move to the committee the whole. Now I'll put the question on the second reading. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move um, Green's Amendments 1, 2 and 3 on sheet 886. Uh, you want to, you're seeking leave to move them together? Yes. yes. Uh, is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, these amendments are about restricting the application of civil penalties in this legislation um, to commercial providers for cheating services and removing them from individuals who are non-commercial providers. And I just want to be clear that this uh, amendment does not remove um, civil or criminal penalties uh, for commercial cheating services. Um, and as I spoke about this in the bill, you know, it's, it exposes uh, individuals to civil penalties. And although the minister in the other place has said that you know, students and families and friends are protected, I think we can make it completely watertight today um, and make sure that there are no civil penalties, which could be up to more than $100,000 um, um, in the case of this particular legislation um, that could expose individuals to um, these penalties. And really, it is uh, up to the universities, for instances like this, to have the resources and the funding to be able um, to support their students and to, able, to be able to um, deal these. And these penalties are not even remotely commensurate with the low-grade academic misconduct um, that might happen, and universities must be resourced um, to um, deal with those. So I commend the amendments. All right. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Mm, Minister. Oh, okay. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, the government uh, uh, does not support the amendments. We have consulted extensively on the legislation, including uh, release earlier this year of an exposure draft of the bill, 
uh, from which a number of issues were raised and that the government responded. Uh, in terms of the issues were raised, uh, we looked carefully at, uh, at criminal penalties and ensure they are limited to situations where the cheating service or advertising is done for a commercial purpose. Uh, the maximum financial penalty, civil financial penalty, has been halved uh, under the changes. Uh, the scope of cheating assistance that is prohibited by the bill has been more tightly defined uh, to where a substantial part of an assessment task is undertaken by a third party. Uh, the government recognises that, uh, that um, the bill seeks to prohibit unpaid cheating assistance as well. That's based on the fact that Australian research has shown a large proportion of third party cheating occurs on an unpaid basis uh, by friends, family uh, or others in the community. And this type of cheating is equally a threat to the integrity of student assessments and qualifications earned uh, and, uh, and indeed in some fields of study can lead to dangerous outcomes. It's not anticipated that many such cases in relation to unpaid cheating would reach the courts, except in the most serious cases of repeated, deliberate and extensive infractions. The clear intention of the bill is to deter cheating assistance rather than to prosecute friends and family members. Uh, I would stress very much that in every case, prosecution of offences under this law will be at the discretion of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions. The DPP will make an informed judgment about the strength of the evidence and likelihood of conviction, as well as the seriousness and value of the offences in question and the public value of achieving a successful conviction as a deterrent to other potential offenders. The government hopes to see prosecutions under the law where people are clearly doing the wrong thing, uh, but in the cases uh, of family, friends and mild uh, levels of cheating, we would anticipate uh, that this should act as a clear deterrent and that the systems in place provide sufficient safeguard that the type of outcomes uh, that drive Senator Faruqi's understandable concerns would not be realised, but we do think on balance it is worth keeping uh, the clear disincentive created by this bill in place uh, to make sure uh, that all forms of cheating are discouraged under the legislation. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against? Aye. The amendment is lost. Sorry, big friend. The noes have it. Shall we move on to um, the amendment on sheet 8996? Senator Griff. Okay. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move amendments 1 to 4 on sheets 8996 together. Thank you. Leave. Is leave granted? I move, granted. I move the amendments. Minister. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Just for the record, uh, and I understand um, Senator Griff's amendments are uh, seeking to address broadly the same issues that Senator Faruqi raised before, and uh, for the same reasons, the government does not support those amendments. Thank you. For the ease of the chamber, um, I'll put the question that the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against? No. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against? I think the ayes have it. The question is that the amendment, sorry, the bill, um, that the amendments be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Will now be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against? I think the ayes have it. The
committee has considered the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment prohibiting academic cheating services bill 2019 and agreed to it without amendments. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against? No. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill will now be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020, second reading debate. Thank you, Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President. Labor will be supporting this bill today. The additional childcare subsidy for child wellbeing is a vital program that provides a safe and nurturing learning environment for children in extremely vulnerable situations at home. For most of these children, it can be the difference between being able to stay at home or have to go into the child protection system. It's critical that government treat this program with sensitivity and ensures families and providers are not overly burdened with red tape. This Liberal National Government introduced a number of new requirements and rules that restricted access to the additional childcare subsidy in July 2018. The, this government likes to bang the drum about cutting red tape. It's one of those media releases they put out on regular rotation, but they go out of their way to increase red tape for vulnerable families and the childcare providers trying to help them. In the first six months of the new system, the number of children receiving the child wellbeing subsidy collapsed by 21 per cent. These numbers have since recovered to pre-July 2018 levels, but only after significant efforts and resources from providers. When asked in Senate estimates if the department was concerned about the drop, they admitted that they weren't and also confessed that they weren't even tracking fa if families had dropped out of the system. During the Senate inquiry into the government's first round of changes to the childcare legislation last September, the stakeholders all expressed strong views that the additional childcare subsidy was not working in the best interests of vulnerable children. The Early Learning and Care Council of Australia, Early Childhood Australia and Good Start all called on the government to fix the red tape and restrictions on the ACCS. Labor will support these changes because they fix some of the design flaws in their new system and will help to get vulnerable children the support they need. But the Liberals' childcare system still has many other serious flaws. This is a system which leaves one in four families worse off. It's a design feature that access to early education and care is reduced for 279,000 families. It's a system that only, where only 40 per cent of providers and only 41 per cent of families told the independent evaluation reviewers had resulted in positive change and 83 per cent of parents told the evaluation that the new system had made no impact on their work or study. It's a system that has been forcing childcare providers to act as unpaid debt collectors for the government because families are struggling to stay on top of the complicated activity and means tests. It's a system that has been riddled with software glitches that have left providers and families in the dark and staff without pay. It sends out blunt letters telling families they owe the government money without any explanation. So far, over 91,000 families, or 16 per cent of all families audited so far, have been hit with a childcare subsidy debt notice, which is more evidence their new system is too complex and not working for families. Childcare fees are already out of control in the new system. The CPI figures show childcare costs increased by 1.9 per cent in December in the December quarter, the fourth successive increase, and have now gone up by 7.2 per cent in the 12-month period. Fees are now 34 per cent up under the Liberal National Government. Families are now paying, on average, $3,800 a year more for early education and care under this government. The government was very confident that their new system would put downward pressure on fees and they were driving down the cost of childcare. The minister was keen to spruik a new website as a game-changer for families and told families to shop around, 
but less than half of providers are providing accurate fee information to the website. You certainly don't hear the minister make these claims anymore. And like every other portfolio, the government has no idea or no, and no plan on how to bring fees under control. The Minister for Education claims taxpayer funding of early education and care is communism. The Prime Minister calls the childcare budget as a money pit. These are unacceptable comments from an out-of-touch Morrison government. And so Labor will support this bill today, but we also note our ongoing concerns with the failure of the Morrison government to manage our childcare sector. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Yes. Um, I bring to your attention the state of the chamber. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. Quorum present. Senator Faruqi, are you still seeking the call? Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on behalf of the Greens on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020. The bill makes changes to additional childcare subsidy, child well-being, and to the calculation method used when an individual whose relationship status changes throughout the year meets the childcare um, subsidy reconciliation conditions. A major intention is to ensure providers can care for a child at risk of abuse or neglect while a foster family determines its eligibility for the childcare subsidy and potentially the additional childcare subsidy. subsidy. The bill will also allow for the backdating of the additional child care subsidy, child well-being certificates and determinations for, for up to 13 weeks, which is up from the current 28 days in certain circumstances. And finally, it will extend the maximum period of, for an A CCS, child well-being determination period, from 13 weeks um, to up to 12 months for classes of children to be prescribed in the minister's rules. The Greens are supportive of this bill, as we support every measure to make subsidised early learning more accessible and more gen generous for families and children. Sadly, the way early learning in Australia is regulated is enormously complex, and fa families can fall through the cracks of the system. This bill will help to ensure that more families can access subsidised early learning particularly those where the children may be at, risk, at particular risk of serious abuse or neglect. 
In his second reading speech on this bill, way back in February, Minister Tehan said, just over 18 months into implementation of the child care package, and it is clear that the government is delivering on its goals to create a more affordable, accessible, and flexible child care system. They say hindsight is 2020, but I think in the intervening six months, we have seen that early childhood education and care is not the affordable, accessible, flexible system that the minister so wishes it to be. After a brief flirtation with free childcare, most families are now back to paying fees in one of the most expensive childcare sectors in the world during a pandemic which has decimated our economy and jobs. As for accessibility, childcare is still out of reach for plenty of marginalized and disadvantaged families. And as for flexibility, COVID-19 almost toppled the whole system. Far from being an agile, resilient, flexible system, it is a house of cards. Obviously, the pandemic rattled our whole economy and society. But unlike other sectors, early childhood education and care almost went under completely in a matter of just weeks. As many have said, COVID-19 has exposed the cracks in the system which governments have tried to ignore or downplay for far too long. Precarious and insecure work, expensive childcare, overstretched aged care and health systems, and an unemployment benefit that keeps its recipients below the poverty line are just a few of these structural problems that the government has had to face up to during this seismic change in our economy. At the moment, across the country, families are struggling with the burden of going back to full fee-paying early learning. With free childcare cut off in July, the first of the big COVID measures to be wound back. Fees are back. We have a bizarre and frankly shameful situation now where parents are forced to pay fees, early learning centers can't access the JobKeeper wage subsidy, and the ECEC workers don't have a wage or income guarantee at all. They were the first workers to lose JobKeeper by decree from this Liberal government. This is unacceptable and clearly unsustainable. We need to chart a new course. What we need is proper government investment to make early learning well-funded, high-quality and fee-free. A recent report by the Grattan Institute looked at the value of investing to raise the CCS and make childcare cheaper for families, and in particular, looking at the impacts of women's workforce participation. It found that getting rid of expensive fees is good for women, it's good for children, and it's good for the economy. The reality is that expensive childcare has held Australian women back for far too long. Child rearing in Australia is highly gendered, and it's women who lose independence and income when decisions have to be made about who will stay at home. The government should invest in early learning and make it fee-free for all. This will benefit women, it will benefit families, and it will benefit the whole community. Early learning and care should be recognized as a critical part of a child's development and funded as such by government. It should be fee-free so every family can access it without any barriers. It is an essential service and it should be universally accessible. I have enthusiastically welcomed growing calls now to make early learning permanently free for Australian families. This is not pie-in-the-sky thinking. Like free higher education, free childcare is now in the basket of we had it and we can have it again. I urge the government to go back to the drawing board on early learning and invest to make the big changes needed and ultimately make this essential service accessible, universal and fee-free for all families. Until then, we will continue to tinker around the edges. As early childhood education consultant Lisa Bryant wrote in The Guardian recently, now would be a really good time for the government to announce that Australia's early education and care system is not fit for purpose, that the funding is still nightmarishly complex, 
and they are going to make a fundamental change to how they are going to fund it. They need to stop funding parents and start funding services. This would be certainly a good place to start. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020. And I want to start my contribution by noting with some concern the contribution of Senator Faruqi. And while Senator Faruqi made a number of statements critical of our government's support for families and for childcare, uh, she didn't really uh, reference any facts. And we are interested in the facts, and the facts of the matter are that around one million Australian families who are balancing work and parental responsibilities are benefiting from this package. And at the moment in this country, 72 per cent, Senator Faruqi, 72 per cent of families pay no more than $5 per hour in daycare centres. We have monumentally reformed childcare in this country. And of that 72 per cent, Senator Faruqi, within that subset, 24 per cent pay no more than $2 per hour. And we reject the proposition, which the Greens did not speak up about a number of years ago, where families earning a million dollars and more were being subsidised um, with their childcare payments. Um, just a moment, Senator Henderson. Senator Gallagher. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, point of order, I just I believe the Senator should be making her comments uh, through you uh, rather than directed at any particular Senator in this chamber. Thank you. Please direct your comments through the chair. Thank you very much. And, and through you, um, Acting Madam Deputy President, uh, I reiterate my concern about the Greens' position and the distortion of the fact, because the fact is that this government is providing record funding for childcare. Uh, by 22-23, $9.9 billion. And Australians listening to that contribution would not actually know that the most disadvantaged families in our country receive a rebate of 85 per cent of their childcare costs. So what our government has done is fundamentally change the way families are supported by directing the greatest amount of support to families who need it the most. We reject the proposition that the same level of subsidy should be provided to families earning very high wages. We don't think that's fair. And why is it the Greens have not addressed this issue? So the fact of the matter is that when you make a contribution, when the Greens make a contribution Order. on this issue, Order. they should be candid with the Australian people as to what we are doing. And we are also proudly, as part of our reform of childcare, we are also proudly preventing $3 billion of taxpayers' money from being claimed as part of the very strong stance that we have taken against fraudulent behaviour. So I am very proud of the way our government is supporting families, of the way our government is supporting the most disadvantaged families, and that is a fact. And it is also regrettable Senator that in this— Thank you. Senator Henderson, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Brockman. Acting Deputy President, interjections are always disorderly, and from that end of the chamber we have constant interjections through this second reading contribution from Senator Henderson. I would bring the matter to your attention. Interjections are disorderly, and the senator has the right to be heard in silence. Um, senator Henderson, please resume. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. Uh, it's also regrettable that uh, Senator Faruqi did not mention, in fact, that our relief package, the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020, before uh, the Senate now for debate. Uh, in removing uh, the in, in adopting the 708 million dollar transition package 
in making all employees of childcare centres eligible who are currently working, uh, she did not address the fact that one third of childcare workers working in Australian childcare centres are not currently eligible for a JobKeeper. Now, you know, we have been criticised for that, but now that this issue is being remedied because we're providing a new wave of support, this is something that the Greens have suddenly forgotten to mention. But the fact of the matter is that casuals who have been working for a childcare centre for the less than 12 months, visa holders and other, Australia, and other people who are not currently eligible for JobKeeper are eligible for this new transition package. And as I say, it is regrettable that that very important point has been conveniently overlooked by the Greens in the contribution that we just heard. So the childcare relief package before the Senate today will keep 99 per cent of childcare centres open. And we know how difficult this has been. This pandemic has been so traumatic for families, has been has caused so many issues in our community, has put families under such pressure, and those who run childcare centres, when the numbers dropped away dramatically, our government took immediate action to keep those centres open by providing free childcare. And we are now working to give childcare centres the support they need, but importantly, childcare workers the support they met they need. So our one, our $708 million transition package uh, will provide 25 per cent of fee revenue, uh, or, and that's 25 per cent of the existing hourly rate cap, whichever is lower, during the relevant reference fortnight. Uh, the last two payments scheduled for September 2020 will be, will be brought forward. Childcare fees will be capped, and services need to guarantee employment levels by maintaining the same average number of employees, and the activity test will be relaxed until 4 October 2020 to assist families whose employment has been impacted by COVID-19. Again, a further concession to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support families, and that's so families impacted by COVID-19 can receive up to 100 hours of subsidised childcare per fortnight during this transition period. There is also a very significant gap fee waiving when services are forced to close on public health advice as a result of COVID-19, and that gap fee waiver has been extended to the 31st of um, December. It's also important to point out that Victoria, and we know, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, how much pressure many Victorian families under, under at the moment with uh, very extreme restrictions, stage four restrictions uh, applicable in Melbourne at the moment. Uh, essential workers are struggling to find the childcare that they need. And so we are providing as a government ad additional support for Melbourne, some $33 million of additional support. So Melbourne services will receive a higher transition payment of 30% and may also be eligible for a top up where the childcare subsidy is received, and, that's, um, and that, of course, depends on um, the, the attendances at a childcare centre. So Victorian families will get an extra 30 days of allowable absences, a total of 72 days, or services subject to stage three or higher restrictions. So stage three is applicable to regional Victoria, can waive gap fees if children are not attending and absences are claimed, allowing enrolments to be maintained and the childcare subsidy to be paid. Outside hours school care services in Victoria will also receive an additional viability support payment of 15 per cent of their revenue if attendances have fallen by 40 per cent. On average, the government expects that services in Melbourne receive between 80 and 85 per cent of their pre-COVID revenue. So we understand, Madam Acti Deputy Speaker, that childcare centres need incredible support at this time. The relief package with JobKeeper was a temporary measure. It did keep the, large, the very ma large majority of childcare services open. 
Um, but as I mentioned, with one third of educators not eligible for JobKeeper, uh, educators and services asked for a more equitable arrangement. That's what they asked for, and that's why the, the bulk of the childcare industry is supportive of these measures. So the $708 million transition payment, which is 25 per cent of the services re revenue on top of the $8.9 billion per year childcare subsidy and the many other top-up payments, uh, is replacing what we had in place before in relation to JobKeeper. The transition package will see services receive the majority of their pre-COVID revenue, even while their attendance is low. So uh, the support is very much on par with what they were receiving previously, uh, but very, very importantly, one third of childcare workers who were previously not eligible are now being supported. A condition of receiving the transition payments, and this is a very important point to make, is that there will be an employment guarantee where the childcare service is required to maintain the same average number of employees. So uh, these payments going to childcare centres uh, can't be just pocketed by childcare centres. They must be passed on and there must be that employment guarantee. And that will, of course, ensure the viability of childcare centres and also, also to make sure that childcare workers are receiving the support that they need. So I commend this bill to the House, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is another example of how our government is working so incredibly hard to support families at this time. Uh, we acknowledge that in every sector of the economy, families, small businesses, sole traders, young people, students, so many Australians are under pressure. And as a member of the Morrison government, I am incredibly proud of the support that we are providing. Support that represents in excess of more than $300 billion in payments. Uh, under JobKeeper, for instance, payments are rolling out for the $100 billion JobKeeper program, uh, the $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy, which of course flows through until September. JobSeeker, uh, we're paying a supplement at a rate of $550 per fortnight. We recognise the extraordinary impacts this is ha having on mental health, on social, iso social isolation. You know, many families who have live with spouses and children are getting by, but we also recognise that many Australians are living on their own and they are effectively locked in their houses on their own. And that social isolation can lead to some dramatic consequences. And that's why our mental health and wellbeing pandemic response plan includes a very substantial investment for mental health. And in my own region that I proudly represent, I'm based, my, my Senate office is based in Geelong. There's been a very traumatic number of suicides involving young teenagers. And we've made a commitment for a special suicide prevention program of in excess of half a million dollars just to support young people and, and school students. Because we recognise that when you cut anyone off from their friends, from their family, stop them playing sport, stop them connecting, it can have very, very drastic consequences. Uh, we acknowledge at the moment that stage four restrictions are causing a, a huge impact on the Australian economy, an impact that will cost the Australian economy some 10 to $12 billion. And I've spoken out about my concerns that in relation to the restrictions that they must be justified and they must only be as necessary as required to combat this terrible pandemic. Uh, Treasury estimates job losses in Victoria of up to $400,000 as a result of what we are enduring at the moment. So I say to all Australians, as a member of the Morrison government, led by our magnificent Prime Minister, who is working night and day in conjunction with the leadership team, in conjunction with the National Cabinet, to get Australians through this, I am incredibly proud 
of the way that our government is supporting Australians and the measures that have been set out in this bill are evidence further support for families. I just want to finish off my contribution by reminding anyone listening or reading this speech in Hansard um, that 24-7 help is available. The National Coronavirus Health Information Line is 1-800-020-080. Of course, if you are suffering from any mental health or illness or challenges, um, please don't forget Lifeline, Beyond Blue, 1-800-RESPECT, of course, if, um, if you've got any particular concerns about family violence. Right across this economy, uh, we are working incredibly hard, including for families, including for childcare centres and childcare educators, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Oh, Senator Urquhart. Um, I bring to your attention the state of the chamber, Madam Deputy President. Quorum not present, ring the bells. Who is it? Oh, okay. uh, Senator Gallagher, you have to stay. Quorum present, stop the bells. And we'll go to Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families, Bill 2020. Madam Deputy President, this bill will amend provisions relating to the additional child care subsidy and child care <coughs> subsidy in the, a, uh, in, the, in the Family Tax Assistance Act 1999 and a New Tax System Family Assistance Administration Act 1999. This bill will strengthen and broaden access to additional child care subsidy, with the period of time a provider can apply for additional child care subsidy being increased from 13 weeks to 12 months for children under a long-term child protection order, such as, importantly, those that are in foster care. Now, this is a huge increase. It represents a quadrupling of the previous limit. And this is a common sense change, recognising the support that vulnerable children need over longer periods of time. Additional child care subsidy provides additional child care fee assistance to an to an individual or provider in limited circumstances for children at risk or of serious abuse or neglect to ensure these children will have streamlined access to and continuity of childcare. Now, prior to, uh, in fact, in my first speech, uh, I actually spoke about the importance of uh, improving early childhood education and how, in fact, you know, it's a critical enabler uh, for children and ensuring that children are able to achieve the best possible outcomes, the best possible life outcomes. Uh, we know that a child's brain grows uh, to 90 per cent of its adult size by the time the child 
is five years of age. And it's incredibly important that we, have, uh, that we give access uh, to as many children as possible, in particular those children that are vulnerable, those that come from vulnerable situations. Uh, because we know that, that early, those early years in investment into them actually yields tremendous results over a long, long period of time. Uh, I was involved with a, a program in the uh, southeastern suburbs of Perth, uh, a childcare uh, facility, and, and it's actually linked to a school. Quite a unique, uh, quite a unique um, application of, of childcare connected to a school, and it's a pilot program called Chalice, um, uh, Chalice uh, Primary School, and they have a, a Chalice Early Education uh, Centre there uh, connected to the school, and it's it's amazing. Uh, and Senator Birmingham uh, actually uh, came and visited that school, if you remember, Senator Birmingham through you, Chair, uh, several years ago. And it's, it's a, a wonderful example of where you can actually uh, provide connection with families in those very, very early years that they're raising their children. And, and for many, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a new experience, uh, of course, uh, you know, if it's, particularly if it's your first child. But uh, connecting them with the supports that are necessary to raise a child and to give them the very best possible start at life is really important. And I just bring this to your attention because it's a, it's a model that I think could be um, further examined and, and looked at, and it is something that uh, this government uh, has, has looked at. And in the context of this legislation and, and ensuring that we're providing access to quality childcare education, is, is really, really important. Childcare services is really, really important. In this particular program, kids that start school in year one in, in the southeastern suburbs of Perth, in, in, in Chalice, um, uh, in, in, in Armidale, they, they, they actually start school at a better than state average now. This is a low SES uh, economic school and school area. They, these kids start school with a better than state average when it comes to uh, literacy and numeracy. And their improvement across the year, even in just that first year, is also at a better rate than, uh, than other schools across Western Australia. And so it actually shows you that that interaction and that involvement from the very, very uh, early years, from zero and right the way through, is, is actually really important to improving the outcomes for, uh, for, for vulnerable People. And these are kids that you know, need the very best start at life. Uh, they're surrounded by circumstances that are uh, tr trying and are troubling, and uh, giving them, as their parents wanting to, giving them the very best start at life. It's, it's amazing to see the transition and the results. And now that program's been running for, for, for some years now. They've actually got longitudinal data to back up the, the evidence of the importance of this, this investment and this early investment. And this is why. This government is absolutely committed to ensuring a, 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 this investment is here so that we are providing children with the very best opportunity. So under this program, childcare providers will be able to enrol children who are in foster care under additional childcare subsidy for an initial period of 13 weeks, giving an individual foster family sufficient time to lodge their childcare subsidy claim and have it assessed by Services Australia. Existing provisions where providers are required to notify Services Australia when a child is no longer required, uh, beg your pardon, considered to be at risk, will, it will actually continue to apply. As Australians return to work, businesses reopen and children return to classroom learning, the government will resume the childcare subsidy to support families to access affordable childcare. So this bill is yet another example of the strong consultation that this government undertakes. We know that government is not all-knowing. Uh, we consistently seek to improve. We listen to community and we update our programs as the feedback comes in. And this legislation is an update uh, of the legislation and the, and the regulations based on on-the-ground feedback and, importantly, that stakeholder consultation. Uh, the aim of this bill is, is very simple. The Morrison government seeks to support families while 
maintaining a strong and vibrant childcare sector across the nation. I recently undertook a road trip uh, travelling many thousands of kilometres, in fact over 6,000 kilometres up through uh, this great state of Western Australia and spent pretty much that whole time in one single electorate uh, in Durack. It just shows you how big that electorate is. And I drove from Perth all the way up through the Pilbara, uh, up through the Midwest and then the Pilbara and then uh, into the Kimberley. And it was a very, very insightful trip. And I spoke to uh, enormous numbers uh, of people, uh, whether they were shires or businesses or, or, or community groups, uh, different stakeholders about the challenges in their area. And one of the recurring themes that I heard was that the need for uh, childcare and, and, and that was an, actually an integral part of the rural community, particularly in these towns where, where the, there's a, a heavy reliance on FIFO, uh, flying in, flying out workforce, and these towns actually want to build their residential workforce. And they're, they're, they're wanting and needing, and they see the demand for, uh, for good quality uh, and, and ready access to childcare so that they can actually attract more and more people into their town. And this is something that, that, that we support as a government because we recognise the importance of that. And this flexibility should be available to vulnerable and disadvantaged Australians. And that's what this bill will in fact achieve. It's going to provide that flexibility. So this amendment is of course happening in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. The government's primary aim during this time supports families and business. Childcare is, of course, integral to achieve both of these outcomes. Under the childcare relief package, around 99 per cent of childcare providers kept their doors open. That's fantastic. What a fantastic outcome when you consider, in particular, the breadth of the shutdowns that occurred in our economy. And keeping the doors of childcare providers open not only allowed people to continue working and provide essential workers, to the, uh, it also provided the ability for those people to attend their workplace as required, and particularly those that were in the health care sector. I spoke to one particular provider in the CBD of Perth, and they're the major childcare provider uh, right next to Royal Perth Hospital. And when we're in the, the, the depth of the, the, the crisis and the pandemic in Perth, and Thank goodness, we're, we're, um, while well, we're not through it, things are much better in Perth, much better in Western Australia now as it was uh, back compared to what it was back then in, in March and, and April. Uh, this childcare provider kept running. They kept their doors open and they ensured that they were providing important and valuable childcare services so that their parents could go to work. And these were nurses and doctors, people running the hospital, cleaners right next door to the Royal Perth Hospital. And it was made possible because this government recognised the need. We provided the flexibility for that provider to be able to keep their doors open, even though they were seeing a reduced number of kids come in because the overall demand was a little bit lower than what it normally would be. So since July 13, the transition package that was designed and implemented and included a payment of 25 per cent of providers pre-COVID revenue. This has supported centres across Australia. I'm pleased to inform the Senate that centres in Victoria have received appropriate assistance to the tune of $33 million, recognising the severity of the ongoing situation there. Now, this bill shows, and it shows clearly, that following the return to the demand-driven childcare subsidy on 13 July 2020, we are committed, we are committed to improving access to childcare for vulnerable and disadvantaged children. This, in turn, provides support for disadvantaged families. There is much red tape in this sector, and this bill also seeks to cut this red tape for both families and providers. So, Cutting this red tape means that access to childcare is going to be easier overall, cheaper, and more time will be spent on important priorities than on compliance and overcoming access barriers. So I'm glad that the opposition is supporting this bill. Uh, Senator Gallagher expressed earlier her support for cutting red tape in the sector, which is great. Childcare is one of the most overregulated sectors of our economy. And I hope that uh, Senator Gallagher is equally excited about freeing up other sectors of our economy. 
uh, but I do digress. It is important that at this time that the government and opposition work constructively together, as I have to say, as we mostly have, as we largely have seen. Madam Acting Deputy President, the coalition is committed to providing record funding for childcare. We are committed to quality, affordable childcare and as, in, uh, as an important structural feature of our economy. We recognise this when we took steps to protect the sector during coronavirus, uh, and we recognise it now. But that does not mean that the coronavirus shedding settings should be made permanent, as some have claimed. Our once-in-a-generation reforms they have already delivered a 3.2 per cent decrease in out-of-pocket costs to parents. Further, we have strengthened the systems by preventing $3 billion of taxpayer money being falsely claimed. This fraudulent behaviour weakens the system and hurts all Australians, preventing it as a priority that we are delivering on. Our new childcare package represents the most significant reforms to early, child, early education and care system in 40 years. This is incredibly important. As I started when I uh, stood here, uh, as I stand here now, this, this is a priority for government because we recognise the value of quality childcare education and development. We know that it sets children up for life. We know that it enables uh, economic participation of parents to getting out there and working. Uh, and the combination of that ensures a better future for our children. It ensures a better future for them because we know that when you invest in children, that you see a, a multiplier effect right through their lives. The, the, the cost reductions and other challenges and other issues, social issues that come, particularly for disadvantaged families, is, is, is profound and significant. It's material and it's something that this government remains committed to because we recognise the importance of that quality education. And this is why, even through the challenges of this pandemic, we've remained committed to childcare and we provided the flexibility to allow providers to keep their doors open, even though they may have seen a reduction in, in, in numbers, in children turning up because parents are working from home or, or various uh, situations. We have continued to keep those doors open because we understand and we recognise the importance of early childhood education for the children and also for that economic participation of the parents. So, Madam Deputy President, I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Polly, I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? Aye. The ayes have it. Division? Division required. Ring the bells.
So team, what are we doing? Stop the bells. The question is that the question be put. Those, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy. Tell if the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell if the noes. Okay. The result of the division is ayes 21, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the negative. Debate therefore continues. And I think we go to Senator Chandler. Is it? Oh no, Senator Polly. No, Senator Polly. Senators, if you're not taking place in this debate, could you please leave the chamber quietly? 
Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable Disadvantaged Bill 2020. This legislation makes further changes to the government's new childcare system to remove design flaws that have placed significant administrative burdens on at-risk families and early learning providers. The additional childcare subsidy child wellbeing is a payment for at-risk and vulnerable families who need support with the cost of childcare to support the child's participation in early learning. These children are typically at risk of child protection, child safety issues. Families receive the ACCS child wellbeing payment are exempt from the activities test. Providers receive a subsidy equal to the actual fee charged by the service up to 120 per cent of the CSS hourly fee cap. Therefore, almost all children receiving the ACCS child wellbeing receive free early learning. Before I speak in greater details regarding this bill, I first want to pay tribute to all our wonderful teachers and teachers' assistants, social workers, speech pathologists, principals and educators across my home state of Tasmania and Australia. COVID-19 presented many challenges within our communities. The significant pressure it placed on our educators and educational institutions should not be underestimated. But in true spirit of Australian grit, resilience and passion, the education sector rose to the challenge. For weeks, teachers adapted to this situation as learning occurring from home and then via technology for many students. We know that our teachers are the bedrock of our children's future and they really did rise to the challenge during this crisis. All Tasmanians thank our teachers and all educators. But now to the substance of this bill, Madam Acting Deputy Sec uh, President. The additional childcare subsidy for child wellbeing is a vital program that provides a safe and nurturing learning environment for children in extremely vulnerable situations at home. For most of these children, it can be the difference between being able to stay at home or have to go into child protection system. It is crucial the government at all levels, especially the federal government, treat this program with sensitivity it deserves and ensures families and providers are not overly burdened with red tape. The Liberal government introduced a number of new requirements and rules that restricted access to the additional childcare subsidy in July 2018. This third term Liberal government likes to bang the drum about cutting red tape. It is one of the media releases they put out on a regular rotation, but they go out of their way to increase red tape for vulnerable families and the childcare providers trying to help them. In the first six months of the new system, the number of children receiving the child wellbeing subsidy collapsed by massive 21 per cent. These numbers have since recovered to pre-July 2018 levels, but only after significant efforts and resources by providers. When asked in the Senate estimates at the beginning of the year if the department was concerned about the drop, they admitted they weren't and also confessed they weren't even tracking if families had dropped out of the system. This is the kind of government those opposite believe is fit and proper. That isn't good governance, Madam Acting Deputy President, by any stretch of the imagination or by any standard. Now, what are stakeholders' views regarding this? I'm sure many people will be asking. The Early Learning and Care Council of Australia, Early Childhood Australia and Good Start all called on the government to fix the red tape restrictions on the ACCS. What did the government do? Did they listen? Of course not, because this government is arrogant. The born to rule mentality means that they simply ignored the views of the sector. They ignored the views of those working in this important sector. Of course, we on this side of the chamber 
will support these changes because they do fix some of the design flaws in their new system and will help get vulnerable children the support that they need. However, I emphasise the word some. The government's childcare system still has many other serious flaws. This is a system which leaves one in four families worse off. It's a design feature that access to early education and care is reduced for 279,000 families. It is a system that only 40 per cent of the providers and only 41 per cent of families told the independent evaluation reviewers had resulted in positive change. And 83 per cent of the parents told the evaluation that the new system had made no impact on their work and study. It's a system, Madam Deputy President, that has been forcing childcare providers to act as unpaid debt collectors for the government because families are struggling to stay on top of the complicated activities and means tests. It is a system that has been riddled with software glitches that have left providers and families in the dark and staff without pay. I'm sure many people can recall that the system is known for sending out blunt letters telling families they owe the government money without any explanation. So far, over 91,000 families or 16 per cent of all families audited so far have been hit with a childcare subsidy debt notice, which is more evidence their new system is too complex and not working for families. Childcare fees are already out of control in the new system. The latest CPI figures show childcare costs increased by 1.9 per cent in the December quarter, the fourth successive increase, and have now gone up by 7.2 per cent in the past 12 months. Before COVID-19, fees were up to 34 per cent under the Liberal government. Families were paying on average $3,800 a year more for early education and care under this government. The government was very confident that their new system would, and I quote, put downward pressure on fees. And they were, and I quote, driving down the cost of childcare. The minister was keen to spruik a new website as the game changer for families and told families to shop around, but less than half of the providers are providing accurate fee information to the website. You don't hear the minister making these claims anymore. Let's be frank. Who knows how this government is going to treat childcare once the COVID pandemic passes? I really do hope they don't toss this sector aside and treat it with the disdain they have in the past become accustomed to. And like every other portfolio, the government has absolutely no idea, no plan on how to bring fees under control. Madam Acting Deputy President, the Minister for Education claims taxpayer funding of early education and care is communal. And yet during COVID-19, they were willing to support free childcare for all families. The Prime Minister calls, calls the childcare budget a, and I quote, money pit. His words, not mine, not anyone's on this side of the chamber, we, on this side of the chamber, are waiting, as are the Australian people, to see what and how this government treats our childcare system in a post-COVID-19 country. I, like so many other families that are relying on early childhood education and childcare, hope that they are treated better they have the respect for those families. They respect the sector. They respect the early educators in this country and support these families. And as we know, with this particular scheme, 
It is there for the vulnerable children and for their families. This government needs to demonstrate that it has respect for the sector, not just words, not just trying to spin a story, but they actually are there to support and encourage the early educators and to give the support that the mums and dads in this country and the children so richly deserve. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And it is a pleasure to rise today to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020, which, uh, as we have heard in the debate this morning, is, of course, um, one of the uh, very important policies that the Morrison Coalition government has put together to uh, assist Australians and particularly um, Australian families deal with the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. The Morrison government is supporting families and the childcare sector through the COVID-19 crisis to ensure that quality early childhood education and care is available to vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families. Under the child care relief package, around 99 per cent of child care providers kept their doors open during the COVID-19 uh, initial um, impact of the pandemic earlier this year. It's so important that parents are able to keep working wherever that is possible and keeping child care centres open and operating, particularly through the height of nationwide restrictions, is critical in allowing working parents to keep working. Since July 13, our transition package, including a payment of 25 per cent of a provider's pre-COVID revenue, has supported centres around Australia and centres in Victoria have benefited from additional support in response to the situation currently playing out there. This bill that we are debating in the chamber today is an important next step in our support for the childcare sector. It improves access to childcare for vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families and cuts red tape for families and childcare providers. We've already heard in the debate today just how uh, regulated the childcare sector is. And we as Liberals believe that in reducing red tape, um, this will allow this sector to operate more effectively and more efficiently, which can only be a good outcome for the people utilising the services these providers uh, give. The period of time a provider can apply for an additional childcare subsidy determination will be extended from 13 weeks up to 12 months for children under a long-term child protection order, such as those in foster care. This change recognises the support that vulnerable children need over longer periods. Other amendments will enable providers to apply to backdate a family's ACCS beyond the current limit of 28 days and up to 13 weeks in exceptional circumstances. Childcare providers will also be able to enrol children who are in foster care under ACCS for an initial period of up to 13 weeks, giving an individual foster family sufficient time to lodge their childcare subsidy claim and have it assessed by Services Australia. The additional childcare subsidy provides additional childcare fee assistance to an individual or a provider in limited circumstances for children at risk of serious abuse or neglect to ensure these children have access to and continuity of childcare. The ACCS is part of the childcare safety net to give the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children a strong start through access to quality early childhood education and care. ACCS is a top-up payment in addition to the childcare safety net. The Australian government paid almost $50 million in ACCS child wellbeing subsidies to cover childcare costs for more than 21,000 children in the financial year 2018-2019. This bill has been drafted to address feedback from the childcare sector. The Morrison Coalition government is a huge supporter of parents and the childcare sector. Our reforms have delivered a 3.2 per cent reduction in out-of-pocket costs to parents since our package was introduced. The new childcare package is providing more access and more financial support for those who need it most. 
Around one million Australian families who are balancing work and parental responsibilities are benefiting from the package. 72 per cent pay no more than $5 per hour in daycare centres. Within that group, 24 per cent pay no more than $2 per hour. The new childcare package re represents the most significant reforms to the early education and childcare sector and system in 40 years. When COVID-19 hit and began to impact heavily on working parents and childcare operators, our relief package kept 99 per cent of childcare centres open, as I earlier alluded to. As we move on into the next phase of reopening our economy, at least in most states outside of Victoria, we're delivering a $708 million transition package. In Melbourne and Victoria, there is an, there is an additional $33 million in support because of the significant impact of the large-scale outbreak in that state. We know that COVID-19 has significantly impacted on the lives of so many Australians, and the Morrison Coalition government's assistance programs to help families, workers and businesses represents the largest assistance package ever delivered by an Australian government. On top of all of the funds and effort that has gone into the health response and the mental health support for Australians, we are investing over $280 billion to keep Australians in jobs, keep businesses in business, support households and keep investment flowing. We know how important our JobKeeper scheme has been for Australian businesses and families. In recent months, I've been conducting a Tasmania Back in Business campaign and have been travelling around my state speaking to as many businesses as I can, particularly small and family business owners. Without a doubt, the most common sentiment you hear from these people is how important JobKeeper has been in getting businesses through the harshest period of restrictions. So many business owners have said that without JobKeeper being available at the time when they had almost no customers coming through their doors, their businesses would have most likely shut and they would have had to lay off staff. Because JobKeeper was available, they were able to keep staff on the payroll and keep their businesses operating. Now that Tasmania has eased many of our internal restrictions, there is quite a lot of cautious optimism in the business community that they can turn the corner and begin to get back to normal in the months ahead. And of course, it's not just JobKeeper, but also the $17.6 billion for the government's first economic stimulus package, the $90 billion from the Reserve Bank of Australia and $15 billion from the government to deliver easier access to finance and $66.1 billion in a second economic support package. That includes providing up to $100,000 to eligible small and medium-sized businesses and not-for-profits to help the cash flow of businesses and not-for-profits so they can keep operating and pay their rent, electricity and other bills, and most importantly, retain staff. That's another measure that has been incredibly welcomed by businesses around the country, and I've certainly received very positive feedback from Tasmanian businesses uh, as they relate to those, those policies. For individuals, as well as the guaranteed income through JobKeeper for eligible employees, we've also supported Australians with the coronavirus supplement to JobSeeker of an additional $550 per fortnight and by temporarily relaxing the partner income test to ensure that an eligible person can receive the JobSeeker payment. We've now made two payments of the $750 stimulus payment to Social Security and Veteran Income Support recipients and eligible concession card holders. As the Prime Minister has repeatedly said, the approach we've taken as a government to supporting Australians during the COVID-19 crisis has not been to set and forget, but to listen to Australians, listen to businesses and industries, and listen to expert advice to understand what the next steps on the road to recovery should be. Not a week has gone by since COVID-19 first hit Australia that the government hasn't announced new programs and new measures to help Australians get through this incredibly tough time. Just today, for example, the government has announced that Tasmanian workers who cannot work due to the need to self-isolate or quarantine and have no sick leave or other entitlements available to them to support themselves through that period are eligible for the pandemic leave disaster payment of $1,500. 
This comes after an agreement has been struck with the Tasmanian government to roll out the scheme in my state, which of course has already been operating successfully in Victoria. To date in Victoria, almost $8.8 million has been paid out for around 6,000 granted claims. And this is just another example of how the government is continuing to respond to the needs and work with the states to support Australians. This fortnight in parliament, we are focused on passing legislation like this bill that we are debating here today, which enables important assistance programs to be rolled out. Of course we know that in helping Australians in the here and now, we also have to have an eye to the future. There is no money tree, and what we spend now will have to be paid back at some point in time. That's why it's so important that what we are doing is putting in place the building blocks for economic recovery. That starts with keeping people employed so that they can continue to provide for their family and also help the business they work for recover and grow. Ensuring that working parents have access to childcare is an imperative part of that plan. But it's not just about keeping businesses surviving and treading water. We're also acting to create the right business conditions and build the infrastructure that supports economic growth. That means in Tasmania, for example, continuing to invest in the rollout of new irrigation schemes, which are so important to getting more agricultural production in our state. It's investing in energy infrastructure to capitalise on Tasmania's natural assets and hydro energy capacity. And it's investing in skills and training opportunities for the current generations and the generations to come so that they can not only get a good job but actually help to drive more investment and business growth locally in our state. As I said initially, Madam Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government is supporting families in the childcare sector through the COVID-19 crisis to ensure that quality early childhood education and care is available to vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families. Because we know it's so important that parents of children are able to keep working, uh, keep contributing to their workplace wherever that's possible, and keeping childcare centres open and operating particularly through the height of nationwide restrictions like what we have seen over the past few months, is absolutely critical. As I said, this bill is an incredibly important next step in our support for the childcare sector, above and beyond uh, our initial transition package, which included a payment of 25 per cent of a provider's pre-COVID revenue to support centres around Australia and particularly centres in Victoria, uh, which have benefited from this additional support in um, response to the situation there. This bill improves access to childcare for vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families and, as we've heard during debate, cuts red tape for families and childcare providers. It's just such an important piece of legislation to support Australian families going through the COVID-19 crisis which operates in addition to the other support packages that I have highlighted here today, uh, particularly those that have been so well received in my own state of Tasmania, uh, particularly around the JobKeeper payment, which has ensured that people can stay connected with their places of work. And this bill today, as I've said, in keeping childcare centres open and operating and supporting parents to utilise childcare services is an imperative part of that connection as well. So, in conclusion, Madam Acting Deputy President, I thank my colleagues, uh, and I note that uh, Minister Cash is in the chamber today, and she is one colleague who has provided fantastic support to small businesses across the country, as well as the entire Morrison Coalition government team, um, who are all continuing to work so hard through this pandemic to respond to the needs of Australians, and I congratulate the Education Minister with the work that he has done in this bill that we're debating here today, which supports the needs of vulnerable children in our community. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Madam Acting Deputy President, with, uh, in relation to the family assistance legislation, improving assistance for vulnerable and disadvantaged families, Bill 20. 20. Uh, second reading. I move that the question be put. The 
question is that the question now be put. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. No. The ayes. No. Okay. Uh, division required. Ring the bells. Stop the bills. Oh, sorry. So it's different to this one. You just give me the nod, <laughs> Jackie. Sorry. Okay, stop the bills. The question is that the question now be put. I point Senator McCarthy as teller for the eyes and Senator Brockman as teller for the nose.
The results being uh, eyes 23, nose 27, the question is negated. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm disappointed that we were unsuccessful in our motion to put the question before the chair because the government uh, seems to have no agenda in this place because the bill before us fixes a litany of problems that this government caused. I've got no problem with continuing to debate the issue and the problems that they have subjected uh, families to in this nation, but is simply a manifestation of the fact that they're determined uh, to keep padding out the parliament's agenda because they don't uh, have the capacity yet to move on with their agenda. So for three terms of government, we've been subjected to uh, this government banging on about how it cuts red tape and cares about the Australian people. While all the while we've had to watch the dismantling of childcare and gambling with our children's future, and here we are again debating needing to fix these problems, and uh, the government seems happy enough to uh, spend lots of time debating this bill uh, and having its face rubbed in the mistakes that it has made in this space because it can't get on with its parliamentary agenda today. It's simply not ready uh, to keep the parliament's business moving. We know in June 2018 the government introduced a new childcare system and it became obvious, obvious almost immediately, and Labor knew that this was coming because we saw the design flaws uh, in it. Uh, that it would place significant burdens on at-risk families and early learning providers. The additional childcare subsidy, or ACCS child wellbeing, we know it, of course, is a payment for at-risk and vulnerable families who need support with the cost of childcare. Typically, these are children who are at risk uh, in terms of child protection and safety needs. We know that all the subsidies are for all children who are on additional childcare subsidy receive free early learning because of these subsidies. So why did the government and you know uh, you, you want to keep uh, debating this issue before the chamber today you're simply here today not to bang on about you know your supposedly great childcare system. The, the very bill before us today highlights, the government's deeply flawed agenda. The system was designed to make sure that um, help uh, that most needed by people was as difficult as possible to get an administrative nightmare for people who already have enough to deal with. And that, these are the core issues being fixed in this legislation today. <clears throat> and still you seem happy to have your face rubbed in the mistakes you've made by continuing the debate on this issue. This is what this debate reminds Australians of, the mistakes, the massive mistakes that you have made in our childcare system. The changes that you introduced back in 2018 included reducing the initial approval period from 13 to six weeks, approving eligibility certificates for only 13-week periods and deeming any applications that aren't approved in 28 days by Centrelink to be refused. How can a system that finds that when a government department of no fault of the actual applicant, uh, when they don't make a decision in the 28 days, that the ap application is refused? 
It is a ridiculous state of affairs. I'm glad you're fixing it. It's years after uh, the advent of these issues coming to the fore. And I'm sure that your office, along with my office and all Centrelink offices, have dealt with this administrative burden and administrative nightmare on a regular basis uh, uh, in recent times. I understand firsthand the high level of pressure that families have been under since this government came in and systematically began uh, putting pressure on and defunding Services Australia. These are the kinds of issues, while you defund Services Australia as well as putting these administrative burdens on both Centrelink and on families, it is little wonder that we end up back in this place needing to fix uh, the crappy problems uh, that you have put into our childcare system. The fact that it took a pandemic to get more funding for Services Australia, I think, says a great deal. But what that also says uh, is that we can look to the fact that the government has cut millions of dollars from the department. And then, as this bill highlights, you set impossibly short processing times for them to approve applications. Approve applications for vital education for vulnerable families. What a short-sighted government. It shows uh, that that you don't put a human element, element. It's supposed to be the Department of Human Services. But instead, you think that the system can just keep up somehow with understaffing, short administration timelines. And where does the burden fall? Where does the burden then fall? Impossibly on vulnerable families who can't possibly uh, meet the bureaucratic and uh, funding expectations of the government. It's supposed to be a system that is there to serve them. But what you've done and what we're fixing today is the callousness of this government, the poor management of this government. We warned, the sec and the sector warned, we warned the government that these changes would have a detrimental impact on vulnerable families, and this government chose to ignore it. There was indeed a 20 per cent collapse in the number of vulnerable children receiving the payment in the first six months of the new system, and that is a disgrace. We have seen in blinding clarity with the aged care disgrace that this government ignores and denies problems until they become bigger than Ben-Hur. After months of submissions to the Senate inquiry highlighting the urgency in fixing the flaws in the policy, after months of the Department of Education and the sector fighting to change the new system, the government finally enacted. Finally, the debate is before the chamber uh, today to reverse this collapse. Well, I say just get on and pass uh, the bill. Get on and pass it. Thanks to the Department of Education and the sector creating a working group the bill before the Senate today does indeed reduce the administrative burden placed on both early learning providers and at-risk families. Providers uh, now have the opportunity to enrol children in child protection under the provider rather than the parent or the foster carer for up to 13 weeks while the paperwork is applied for. So I don't see any reason why the government needs to keep debating this issue today. Of course, if you're going to chew up the time, uh, then Labor senators are also going to want to stand, I'm sure Green senators will too, really to point out how um, ridiculous you are being in just not getting on with the business before the Senate. These changes seem like an obvious decision to make uh, and allow breathing time for people who ha already have enough on their plate. It's taken too long to get the government to the table to fix these issues. It shouldn't have taken months. I call on the government to stop making it harder, life harder for those who are already having a difficult time. 
both for parents and children that are struggling. And I call, them, call on them not just respect, with respect to childcare, but with all of the major challenges confronting our nation at the moment. Our children should not be constrained from getting an education and getting the care that they need. They should not be constrained from getting that care and support thanks to the bureaucratic disgrace that uh, this government has subjected those families to. The bureaucratic disgrace that this system was in its original form. Labor understands that the child care subsidy for child wellbeing is a very critical program. It provides a safe and nurturing learning environment for children in what can sometimes be extremely vulnerable situations at home. And for many children, it's the difference between being able to stay at home, staying at home with the support of their family who might uh, need the respite to deal with their own issues or their health issues, and it can mean the difference between being able to stay with their family and going into the child protection system. The government needs to play uh, an active role in keeping children out of the child protection system and keeping children safe. For too long we've had this confected debate about child protection simply being about a state responsibility uh, and that it's not a Commonwealth problem. But as we see, the funding of our childcare system and access to services through childcare play a critical role in keeping children out of child protection. The system must be treated with sensitivity and we need to ensure that families and providers are not burdened with red tape. The most important thing, the most important person in this debate is those children. So we want the focus to be on them, not on the administrative burden and administrative timelines that this government has previously imposed. In recent times, our pandemic, in our pandemic, it's been really obvious how important childcare workers are to our economy. What a struggle it is uh, without being able to put your ch children in childcare uh, and early learning. And I shouldn't really just refer to it as childcare because, importantly, it is early learning, that it makes balancing life incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. Families that are now working from home, uh, having their children at home with them, juggling uh, family conflict, pressure on their family finances. Now, I understand why children need to be kept. Uh, out of the childcare system in some circumstances at the moment. But what it really highlights to me is how critical early learning services are. Thousands of families, millions of families around Australia, the experience of COVID simply reminded them about how grateful they are to early childhood educators uh, in our nation for the work and support uh, and learning that they provide uh, to our nation's children. You know, this is despite the fact that childcare workers are among the lowest paid workers in our nation. They are 96 per cent women and they are paid as little as $22 an hour. When the pandemic hit and the Free Childcare Initiative was brought in uh, due to the importance of childcare, again, ironically, a free childcare meant childcare workers were the ones to suffer and to lose their jobs. The government only subsidised 50 per cent of the cost of childcare, and this meant that the childcare providers were being expected to run the same surface plus extra costs, including things like personal protective equipment during a pandemic. It is uh, patently ridiculous to be able to run an effective childcare service in some instances, as we certainly experienced uh, in, say, the northwest of Western Australia, uh, with exactly the same levels of demand taking place. In fact, there were childcare centres that simply closed. They simply closed because they could not afford to operate. And uh, people who were going to work 
who weren't staying at home because of the pandemic, people who were required to go to work simply couldn't get a place in a childcare system. So free childcare, yes, it was great, but only if you could get it and only if you were paid. So again, it highlights that this government creates a bureaucratic nightmare for families and workers uh, in our uh, early learning system day after day with every move they make. Uh, so we have um, seen childcare providers being forced to act as unpaid debt collectors for the government. And this has happened because families have been struggling to stay on top of the complicated activity tests and means tests uh, at the moment. So here today, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Just before I go to you, Senator Van, I do remind senators, particularly during divisions, of the physical distancing and that we um, need to physically distance at all times when in the chamber. Senator Van. Good point, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and I thank Senator Pratt for raising uh, the bureaucratic nightmare that we're seeing in my home state of Victoria, a bureaucratic nightmare that those on the other side seem to have not only a blind spot to, but a tin ear to as well. I've not heard anyone on that side acknowledge what is happening in Victoria, and I find that disgraceful. 462 Victorians have lost their lives as of today. There are over uh, three and a half thousand active cases. Now, what does that do? Oh, really? Okay. Well, let's talk about the disaster that's happening in Victoria, Senator Pratt. So, there are over 14,000 people that have had coronavirus in uh, in Victoria. Now, in stage four lockdown, people can't even put their children in in childcare because your Labor Senate, your Labor <coughs> Premier, has locked up the state so hard that people can't work. The people are being put out of business. People are losing their livelihoods. So when you're talking about let's talk about looking after people, let's get on top of the coronavirus in Victoria. Let's get people out of lockdown. Let's let people get back to their lives, Senator Pratt. Let Order. people get back to their livelihoods. Let's, let's look after their businesses, Order. look after their businesses and look after their livelihoods instead of rabbiting on about this. Order. Lockdown isn't working. Um, We've had Senator Van, resume your seat, please. As Senator McAllister. Madam Deputy, Pre uh, Deputy President, I rise on relevance. There is a lot of latitude in these debates, and senators make broad-ranging contributions. But Senator Van, thus far, uh, is really not talking about the bill before us. Uh, um, Senator Smith. Point of order, Madam. Uh, Deputy President, um, I think that's just my started, decision to make. Thank you, Senator Smith. I am listening very carefully, and I do acknowledge that Senator Van has not yet addressed the bill, but I expect him to do that uh, fairly soon. Otherwise, I'll remind him that to, to address the bill in front of us. Thank you, Senator Van. President, and, and I was talking about childcare. <laughs> Those families that can't get their ch children into childcare because of the lockdown and the impacts it's having on Victorian businesses. You say lockdown works. We've been in stage four for three weeks already. We've been in stage three for over six weeks. There's been the hotspot suburbs that have been in lockdown for over 10 weeks. So if this was going to work, it would work better. Perhaps we should be concentrating better on better testing, better contact tracing, because that's where your Labor Premier, Dan Andrews, is failing Victorians. So, Madam Deputy President, I now I am very pleased to speak to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, the Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill of 2020. Like all my colleagues on this side of the chamber, I recognise that good early childcare provides the foundation for young Australians to grow, to learn and to form the confidence they need for future years to come. During this government's time in office, we have invested heavily in making childcare more affordable and more accessible for all Australian families. Just in the last financial year alone, we have invested over $8.6 billion into the sector. And you will be pleased to hear that this will continue to rise. Over the coming years, we will see this investment climb to more than $10 billion per year. But 
This is not just a large investment, but this is a large investment that has ensured families right across the country are better off. This investment from the Morrison government has meant more families can now access childcare due to significant reductions in out-of-pocket expenses. A typical family is now better off to the tune of $1,300 per annum per child. In difficult times, this is a tangible and welcome benefit to families, but more can always be done. As I spoke about last night, my home state of Victoria is dealing with a state of disaster. Every day I get calls from distraught business owners who are mothers and fathers of children who are suffering because of the lockdowns that have been brought about in Victoria due to the state of disaster because of the, the disastrous handling of the coronavirus by the Andrews government. With lockdowns, we've seen comes business shutdown, and with that comes rising unemployment, and it is therefore vital that we get the policy settings right to assist those who are struggling to keep their businesses afloat and those families who are struggling to make ends meet. The Morrison government's primary aim at the moment is to support families uh, through the COVID-19 crisis. As part of that, we are supporting the childcare sector, ensuring that quality early childcare education and care is available to vulnerable and disadvantaged children and their families. In response to the COVID-19 crisis, the Morrison government initiated the childcare relief package, which has seen around 99 per cent of childcare providers keep their doors open. Now, I'm sure all in here will agree this is a huge achievement and something this government should be proud of. Not only did this relief package support families during the early stages of the pandemic, but it also supported the work of childcare centre staff, ensuring that they stayed in work. Since July 13, the childcare transition package has included, has included a payment of 25 per cent of a provider's pre-COVID revenue. This transition package has continued to support childcare centres right across the country. Madam Deputy President, in particular centres in my home state of Victoria have benefited from additional support to the tune of an extra 5 per cent in response to the situation that we are facing. I thank Minister Tian, Treasurer Frydenberg and Prime Minister Scott Morrison for making these additional supports available. And as you can see, Madam Deputy President, with the introduction of this bill, it clearly demonstrates that, with the return of the demand-driven childcare subsidy system in July, the Morrison government is committed to improving access to childcare for vulnerable and disadvantaged children and their families. The Morrison government prides itself on our pragmatism. We listen to the experts and we are willing to address matters following feedback because that is what good governments do. And this bill is no different in that regard. This bill has been drafted specifically to address feedback from the childcare sector. Following the new childcare package implementation that occurred on 2 July 2018 and more recently in submissions to the Senate inquiry into family assistance legislation, the Building on Childcare Package Bill, Stakeholders raised areas where improvements can be made to streamline access to additional childcare subsidies. This bill does just that. Madam Deputy President, the additional childcare subsidy is part of the childcare safety net. It is designed to give the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children in Australia a strong start through access to quality early childcare education and care. The additional childcare subsidy provides additional fee assistance to an individual or, in limited circumstances, to a provider uh, for children at risk of serious abuse or neglect. This subsidy will ensure these children will continue to have access to childcare, something that I am sure all senators will agree is a good thing. Madam Deputy President, this bill will also seek to reduce unnecessary red tape for providers, families and state and territory governments by extend, number one, extending the backdating of additional childcare subsidy certificates 
and determinations from 28 days up to 13 weeks in exceptional circumstances, extending the period from 13 weeks up to 12 months that additional childcare subsidy determinations can be given for children on a long-term child protection order, including those in foster care, and clarifying that a provider is eligible for additional childcare subsidy in respect of certain defined classes of children, such as foster children. The additional childcare subsidy is a top-up payment in addition to the usual childcare subsidy. In 2018-19, the Morrison government paid almost $50 million in additional childcare subsidies, which supported 21,500 vulnerable and disadvantaged children and their families to cover childcare costs. All senators and all Australians should be proud of that contribution that we are making to the next generation of Australians. Madam Deputy President, in closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank childcare educators, both the owners of childcare centres and their teams, their teachers, their nurses, their cleaners, their admin staff, for the outstanding work that they do each and every day. Specifically, I would like to acknowledge the educators in Victoria who have continued to provide high quality support to children and families through the COVID-19 crisis. Our communities across the country are stronger for the work that they do. I know that sometimes they are looking after kids that sadly come from very difficult circumstances. Childcare educators are, for many of those kids, the one that they are closest to, the one they, who provide the care they need and the ones who provide the few hours of, in the day of normal life that children need to thrive. They are the ones that provide the time when they can be really children and not deal with the issues they face at home on a daily basis. We've all heard of the, uh, the, the uh, blind uh, pandemic that's going on. And these blind pandemics are not just one. It's, it's not just family violence. It comes in all sorts. It's suicide. It's depression. These are all things that people are struggling with each and every day across Australia, but particularly right now in my home state of Victoria. We need to lift the lockdowns. We need to get on top of health care in Victoria. Victoria needs to do better when it comes to contact tracing. It needs to do better when it comes to testing. It needs to do more such that people's lives are returned to them, so that their businesses can return to normal, so that their employees can go back to work, so they can earn money, so their children can go to school can go to childcare and live normal lives. I call on the Andrews government to do more, to do better. Children in Victoria, the people of Victoria deserve this. They really deserve it and they deserve it now. We're not seeing numbers come down fast enough. With less than another three weeks to go, it's hard to see how the Andrews government will have any other choice but to use their one tool that they find available to them because of their failures, all they've got to resort to is locking down Victorians. So it's time, if we care for our children, to get their lives back to normal. And you can only do this through better processes in contact tracing, in testing, and of course, let's not forget looking after people in hotel quarantine. The failures there are why we're in this position now. <clears throat> Make no mistake about that. The failure in contact tracing is the added part to that. We've seen outbreaks in other states, but they've managed to contain them. New South Wales provides a gold standard as to how to do contact tracing in Van, the coronavirus pandemic. There is ample opportunity to, um, at other times, address uh, points, the points you're currently making. I gave you leeway at the beginning. Um, um, I'm asking Madam, you now. Madam Deputy you, President, I Senator have Van, two I'm not inviting you to argue with me. That it's point a, of order, then, Madam Deputy President. I am allowed to speak. I have two and a half more minutes. I have addressed the bill. I'm allowed uh, to Senator continue Van, to be. Senator Van, please resume your seat. Thank you.
Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. With all due respect, of course, I think it's impossible not to talk about this particular piece of legislation that is deliberately constructed uh, because of the context of the pandemic that is the coronavirus, uh, not for Senator Van to mention the pandemic and coronavirus. Um, thank so you, I think Senator, Senator Van Smith. is in keeping with the thank expectation you, Senator of Smith. I, As I said, I've allowed Senator Van leeway at the beginning. Uh, I'm asking you, Senator Van, to conclude your remarks uh, on the bill. Thank you. Yes. Senator Van, please resume your seat. I've got another point of order. Senator Smith. Uh, again, excuse me, Madam Deputy President, but Senator Van still has another two and a half minutes in his contribution to make according to the clock. Yes, I, right. yes, I was not, uh, uh, certainly not uh, seeking to uh, curtail his time. I'm asking him in the remaining minutes to please confine his remarks, however broad he wants, but to the bill in front of us, which is the Family Assistant Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill. Thank you, Senator Van. I, I will, and as I've noted, you know, from contributions from the other side range very widely across a number of different topics that weren't constrained to this bill. So, sorry, was, what was that, or, Senator Billick? Uh, thank you, Senator so, Billick. Uh, comments calling out is disorderly, and more so when you're not in your seat. Please continue, Senator Van. Thank you very much. So, I will conclude here by saying that childcare educators for many children are the best people in their lives. But to resume a normal life, to be able to go to childcare because their parents are back at work is one of the most important things we can do. I think all senators will agree on that. And I call on the senators for Victoria on the other side to join with me in calling on the Victorian government to do more to get people back to work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Um, I do believe we're going to Senator Hughes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, I'd like to make a contribution with regards to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020. Yesterday, or earlier this week, we marked the second anniversary of the elevation of Scott Morrison to the leadership of the Liberal Party. And over 12 months ago, absolutely, Senator Smith, congratulations all around to uh, fabulous leadership by our Prime Minister and, of course, well supported by the Treasurer in Josh Frydenberg. Uh, but since that time and since the election uh, 12 months, just over 12 months ago, Australians have consistently breathed a sigh of relief that it is once again a Morrison government charged with leading us through this pandemic, these unprecedented times. And that's why I'm proud our government has always and very strongly supported families and the childcare sector both before but also during this pandemic and this COVID crisis. And one of the things that I think we should be all very, very proud of and that we should you know, give the credit where it is due at the Prime Minister and uh, Mr Frydenberg and the wonderful efforts of the leadership team, that a staggering 99 per cent of childcare services in Australia have not ceased operations since the pandemic began. Let me just make that point again because I'm not quite sure those opposite fully understand this. 99 per cent of childcare services in Australia have not ceased operations since the pandemic began. This must be unique in so many ways to this child, to the, to this, uh, the child care sector. Very few industries and, uh, and uh, organisations haven't been dramatically impacted by COVID, and it's the incredible work and leadership that's been done by the Morrison government has ensured that this number of centres have been able to remain viable. And this incredible achievement is so important for a number of reasons, a huge number of reasons, and not just for the service providers and the, and the organisations and, and small families that quite often uh, family businesses that they are. That those, that those childcare centres are still operating, but it's ensuring that families are able to keep working, that mums and dads can get their children where they need to be in safe childcare centres that they choose whilst they go to work. And it's keeping Australia working and getting Australians back to work as we come out of COVID that's going to ensure that our economy can recover. So we need to make sure that not only are the childcare centres still operating, 
but that families are able to go to work, but that our incredibly precious resource in our children can enjoy uninterrupted learning, that they can enjoy consistent care and, of course, most importantly of all, play. But the aim of this bill and the amendment to this bill is to ensure that care is available to the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children and their families. And I can assure you, having spent a number of years living in a town called Moree, which by any stretch of the imagination has every sort of socioeconomic group but is certainly very familiar with children that are at risk and very, very vulnerable, it was quite often the childcare centres and the opportunity that they got to go to somewhere very stable every day, quite often in a family daycare setting or in a, in a childcare centre setting, where they received the most consistent type of care, where they received a, a, an, was, were in an environment that was secure and safe for them, which was something that was unfortunately not always the case when they were in their own home. So it is ensuring that families that uh, are vulnerable, that are disadvantaged, that their children are still getting opportunities, their children are still being exposed to peer play, they are still being exposed to early literature and, and getting to understand other children and from teachers and the environment in how to participate in a learning environment. And so it is incredibly important that these families are at front and centre of what we do and that we make sure that those families who, re who rely on childcare benefits to keep their children in care are able to access them and are able to do so as easily as possible. So as I mentioned today, under the child care relief package, around 99 per cent of childcare service providers have kept their doors open. And I think it's important to note that this financial year we will spend more than $9.4 billion on the child care services support. It's record funding, yet those opposite still can never, ever acknowledge that. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we start hearing a cut, because I'm not quite sure their maths ever add up. But it is an absolute record volume of, spun, uh, of spending and funding going on to this important, precious resource, and it's needed. And these once-in-a-generation reforms have delivered a significant uh, reduction in out-of-pocket costs to parents, and since our package was introduced, more parents have greater access and greater financial support, and it's available to those who need it most. Now, there are over one million Australians who are balancing work and parenting, and in fact, there's an increasing number of them working in this building that have travelled here to Canberra to work and to contribute to our country. Parliamentarians, and exactly as Senator Smith you know, acknowledges, there are plenty of parents working from home. Uh, who are parliamentarians on our Zoom calls but have children in childcare. And their children deserve that consistency of care, as do all children deserve that consistency of care. And it is all those one million Australians balancing work and parenting who are benefiting from this package. And what I think is incredible to note, and this is when we hear from the other side those decrying the costs of childcare, those decrying everything should be free, not sure who's ever going to pay for it, but that's not part of their, uh, not part of their logic. But around 72 per cent of parents pay no more than $5 per hour in daycare costs. But it's also important to note that 24 per cent pay no more than $2 an hour. Now, the Morrison government has brought these significant reforms to the child sector, some of them the most significant reforms in the past 40 years. And also I'd like to acknowledge the work of the Morrison government in the fact that we have prevented $3 billion of taxpayers' money being claimed fraudulently. And at the, at the forefront of all of these considerations that we must keep in mind is that it is taxpayers' money. These subsidies are taxpayers' money, and we need to make sure that they are being spent wisely, that they are accounted for, but that they are also going to those who require them most. So since July 13, 2020, our transition package, including a payment of 25 per cent of a provider's pre-COVID revenue, has supported centres around Australia and recently uh, thanks to uh, Premier Andrews and uh, we may saw mismanagement of quarantine perhaps in the state of Victoria, seeing a second wave, meaning that parents are no longer able to go to work as they face another lockdown. 
and those centres, therefore, are vacant of children who are locked in their homes. But those centres in Victoria have benefited from additional support in response to this current situation. So the bill clearly shows that following the return to demand-driven childcare subsidy on 13 July 2020, that we are continuing to remain committed to improving access to childcare, especially for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. And of course, as Liberals, we are committed to, in every sector, across all industries, but especially here, to cutting the red tape for families and childcare providers. By cutting that red tape, the impact for providers and families will ensure that we have improved access to services for vulnerable children, those who require it most. The additional childcare subsidy is a top-up payment to the childcare subsidy. The Australian government has paid almost $50 million in additional childcare child wellbeing subsidies to cover childcare costs for 21,500 children in the 2018-19 period. But we are still working to support this sector. And the good news is that the period of time a provider can apply for additional childcare subsidy rates, the determination will be extended from 13 weeks up to 12 months for children who are under a long-term protection order, such as those in foster care. And I think we can probably all agree that they are some of our most vulnerable and disadvantaged children. This change recognises the support that vulnerable children need over longer periods. Other amendments will enable providers to apply a backdate to families' additional childcare subsidy beyond the current limit of 28 days and up to 13 weeks in exceptional circumstances. Childcare providers will also be able to enrol children who are in foster care under additional childcare subsidy arrangements for an initial period of 13 weeks giving individual foster families sufficient time to lodge their childcare subsidy claim and to have it assessed by Services Australia. Of course, Services Australia has increased its productivity under the leadership of Stu uh, Minister Stuart Roberts, and we look forward to that continuing as he continues to uh, roll out improvements across Services Australia. So there are existing provisions where providers are required to notify Services Australia when a child is no longer considered to be at risk and this will continue to apply, ensuring that we maintain the targeted approach that we apply to all sorts of payments across our welfare system. So, To talk about a few more technical aspects of this important bill, the bill will amend provisions relating to the additional childcare subsidy as well as the childcare subsidy in the A New Tax System Family Assistance Act of 1999 and A New Tax System Family Assistance Administration Act of 1999. The additional childcare subsidy of child wellbeing provides additional childcare fee assistance to an individual or a provider in limited circumstances for children that are at risk of serious abuse and neglect. The bill has been drafted after the Morrison government took on feedback from the childcare sector. And I think this is something that can also not be stressed enough, is the consultations that have been conducted across the sector to ensure that this bill and its amendments are best suited to those who provide these services and the families that utilise them. Stakeholders have raised areas where improvements can be made and streamlining access to additional childcare services as they relate to child wellbeing. The sector and parents reached out to the Morrison government and we've listened, as we are always prone to do. These amendments are all in the context of the new childcare package implementation that occurred on 2 July 2018 and more recently in submissions to the Senate inquiry into the family assistant legislation building on the childcare package bill of 2019. And I'm pleased to be able to address this important bill that provides extra support to our most vulnerable Australian children. So since the start of the pandemic, we've invested $708 million in a transition package. This is on top of the $8.9 billion per year in childcare subsidy payments. Childcare fees have been capped and providers have been required to guarantee employment levels by maintaining the same average number of staff. We're relaxing the activity test until the 4th of October 2020 to assist families whose employment has been impacted by COVID-19 so that families who have been impacted by the pandemic may receive up to 100 hours of subsidised care per fortnight during the transition period. 
and the Morrison government has committed to waiving the gap for those services forced to close on public health advice as a result of COVID-19, and we've extended the waiver until 31 December. Now we come back to Victoria as it experiences this second wave, and we need to acknowledge that the Morrison government has uh, provided Victoria with an additional $33 million of support. So Melbourne services will receive a higher transition payment of 30 per cent and may also be eligible for a top-up where childcare subsidies received are low and their experience greatly reduced attendances, clearly because all these families are experiencing a prolonged lockdown. And Victorian families will get an extra 30 days allowable absences, bringing their total to 72 days. Now, hopefully it's 72 days and Premier Andrews' uh, grab for power for the next 12 months doesn't come to fruition and things that are allowed to start to get back to normal and people are allowed to get back to work as restrictions ease and therefore children will be able to return to their childcare. Uh, but childcare services subject to stage three or higher can waive gap fees if children aren't attending and absences are claimed, allowing enrolments to be maintained and the childcare subsidy to be paid. Outside hours, school services in Victoria will receive an additional viability support payment of 15 per cent of their revenue if attendances fall by 40 per cent. And on average, the government expects the services in Melbourne receive between 80 and 85 per cent of their pre-COVID revenue. And whilst I have no doubt we will see this decried from the opposition benches, I'm sure there's plenty in the hospitality and tourism sector, particularly in the Republic of Palaszczuk and over in the uh, Republic uh, of WA, who, you know, putting putting uh, electronic bra bracelets on uh, quarantine people. I don't even think we can call it the Republic of WA anymore. Uh, but those travel and hospitality businesses. Uh, I'm sure they would love to ensure their revenue remained at 80 to 85 per cent, but of course that is not the case. So I would like to congratulate the Morrison government on bringing these forward these amendments and ensuring all children have Thank access you, to childcare. Thank you, Senator child Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Billick. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. As a former early childhood educator for over a decade, I have extensive experience working in the early childhood education and care system and with the children of vulnerable and disadvantaged families. Additional child care subsidy, or ACCS, for child wellbeing is an important program for providing additional support for children who are at risk of abuse, abuse or neglect, including children who are experiencing domestic and family violence. The payment can make the difference between children being able to stay at home and going into child protection system. Because of the unique circumstances of families receiving the ACCS child wellbeing payment, they are exempt from the activity test and their providers receive a subsidy equal to the actual fee charged by the service up to 120 up to 120 per cent of the childcare subsidy hourly fee cap. When the new childcare subsidy system started in July 2018, new requirements were imposed on providers and families trying to claim ACCS child wellbeing. These changes included reducing the initial approval period from 13 weeks to six weeks, approving eligibility certificates for only 13-week periods, only allowing 28 days of backdating of ACCS payments and deeming any application that aren't approved by Centrelink in 28 days to be refused. Now, Labor and the early childhood education sector warned the government that these changes would have a detrimental impact on families. The government, of course, ignored these warnings, and within six months the number of vulnerable families accessing this payment collapsed by 20 per cent. And ever since these changes were made, the sector has been calling on the Morrison government to fix this red tape nightmare. Unfortunately, the government spent many months with their heads in the sand over this issue, and as a result, it's taken a long time to reverse the decline. And the Department of Education told Senate estimates that they were not concerned about the drop in the number of families accessing the payment, nor were they tracking whether families had dropped out of the system. As a measure which supports at-risk and vulnerable children, I wouldn't be surprised if the decline resulted in an increase in demand for other support services. But even more worrying, and this is 
this especially concerns me as a long-time campaigner against child abuse and neglect, is the possibility that this resulted in worse outcomes for the children concerned. I'm completely baffled that the government would not be concerned about the decline in families accessing the payment nor monitoring the impact that it has on vulnerable and at-risk families and those children in particular. While the number of children and families accessing the subsidy has reached the level it was at when the childcare changes were made, this was in part thanks to a significant effort and commitment of resources from providers. Madam Deputy President, more needs to be done to reduce this red tape burden for families. This bill makes changes in a, in a number of areas which will reduce the administrative burden on providers and at-risk families while providing greater financial security to these families. Providers will be able to enrol children in foster care under the provider rather than a parent or foster carer for up to 13 weeks while the parent or foster carer is applying for a Centrelink reference number and childcare subsidy. This will help the transition for the children in foster care when they enrol with the provider or move between foster care arrangements. Providers will be able to apply for ACCS to be back paid for up to 13 weeks instead of the previous four weeks. Providers will be able to request ACCS determinations for up to 12 months for children on long-term child protection orders or in foster care, up from the previous 13 weeks. And finally, the calculation method used when family circumstances change during a year for circumstances such as the separation of um, parents or the death of a parent or parents will be changed to ensure CCS eligibility more accurately reflects the new circumstances and their CCS payments. These are positive changes and Labor will support them. Like my Labor colleagues, I welcome any reduction in the administrative burden on families relying on early childhood education and care. Unfortunately, Many of the recent changes made by the government have actually increased the red tape burden for families accessing childcare. And for a government that likes to trumpet their credentials when it comes to red tape reduction, their changes to childcare subsidy are an indelible stain on their record. The new system introduces complicated activities and means tests. It forces childcare providers to act as unpaid debt collectors for the government is riddled with software glitches and raises childcare subsidy debts without any explanation. The government's childcare system is not only complicated and administratively burdensome, but for families and providers, it's also expensive. Australia has some of the highest out-of-pocket childcare expenses in the world, and they have been rising rapidly under this government. Childcare fees have increased by 7.2 per cent in the 12 months to December last year, which adds up to an increase of 34 per cent since the Liberals came to power. This represents an average additional cost of $3,800 per year per family. While Australia's childcare system already confronts families with some of the highest out-of-pocket expenses in the world, the Morrison government has introduced a system that leaves one in four families worse off. That's, 2000, uh, sorry, that's um, 279,000 families, 279, families for whom access to childcare has become a greater strain on the family budget because of the changes made by those opposite. Is it any wonder that those opposite have gone silent on their claims that their new system would put downward pressure on fees and that they were driving down the cost of childcare? Uh, no. But what the government were claiming at the time they introduced their new system, that's what they were claiming, that it would put downward pressure on fees and they were driving down the cost of childcare. Well, you don't hear those claims from them now because they're not true. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government proudly trumpeted their free childcare policy but failed to adequately fund it in a way that provides enough childcare places to meet demand or ensure, ensures the viability of providers. This has left many families without access to childcare, while some providers have had to struggle to stay afloat. And instead of fixing the mess they made, they've now broken their promise to continue providing JobKeeper to early childhood educators until September and snapped back to the old childcare system last month. A survey commissioned 
by the front project before the childcare snapback predicted the disastrous impact that would have on family budgets during a recession. And responding to the survey, 57 per cent of families said that childcare fees impact their social spending. 55 per cent said they impact their grocery budgets and 35 per cent said they impact where they choose to live. Out-of-pocket childcare costs were already having a massive impact on family budgets prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And now that Australia is in the midst of a recession, this snapback has put further pressure on families that are already struggling through the loss of work and reduction in household incomes. And of course, when I um, think about the comments of Senator Rennick in the chamber earlier this year, I'm really hardly surprised that the childcare system under this government is so expensive and so complicated. Should we be surprised if it's the attitude of those opposite that parents should just stay home? According to Senator Rennick, that's the ideal for parents of pre-school age children not engaging in work, not having their children receiving the developmental benefits of early, um, quality early childhood education, not balancing work and family commitments but staying at home with your kids, which is fine if you can afford to do it and choose to do it, and I'll speak more about that a bit later on. But it's of little surprise that Australia's childcare system is expensive and complicated when subsidised early childhood education is seen as, and I quote Senator Rennick, the hand of government reaching in and stealing our children's youth. So I remind those opposite, as yet not one of you, not one of you on that side of the chamber have challenged Senator Rennick's remarks nor sought to dis disassociate the government from them. So unless you do, and the debate on this bill is a perfect opportunity for you, then you own them. So I do call on those opposite. In fact, I challenge them, any one of them, to stand up for working parents, stand up for early childhood educations and state loudly and proudly that Senator Rennick's comments do not reflect the views of the modern Liberal Party. Because if you fail to do that, this is the message it sends to the community. It tells early childhood educators, as I said, of which I was one for over a decade, that their work is not valued. It tells educators that instead of playing a valuable role in contributing to the learning and development of children, they're holding them back. It tells working parents that by participating in the workforce and placing their children in formal care that they are failing their children. The views that Senator Rinnick expressed previously in this chamber belong way in the past, and the failure of those opposite to reject those outdated views is an implicit endorsement of them by the Morrison government. By contrast, the senators on this side of the chamber all value early childhood education and care. And as a former educator myself, I know that it can make an enormous contribution to the physical, social, psychological and emotional development of the children. That's not just the view I've formed from personal experience. It's backed up by the studies both in Australia and overseas. And unlike Senator Rennick, I do not see government subsidised childcare as the hand of government reaching in and stealing our children's youth. What an outrageous slur against early childhood educators. These comments are also a slur against working parents. When Senator Rennick says that early childhood education is stealing our children's youth, and that's a direct quote, he implies that working parents with preschool aged children are complicit in this alleged theft. But parents should not be made to feel guilty because they choose to use early childhood education services, because they choose to work instead of being stay at home parents. Being a stay-at-home parent is a legitimate choice, but it's just as legitimate a choice as pursuing a career. Surely a good parent, should they choose to, can balance their career and family life and still have a strong, productive relationship with their children. And let's not forget that not every parent has a choice. Not every parent can afford to stay home with their children. It's the height of hypocrisy for Senator Rennick to say that his party supports choice, but then to delegitimise the choice of work parents to work while having their children cared for and educated by trained professionals. Attitudes Order. such as Senator Rennick's are also a setback in the advancement of women's equality. 
Affordable, quality early childhood education and care is one of the key reasons why so many women in particular have been able to participate in the workforce. And we know that women take on a disproportionate share of childminding responsibilities and that such support, such as subsidised childcare, is a big driver when it comes to women's workforce participation and equal pay. Why is it, why is it that no one not one person on that side will stand up and challenge Senator Rennick's out of touch and outdated views. Is it because those on the other side are too spineless to do so, or do you actually agree that Australia should be dragged back into the middle of last century? I don't hold out much hope that those on the other side will challenge these comments because their front bench in the other place have already maligned publicly funding of early childhood education and care. The Minister for Education, Mr Tian, has described it as a communism, and the Prime Minister has referred to the childcare budget as a money pit. Well, that tells us a lot. That tells us a lot. Attitudes such as those demonstrate that the government sees early childhood education and care as an unnecessary cost. They do not see it as an investment in the learning and development of children or as a means of supporting parents to participate in the workforce. They do not value the enormous benefits it provides to Australia's economy or to the learning and development of our children. Um, and just in conclusion, um, while I'm concluding, Madam Deputy President, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all early childhood educators for their work, and particularly during the pandemic. It's been a difficult time for all educators as they've faced multiple challenges and changes to childcare policy, and they've dealt with rapid fluctuations in attendance. Despite the ongoing uncertainty facing the sector, educators have continued to focus on the development and wellbeing of the children in their care and have continued to deliver high quality early learning. And I know they will continue to do so. As I said earlier, this bill does make changes which improve assistance for vulnerable and disadvantaged, and Labor will support it, but the bill does not go far enough towards fixing the expensive, complicated and burdensome childcare system that this government is so intent on presiding over. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator McMahon. Madam Deputy President, I rise today to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment. Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill. The bill has been drafted to address feedback from the childcare sector. It is the most common, one of the most common inquiries from stakeholder groups that I received when the raft of COVID assistance packages came out. Stakeholders have raised areas where improvements can be made to streamline access to additional childcare subsidy in the context of the new childcare package implementation that occurred on 2 July 2018. And more recently, in submissions to the Senate inquiry into the Family Assistance Legislation, or Building on the Childcare Package Bill of 2019. The Morrison-McCormack government's primary aim is to support families and the childcare sector during the COVID-19 crisis to ensure that quality early childhood education and care is available to vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families. Let me just say that I believe having children is a choice and a choice that brings with it responsibility. Responsibility to be financially, legally and morally responsible for those children. Having children doesn't necessarily benefit society, yet society is increasingly being expected to bear the responsibility for them. Our, uh, our green friends over there who keep scaremongering about a climate crisis and screaming for us all to live in mud huts in the dark and cold neglect to address the single biggest driver of climate change greenhouse gas emissions, habitat destruction and species extinction in the world, and that is overpopulation. So instead of blaming us for all the evils on the planet and calling for us to live like hairy tree-climbing primates, perhaps they should turn their attention to what is contributing to our world population 
at an escalating rate. Having said that, however, I acknowledge and recognise that families are a vitally important part of the fabric of our society, particularly in Australia. It is something that we all treasure and value immensely. If parents and families abdicate their responsibilities, our society dictates that the government will step in and make sure that people aren't neglected and disadvantaged. This government takes this responsibility very seriously and continually excels in looking after Australian families and businesses. Let me take you back to a decision that seemed like a good one at the time, but has had long-term unintended consequences for the Northern Territory. The payment that came to be known as the baby bonus was introduced by the Howard government in 2004. It was then called maternity payment, <clears throat> and it was a non-means-tested lump sum replacement of the first child tax rebate and the maternity allowance. Now I love the work of the former PM and his revolutionary government, but this decision was a bad one for the Northern Territory. It immediately became seen not as a baby bonus, but as a buy things and spend on yourself bonus by many young girls. Many immediately began having ba one baby after another just for the $5,000 cash bonus. These babies were frequently handed over to grandparents and other relatives to raise. Sales of big screen TVs, PlayStations, mobile phones, and yes, drugs and alcohol, boomed. Very little, if any, of this bonus was actually spent on the vulnerable children. These baby bonus babies are now teenagers and have contributed, in some case, to a generation of breakers. Towns such as Catherine, Tennant Creek and Alice Springs are suffering from an unprecedented plague of youth crime. Gangs of kids as young as nine are running unchecked through town day and night, breaking, rock throwing, assaulting people, burning down buildings and public infrastructure. Our shambolic NT Labor government is haplessly standing by and literally watching the NT crumble and burn. Order. I speak regularly with the Mayor of Tennant Creek, Mayor Steve Edgington, and he continually informs me of the spiralling scourge of youth crime in his town. He told me just a few weeks ago that the town's only supermarket was burned down by a gang of 12 and 13 year old girls. These are not bad kids. They have just been failed by their parents and the system. Many of them have FASD, little education, poor or absent parenting, and they don't see anything positive in their futures. It is imperative that we do not repeat this process and in 10 years time end up with a generation of COVID problem youth. That is one of the many reasons this government is continually listening to advice and providing support where it's needed. In this case, this bill has been drafted to address feedback from the childcare sector. Stakeholders have raised areas where improvements can be made to streamline access to additional childcare subsidy in the context of the new childcare package implementation that occurred on 2nd of July 2018. In the Northern Territory, um, childcare and early educators rely heavily um, on workers that are not covered by JobKeeper, such as temporary visa holders and casuals that have not been working for them for 12 months. This is a feature in general of the NT's itinerant workforce. These changes will address that issue and support childcare providers and early childhood educators. The Australian government paid almost 50 million in additional childcare subsidies to cover childcare costs for 21,500 children 
in 2018-2019. The bill will cut the red tape that's impacting providers, families and governments in improving access to services for vulnerable children. It will do this by extending the backdating of the additional childcare subsidy certificates and determinations from 28 days up to 13 weeks in exceptional circumstances. This importantly helps provide care for children under a long-term protection order like children in foster care. The bill will also extend the period from 13 weeks up to 12 months that additional subsidy determination can be given for children on long-term child protection order, including, again, those in foster care. And it will clar clarify that a provider is eligible for the additional subsidy in respect of certain defined classes of children. Again, children in foster care would fall under this. These changes recognise the support that vulnerable children need over longer periods. And I particularly welcome these changes in the Northern Territory, where sadly our children face significant adversity. A recent Productivity Commission report found that children in the Northern Territory are more likely than Australian children overall to come into contact with the child protection system and face higher rates of socioeconomic disadvantage, depriving them of the best start in life. This isn't new. It is well documented in the Territory that a history of family and domestic violence and lower socioeconomic status are compounded by isolation, particularly in rural and remote communities. And this contributes to a higher risk of a child being vulnerable to neglect and mistreatment. Children in our isolated communities are also less likely to access the care and early education they need, which places them at significant disadvantage alongside children from areas with ample access to care and early education. In the NT, most childcare centres are small, family-run, not-for-profit or solo operator-run businesses. They rely heavily on workers not covered by JobKeeper. This, this is a feature that we are faced with generally in the Northern Territory, and these changes will address that issue. It is important to note that two-thirds of funding for early childhood education in the NT comes from the federal government. And I thank this government for the provision of that funding for NT families and children and small businesses. I applaud our government for this measure to help keep our children safe and ensure they receive the care and early childhood education they desperately need, and at the same time providing support to many of our, our small businesses and solo operators. Under our COVID-19 childcare relief package, around 99% of childcare providers were able to keep their doors open. The coalition government is providing record levels of funding in childcare. We are committed to quality, affordable childcare, particularly as we navigate COVID-19. Since July 13, our transition package, including a payment of 25 per cent of a provider's pre-COVID revenue, has supported centres around Australia, including in the Northern Territory. This bill demonstrates our commitments to improving access to childcare for vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families and to cutting red tape for families and childcare providers. I would also like to mention the outstanding result achieved by the Country Liberal Party in last Saturday's Northern Territory election. Going into the election, the Country Liberal Party held two seats with one of those members retiring 
this was effectively won. Whilst counting is continuing, as I speak today, the CLP looks to have secured five seats and possibly up to eight. This is not only a magnificent achievement by the CLP, it is a reflection of Labor's disastrous management of a decimated economy and complete loss of control order. of law and order. order. It is also confirmation of this federal government's performance generally and in respect to COVID with legislation such as this. This government supports families and supports a strong and vibrant childcare sector. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families Bill 2020, which was introduced to the House of Representatives on the 26th of February this year. This bill seeks to amend several acts relating to the additional childcare subsidy and childcare subsidy. And as we have heard, it will extend the backdating of additional childcare subsidy certificates and determinations from the current period of 28 days to up to 13 weeks in prescribed exceptional circumstances and extend the period from 13 weeks to up to 12 months to allow a determination to be made for certain prescribed classes of children, such as children on a long-term child protection order, including those in foster care. Additionally, the new tax system Family Assistance Administration Act 1999 will be amended to correct minor technical drafting errors to modify the calculation used at childcare subsidy balancing for individuals that change their relationship status through partnering, separating or bereavement during the year. The changes will bring the calculation into line with other government payments. The calculation method proposed in the bill will ensure families' childcare subsidy entitlements are fair, consistent and accurate. It will reflect the family's financial circumstances throughout the year by recognising periods and the actual incomes associated with those periods when they were single with their own income or partnered with a combined income. Lastly, the bill makes two minor technical amendments to add clarity. These amendments will provide exceptions when the Secretary may vary the approval of a childcare provider to remove a service and correct the omission of the civil penalty amount in section 204K5. This bill has been drafted to address feedback from the childcare sector. Stakeholders have raised areas where improvements can be made to streamline access to additional childcare subsidy in relation to the new childcare package implementation that occurred on 2 July 2018 and more recently in submissions to the Senate inquiry into the Family Assistance Legislation Building on the Child Care Package Bill 2019. Additional child care subsidy is part of the child care safety net, giving the most vulnerable and disadvantaged children a strong start through access to quality, early childhood education and care. Additional child care subsidy is a top-up payment in addition to child care subsidy. The Australian Government paid almost $50 million in additional childcare subsidy subsidies to cover childcare costs for 21,500 children in 2018-19. This Government's primary aim is to support families in the childcare sector during the COVID-19 crisis. We want to ensure quality early childhood education and care is available to vulnerable and disadvantaged children and families. As Australians return to work, businesses reopen and children return to classroom learning, the government resumed the childcare subsidy to support families to continue to access affordable childcare. Under the childcare relief package, which was announced by Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the Minister for Education, Dan Tehan, in early April, around 99% of childcare providers kept their doors open throughout this pandemic. Around 1 million families received free childcare during the coronavirus pandemic under the Australian Government's plan to support families and help the early childhood education and care sector. Like so many of us here in this place, early in the outbreak of COVID-19, childcare concerns of both parents and providers were one it of being, the most regular. Sorry, Senator. It being 12.45, the debate is interrupted. We'll move to Senator's statements. You'll be in continuation. Senator Sazelja. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, it's always an honour to rise in this place and pay tribute to outstanding members of uh, the Canberra community. And just last week, I attended the tribute of Canberra Private Robert Pope. 
uh, as we approach the anniversary of his tragic passing. And I can think of no more appropriate words than those of his family, who loved him most in the world, to share with this place uh, of, in relation to Private Poet's life. So I share uh, some of those words now. Robert attended Canberra Grammar School from preschool to year 12, uh, this period being two-thirds of his short life. Robert was an intelligent student and a suburb all-round athlete. He was awarded Blacksland House Colours and the Mark Sowell Award for Outdoor Education. He was captain of the open grade third 15 rugby football team, uh, where he played as 5'8", and he regularly played with the second 15. In his final year at school, his football team presented him with the Players' Player Award. Robert was gre gregarious, charismatic. He made friends easily and had a wonderful sense of humour. His family and his friends meant everything to him. He loved the outdoor life, particularly camping, fishing and hunting. This love of the outdoors was a strong influence on his decision to join the Australian Army in 2009. Robert was posted to the 6th Battalion, the Royal Australia Regiment, 6 RAR, where he quickly earned himself a reputation as a fun-loving person and a great mate to be around. There was never a dull moment when Pody was present. He was a great morale booster and was known as a dedicated soldier, a quick learner and a man on a mission to go to Afghanistan. As a junior soldier, he was also identified for his leadership skills ahead of most of his peers, and he completed an infantry section leaders course. Robert deployed to Afghanistan as crew commander of a Bushmaster vehicle with Mentoring Task Force 5 in June 2012. The vehicle he commanded was regularly the lead vehicle in convoys and patrols. On 29 August 2012, Robert was tragically killed, along with two of his mates, uh, by enemy fire at patrol base at Wahab, Orozgan Province, Baluchi Valley, Afghanistan. Hugh, Janny and Nicola are left with wonderful memories of Robert, particularly his ever-present smile, his great sense of humour and his unconditional love. And I want to thank uh, the Pope family for those beautiful words. Soldier On here in Canberra hosted a beautiful tribute to the life of Private Pope. Uh, in recent days, a life he led as both a man and a soldier that his friends and family will be eternally proud of. Uh, local Canberrans Colin Grief and Mike Hogan performed a touching musical tribute written in honour of Private Pote as part of the ceremony. Very movingly, a handmade quilt, lovingly made by Avril Grief, was presented to Private Pote's family, overlaid with poppies and the ode, was presented to Pote's family on behalf of Soldier On. Robert was aged just 23 when he and he and two mates were playing cards at their ba base at Tarrant Cout in Uruzgon province in 20, August 2012 when a rogue soldier, a trusted sergeant with the Afghan, Afghan army, turned on them. It has been reported that the man responsible is likely to be one of the prisoners released as part of the US promoted peace negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Prime Minister Morrison has repeatedly confirmed it is the position of the Australian government that this rogue soldier, responsible for the murder of three young Australians, should never be released. I understand the Prime Minister has written to the US President strongly advocating our position on this issue, and I join with him uh, in this plea. As the government continues to push for this offender to remain in prison, we near the anniversary of this fateful attack. So to Hugh, to Jenny and Nicola, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you. Now, Acting Deputy President, um, there is no doubt uh, that if you look around Canberra, uh, that Canberra is a place that has been built by primarily Liberal national governments. Uh, it has been Liberal national governments who have built Canberra, uh, who have delivered us uh, our wonderful institutions. And if you go through the list, the National Library, the National Gallery, the National Museum, New Parliament House, National Portrait Gallery, the Australian Institute of Sport, uh, the Royal Australian Mint, the Tidbin Billa Deep Space Tracking Station, the list goes on and on. And I wanted to talk about the fact that we are building on that legacy uh, as a Liberal national government in the last couple of years in our massive and unprecedented investments in Canberra. Uh, just in the last couple of years, uh, we have announced over $1 billion uh, in new investments uh, right here in the ACT. And I wanted to share some of those investments because I think they are investments that not only can be, be very proud of as a government, uh, that Canberrans 
uh, can be very proud of and is great for our local economy. Uh, but I think as Australians, as we invest in our national capital, uh, a capital that I believe we can all be proud of, and we invest indeed in some of our national institutions uh, that Australians uh, right around the country can be very proud of. So as part of this more than $1 billion investment from the Liberal National Government in Canberra uh, in new investments just in the last two years. I want to go through some of those major investments. It is headlined uh, by the $500 million expansion of the Australian War Memorial, uh, our most loved national institution, one of our, our most visited attractions with over a million visitors per year. So we are investing in honouring the memory of our fallen. Uh, but we are also investing in the capital uh, of, our, of our nation and we are also investing in a great institution and something that draws a lot of tourists and, and we are seeing local jobs delivered. And in that vein, uh, many of these other projects uh, that I'm going to go through are delivering jobs uh, for Canberrans and indeed for people in our region, uh, Canberra being at the heart of southeastern New South Wales. Uh, but jobs in our region, uh, but also improving the lives of people uh, here in the capital, these huge Liberal national government investments. So I talked about the War Memorial expansion. Uh, we are investing in the Barton Highway uh, upgrade. Uh, we are investing $80 million in upgrades in the National Gallery. Uh, we've seen $33 million for the RMC uh, here just in the last couple of years, $100 million for the Monero Highway. Uh, getting people to and from work uh, more quickly uh, in Canberra's south uh, and indeed people from over the border as that area grows. Uh, we are investing in the future of our city. $30 million for the duplication of William Slim Drive, a very, very important road uh, for people in Belconnen. We've seen significant safety upgrades right around the city, most recently uh, in, on Southern Cross Drive in Belconnen, uh, and also we're investing uh, in significant safety improvements in Mawson. We've seen uh, over a million dollars just recently announced for new research facilities at the Australian National University, uh, my old university, Australia's foremost. Uh, tertiary education institution, and we are investing here as our, as our great national university. Uh, we've also seen uh, in recent times $17.6 million to deliver shovel ready infrastructure projects and urgent road safety upgrades. Uh, so, this includes uh, money for intersection upgrades around the city. $6 million for the Mitchell Light Rail Stop, $5 million for upgrades to Northbourne Avenue, $400,000 for traffic signal and uninterrupted power supply projects across 20 intersections, uh, money for road safety barriers, uh, $350,000 for various variable speed limits on the Tuggeranong Parkway between Cotter Road and Glenlock Interchange. Uh, we've also in recent times uh, committed uh, another $40 million under the Roads to Recovery uh, program. $21 million was announced as part of, as part of our commitment nationally uh, to investing in recycling. Just recently I had the privilege of being with Minister Lay as we announced $21 million uh, for the ACT material recovery facility. And just today uh, we saw another announcement of $8 million uh, in local infrastructure and community projects. And some of these uh, include uh, local cycleways and paths. Now, this is really important. Canberra is a cycling city. Uh, we love getting around on our bikes, and to uh, improve some of those links is a wonderful investment from the Liberal National Government. A million dollars for upgrades to the Stirling and Canberra playing fields uh, and the pavilions at the Woden and Closed Athletics Tract. Replacement of some of our street lamps. Uh, upgrades to Belconnen and Woden skate parks. Uh, Belconnen, Dixon, Kipax library branches are being upgraded, and we're seeing a number of community centres uh, right around the city, from down south in Tuggeranong, uh, into Woden, into uh, the inner north, uh, into Belconnen and Gungarlan. So right around our city, we are seeing significant investments. So uh, this latest announcement today builds on the more than one billion dollars. Uh, in new investments announced by this Liberal no National Government in Canberra. We are making this city a better place. We are investing in our local economy. And what we are doing is building on that great Liberal National tradition, uh, which is to build Canberra, to invest in our national capital. Uh, and when we do that, uh, I believe it is a wonderful thing for those people that I represent here in the ACT, uh, but I think it is, it is an investment in a capital uh, that we as Australians can all be proud of and continue think. to be proud of into the future.
Thank you, Senator Sazelja. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak about the issue that is affecting not just my home state of Queensland or the country, but really the whole world, and that is the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, we have all watched in horror, as we've seen, particularly in Victoria, the events there and the tragic loss of lives, uh, and the tra particularly in the aged care sector, which is something we've talked about at length uh, in the chamber this week. Uh, but even though in my home state of Queensland we certainly haven't seen the impact that we have in Victoria and other parts of the country, it still is something that is affecting us as well. One of the reasons why Queensland has been relatively unscathed compared to other states in Australia is because of the decisive action of the Palaszczuk Labor government in closing Queensland's borders. Uh, and a range of other preventative measures. Now, it's been very interesting being back down here this week in the Senate because it's the first time we've been here for a while. And I remember very clearly the Queensland LNP senators, in, including your good self, Mr Acting Deputy President, literally screaming at us at, from the other side of the chamber about how Queensland needed to open its borders. They were yelling and screaming and carrying on moving motions and speeches and questions and all sorts of things, abusing Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and the Labor Party for their strong decisions about keeping Queensland's borders closed. Well, haven't they been quiet this week? You could barely hear a mouse from the Queensland LNP in the Senate chamber this week because they know that they made the wrong call and that the overwhelming majority of Queenslanders are against what the LNP has been saying and they are with Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk when it comes to our borders. We know, we all know, that the Queensland LNP were only carrying on like pork chops down here in the Senate at the last sittings about borders because they thought they were on to a political winner in the run-up to a Queensland election. Well, didn't they get that wrong? They completely misjudged the Queensland population. They completely misjudged the health risk that was posed to Queensland if we didn't have closed borders. And of course, then we saw what happened in Victoria, and all of a sudden they realised they'd got it wrong. Well, I'm sure that Queenslanders, when they come to vote in the Queensland election at the end of October, will very well remember the different positions taken on this issue by Labor on the one hand and by the LNP on the other. I think in the case of Deb Frecklington, the state opposition leader in Queensland, where up to 64 times that she demanded that the Queensland borders be opened. And of course, that was replicated here in Canberra by her state uh, Queensland LNP colleagues. Well, haven't, haven't they changed their tunes now? Uh, Queenslanders will remember, I'm very confident, in, at the end of October, that it was Labor with Anastasia Palaszczuk that kept their health safe, and equally it will be Labor that guides Queensland to recovery in the months and years ahead. Now, in contrast to what we've seen from the Palaszczuk government, uh, we, we are seeing a range of measures taken by the Morrison government and his LNP uh, cohorts here in Canberra that actually jeopardise the Queensland economy right now and into the future. We know that at the end of September we will see cuts made to the JobKeeper payments and the JobSeeker payments that have been so crucial to so many Queensland families. Of course, only a few months ago the LNP and Scott, uh, Prime Minister Morrison didn't want to have a wage subsidy. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming into paying one by Labor, the union movement and the business community. And now, if you get around Queensland, every single business and every single worker you talk to will tell you how vital the JobKeeper payment is to their businesses staying afloat and to them being able to feed their families. But now we know that at the end of September those rates are scheduled to be cut, uh, which will mean that businesses will not be able to keep people on, and it means that Queensland families will have less money in their pocket. And probably the worst part of this is that at the very time that the federal government is intending to pull financial support out of the economy, pull financial support out of Queensland families, what they are also doing is not coming up with any plan around jobs. So they want to take money out of the Queensland economy and out of Queensland families, and they have no plan for what the new jobs in Queensland and the rest of the country will be. And that, of course, stands in stark contrast to the Palaszczuk government, which has a very clear plan for Queensland's recovery, particularly based around spending on infrastructure projects, supporting small business uh, and investing in new industries. Now, 
over the last few weeks, now that we are able to travel, those of us from Queensland are able to travel within Queensland, I've taken the opportunity to spend a lot of time in regional Queensland. I've literally been from Cape York to Coolangatta and pretty much every major provincial city in between. And what is very clear to me, no matter where I go in Queensland, is that people are desperately waiting for the Morrison government to come up with a jobs plan. They know that the clock is ticking on JobKeeper, on JobSeeker and a whole range of other financial support that's being provided by the Morrison government. And what they also know is that there is no jobs plan whatsoever from our federal government to make sure that there are going to be new jobs available for when this money does come out of people's pockets. Well, it seems that we can't rely on Prime Minister Morrison or any of his LNP senators or MPs to come up with a plan. So what, let me just put three basic ideas on the table that are based on the discussions that I've been having with people right throughout regional Queensland. There, really, there's three very easy things that the government could be doing. They could be fast-tracking infrastructure projects uh, to get businesses and workers back on the tools. They could be rebuilding our manufacturing industry, particularly in regional Queensland. And thirdly, they could be investing in the training that they have ripped money out of over the last few Order. years. So let's just go through them one by one. Fast-tracking infrastructure projects. Now, creating Order. jobs is the key to our regions recovering from their Order. first recession we have seen in 30 years. First recession in 30 years is what the Morrison government and the Frydenberg government have inflicted on Queenslanders and the rest of the country. Order. Now, I know, I know, I know. Government the senators don't want to don't want to hear this. The contribution previously from the other side was not interrupted in any shape or form from this side, and I would ask that senators on that side give our side the same um, courtesy. Senator it is important, and, and I, I, I will take, of course, your guidance, uh, Chair. But it is also important that speakers do tell the truth if they don't want to be heckled. So. Thank you, Sen Senator. Um, on the point of order, I will just rule that uh, interjections are disorderly, and I will ask both sides of the house to, to, to of the chamber to uh, let the senator be heard. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I can understand why the government doesn't want to hear this, but unfortunately they have not been capable of coming up with a jobs plan of their own, so here we are, happy to help. I'm from Queensland, I'm here to help. So, firstly, fast-tracking infrastructure projects. Now, Senator Rennick Order. and his other Queensland colleagues might not be aware of this, but only a few weeks ago we had the Prime Minister, also known as Scotty from Marketing, uh, getting out there and making a big announcement about how point of order, Senator Sizelja. Apart from not order. telling the truth, he's now uh, not referring uh, to people in the other place, uh, i.e., the Prime Minister by a proper title. Uh, Senator Watt, I will ask you to refer to other members and senators according. Happy to, with, to, happy to withdraw Thank and you. refer to the Prime Minister as the Prime Minister. So a few weeks ago, we saw the Prime Minister make a big announcement, something that we know he likes to do. Not so good on the follow-through, but he loves making a big announcement, usually with an ad ready to go. So he made a big announcement that. He was going to have 15 major projects around the country that were going to be fast-tracked so we could get infrastructure happening and jobs happening. Well, guess how many of those projects are in, the, are in my home state of Queensland? Guess how many projects are in the state that the Prime Minister has said delivered him his election victory uh, last year? One. Out of 15 major projects being fast-tracked around the country, he could only find one project in Queensland that he was prepared to fast-track, and that project basically is really a New South Wales Victoria project, the Inland Rail, and it doesn't go any north of Brisbane. So there is not one project in north of Brisbane that this Prime Minister and his government are prepared to fast track. I mean, I get around regional Queensland and I see a few projects that are, that are happening. Point and of order, Senator Rennick. Leading. We've been, uh, That's fast not a point of order. Please are. take your seat, Senator Rennick. Take your seat, please. Senator White. They're very touchy, Madam Academia Deputy President. And I would be, I would be too if I was a senator elected from a state Order. and I can't deliver more than one project being fast tracked. I'd be embarrassed as well. Um, so, only one project being fast tracked in Queensland. None of them north of Brisbane. Uh, and and the one project that they have fast tracked in Queensland won't actually start for two years. I mean, if that's fast tracking, I'd hate to be in the slow lane. But that's the plan that the that the Morrison government has. Central Queensland, North Queensland, our regions in general have every right to having projects fast tracked just as much as Sydney, Melbourne or anywhere else in the country. The second point, how about rebuilding Australian manufacturing? And I've had to sit here 
this week and try and keep a straight face as I've seen government senators talk about how important Australian manufacturing is. Well, hello. Where were you when you were turning your back on the car industry? Where were you when you were just letting our manufacturing industry slide? Where are you now as your own government tries to rip out $2 billion in research and development tax incentives to help the manufacturing industry? Well, I'm glad that you finally cottoned on that Australian manufacturing actually matters, that it creates jobs, good blue-collar jobs, not only in places like Brisbane, Ipswich, the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, but in Rockhampton, in Townsville, in Mackay and in Cairns and everywhere in between. So let's start seeing Order. some actual investment in manufacturing to rebuild an industry that has died under this government's watch. I met just outside Rockhampton, went with, uh, met with people at Central Queensland Sandstone, doing a fantastic job getting state government grants to upgrade their technology and improve their productivity. Nothing at all from the federal government. It's about time we see it. And thirdly, how about we see the, the government invest in training? In fact, what we've actually seen from this government over seven years is $3 billion being ripped out of TAFE. In Queensland alone, we've got 27,000 fewer apprentices and trainees than were in place when this government was elected seven years ago. Let's start investing. Let's see a jobs Time, plan. Senator Let's White. get Queensland moving. Senator Seward. I rise this afternoon to talk about the job seeker payment. And it breaks my heart that the Morrison government has not ruled out dropping the job seeker payment back to $40 per day way below the poverty line at the end of December. At the end of September, in fact, the government is dropping the coronavirus supplement to by $300 to $250 a fortnight, which will have a very significant impact on people's ability to pay their rent their or their mortgage, essential bills and, in fact, to put food on the table. This uncertainty is having a huge effect on people. I consider this reckless, unfair and fiscally irresponsible not for, the, for the government not to be telling people what is happening with the job seeker payment. Australia gave a sigh of relief when the government effectively doubled the rate of job seeker with the coronavirus supplement, relieving the unnecessary desperation and suffering that people in our community feel when they're forced to live on $40 a day. Single mothers going without meals so they could feed their children, people choosing between their medication or dinner, and those people living in unsafe situations because there were no rental properties that they could afford to live in when they were living so far below the poverty line on $40 a day. It also, of course, ensured that those that were losing their job due to the pandemic could live above the poverty line. Since the job seeker payment was increased with the coronavirus supplement, I've been hearing from people about what they are doing with the increase, eating fresh food, paying their bills, looking after their health, buying medication and planning for their future. Today, ACOS reported that more than 80 per cent of community service workers survey, surveyed about the coronavirus supplement have said that the increased rates of income support were having a positive impact on the lives of the people they helped. Nationally, the unemployment rate sits at a 22-year high of 7.5 per cent. The effective unemployment rate sits at 9.9 at per cent, and Treasury predicts it will reach 13 per cent by December. This figure is a better representation of unemployment in our country because the effective unemployment rate includes people who have uh, work zero hours and those who have dropped out of the labour market um, altogether. When the rate of job seeker payment is cut by $300 a fortnight at the end of September, what will the millions of people out of work do? They need to survive and yet they're being forced below the poverty line. And I must ask, what impact will this have on the economy? The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, recently said that people are in jobs. They don't need income support. And of course, there is the old classic, the best form of welfare is a job. These statements miss the point and are like saying, if people aren't sick, they don't need hospitals. The unfortunate truth is, this health and economic crisis will not be over at the end of September. It will not be over in December. Millions of unemployed Australians need an ad adequate amount of money to eat and pay their rent or mortgage. The pre-COVID-19 job seeker rate 
of $40 a day does not support an acceptable minimum standard of living. It is poverty. How can the government even consider going back to that? It is unimaginable, unthinkable that we could drop people back to $40 a day. How can you not give millions of people in this country who will need to survive on the job seeker payment, how can you not give them certainty that they won't go back to $40 a day? Not only is that cruel to the people, but it also will wreak havoc on our economy. Next week, Anglicare will release a special update to their rental affordability snapshot. This will show that rental, uh, uh, as I understand it, this will show that rental affordability has actually worsened for people on the lowest incomes. Price drops at the higher end of the market have had little benefit to people on low incomes. People in our community are so stressed and anxious about how they are going to pay their rent and their mortgage come September, and then particularly come December. The Australia Institute estimates that when the government cuts the rate of the job seeker payment in September, 270,000 people with mortgages and renting will be forced into poverty. It is shameful that this government is willing to oversee hundreds of thousands of Australians being pushed into poverty for the first time, all in the name of ideology, because that's what it is. What a terrible way to start 2021 with millions of people defaulting on their mortgage and their rent. In other words, becoming homeless. The government's plan to reintroduce the liquid assets waiting period in September will force the unemployed Australians into precarious situations. They will have to wear down their savings before being able to access income support. This will leave many people without the critical lifeline to fall, um, to fall back on um, because their savings will be eroded. While people are anxiously awaiting, waiting to find out whether JobSeeker will drop to $40 a day, they are also facing the reintroduction of mutual obligations. At the moment, you can only be penalised for failing to accept a suitable job. This hasn't stopped employment service providers resorting to predatory practices and behaviour and exploited unemployed workers. We are still hearing reports of employment, ser employment service providers forcing people to attend appointments sign off on job plans that are inappropriate and they have had no say in it, and, and to undertake unemployed work, uh, unpaid I beg your pardon, work trials. This crisis has put a giant spotlight on how poorly this government and past governments have treated people on income support. It should not have taken a global pandemic for our unemployment payment, payment to be increased. The government's failure to deliver uncertainty to people on income support is cruel and unfair and undermines confidence in the economy. Keeping the job, job seeker payment above the poverty, poverty line will save people's lives and livelihoods. You sh we should not be cutting the job seeker payment by $300 a fortnight. We should be continuing with the full supplement so that people have a livable income. This is clearly a very significant issue and has a clear link to um, people's mental health. There is a clear link between mental health and financial stress, and the government is contributing to the stress and anxiety in our community by not giving people certainty over their financial future. The government could make a significant investment the, the government could make an additional significant investment in the mental health of 1.6 million people in, on JobSeeker by giving them certainty that it won't fall below the poverty line in December, when people may be forced to $40 a day. This government needs to break their addiction to stigmatising and targeting people on income support. It's unacceptable to treat people like second-class citizens just because they are on income support. And that if you have been on JobSeeker payment, there is no doubt in your mind that in the past the government treats you as a second-class citizen. And unfortunately, it seems to be where we are slipping back to right now. The choices our government makes now to help us get through this crisis could set a better course for the future of our communities. We can and should choose to adequately support people impact, impacted by the high unemployment rates. 
no income support payment should be below the poverty line. Not only is this a significant investment in people, it is a significant investment in our economy. If people have to default on their mortgages, on their rent, they become homeless. What impact do you think that is going to have on our economy? It's going to have a massive impact on our economy. How can we rebuild our economy if people are living in poverty and are homeless when we know poverty is a barrier to, in itself to employment? Cutting income support payments to those who need it most is a choice, not an inevitability. I never again want to see people in our community denied dignity and forced to live on $40 a day because their jobs simply aren't there. It is critical that we keep the coronavirus supplement at the current rate, not cut it to $300 a day. People will be forced below the poverty line with that cut. Come December, it will be below the poverty line even further if we go to $40 a day. We need to treat people in this country with dignity. We need to make sure our income support system is fit for purpose. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Having faced its toughest year in living memory, Australians will need to make some important decisions to ensure that we do not leave unsustainable debt levels for our children. Tax reform won't be enough to deal with the estimated $1 trillion in debt that many expect government debt to reach before the impacts of COVID are overcome. It is therefore necessary to look at other areas of reform, in particular monetary policy. Monetary policy was outsourced to unelected officials at the RBA by Paul Keating in 1992 in one of the great acts of democratic vandalism this country has ever seen. A, a government cannot control its economy if it doesn't control its currency. The last four governors of the RBA and most of their senior executive have only ever worked at the RBA. Their lack of knowledge when it comes to monetary policy became apparent when they lowered interest rates to zero, destroying the retirement incomes of our seniors and inflating house prices beyond the reach of our younger generation. Rather than just change interest rates, they should have also adjusted the volume of money in the system. The expansion of credit should have then been used to fund nation-building infrastructure, such as dams, power stations and transport corridors. Such a policy would create jobs, provide essential services and generate income for the government. Increasing the supply of energy, freight and water would also lower costs for business. Indeed, the 1937 Banking Royal Commission expressly says that the central bank should control the volume of credit in the system. This was the Australian government policy until 1985, when Paul Keating, in another great act of economic vandalism, allowed foreign banks into Australia. This effectively outsourced control of the monetary supply to unelected foreign banks with no oversight of how foreign capital was invested. In 1985, the total amount of foreign debt held by financial institutions in Australia was $10 billion. By 2008, it was $800 billion. Most of this foreign debt was invested into housing, so that today the average house price is almost 13 times average earnings, up from four times average earnings in 1985. The RBA, in complete ignorance of its role, has sat on its hands allowing the housing bubble to inflate, while other sectors of the economy, notably manufacturing, starved through a lack of credit. Furthermore, they have allowed foreign capital to take ownership of our essential infrastructure and much of our wealth. It's time for a new way of thinking. The first, first myth that needs to be busted is that Australia has always relied on foreign capital. This way of thinking has resulted in the sale of critical infrastructure unsustainable foreign debt levels in both the private and public sector and billions of dollars in profits being sent offshore for the last 35 years. Those who un truly understand finance know that capital doesn't create wealth. In the words of our national anthem, wealth comes from toil. It comes from turning rainwater into energy and water into irrigation, sunlight into fields of wheat, barley and cotton and iron ore into steel to build our roads and housing. As I said in my maiden speech, 
When the convicts got off the boat, all they had was their will to survive. There were no financial instruments, regulations, scoping studies or subsidies in sight. Our prosperity has come from the hands of our carpenters and mechanics, the minds of our scientists and engineers, the hearts of our teachers and nurses, and most importantly, the persistence and innovation of small business owners. Capital is not an asset, but rather the means by which an asset is controlled. It is either debt or equity. In a lending arrangement, the lender has the power over the borrower. Those who say that we need to attract foreign capital are in effect saying that Australia should hand over its assets to foreign control. What's the point of being a sovereign nation if you don't maintain sovereignty over your infrastructure or banking system? Australia's way of life doesn't depend on foreign debt, but rather the ability to generate wealth. True wealth is the capacity to produce goods and services to ensure self-reliance and independence. It's worth noting that under Robert Menzies, foreign debt was reduced to almost zero, while at the same time home ownership rose from 54 per cent to 70 per cent under his leadership. To ensure our nation's wealth is passed on to our children, it is vital that the government funds wealth creation projects via its own currency rather than foreign currency. This was well understood by modern Australia's founding father, Lachlan Macquarie. He was the first governor to see Australia as a country rather than a colony, and that in order to fund infrastructure for the fledging colony, he introduced an official currency, the holy dollar, to fund significant capital projects, many of which still stand in Sydney today. Today, the holy dollar is now the logo for Macquarie Bank, which, like many private banks, profits from the sale of, the from the sale of infrastructure aided and abetted by superannuation funds. If 30 years of neoliberalism has taught us anything, it's that markets don't build infrastructure. Governments do. Markets do not have the patience for the long lead time it takes for infrastructure projects to return a profit, nor does it tolerate the regulatory risk imposed by belligerent bureaucrats who are determined to impede rather than enable progress. Take, for example, the Bradfield scheme. If it was to cost $5 billion to build, and the funding capital was funded via foreign debt, the first $5 billion in wealth would be lost to foreign investors. If the cost of interest was added in, the amount of wealth lost could easily double. In financial terms, sovereignty is equity. So why do governments give up security of our wealth so easily to foreign banks when our own government can fund infrastructure? The privatisation of infrastructure by government has been a failure. It has jeopardised Australia's economic sovereignty, created inner-city millionaires while leaving our regions destitute. How can we teach our children to be self-reliant when we've left them nothing in the cupboard to rely on? While indeed money can't be printed out of thin air, wealth is generated from thin air via sunlight and water. Monetary policy can stimulate fiscal policy through the issue of infrastructure bonds by the RBA to an independent standalone infrastructure bank that reports to the Treasurer, Treasurer and Parliament. It should have a strict mandate of investing in certain asset classes, such as dams, power stations, transmission networks, transport corridors, ports and oil refineries. It's time for the RBA to stop sitting on its hands and start funding significant nation-building infrastructure projects. Productivity is the key to any successful economy. Regardless of ideologically driven notions around economic philosophy, it is ultimately the job of government to create an economic environment to ensure people are appropriately rewarded for their efforts and that markets remain fair, competitive and efficient. Part of Australia's recovery must be to re-establish our sovereign economic capacity. The pandemic laid bare just how important self-reliance regarding the issue of global supply chains are. They cannot be guaranteed, and a mandate of the Infrastructure Bank should be to ensure Australia has the capacity to stand on its own feet in times of a crisis, whatever that may be. To understand how effective monetary policy can be, compare China to the US over the last 40 years. China has lifted a billion people out of poverty because its central bank, not private banks, funded the development of dams, power stations and transport corridors. It's also uh, accumulated around a trillion dollars in US government bonds. 
On the other hand, the US has outsourced most government responsibilities to the private sector, including its central bank, resulting in over $20 trillion of federal government debt, decaying infrastructure and unfunded public service liabilities that threaten the solvency of many of its states. It is also time to over overturn the autonomy of the RBA. In a democracy, decisions regarding, relating to interest rates and infrastructure development need to be subject to the approval of the people. Otherwise, where is the accountability? Who did retirees hold to account for the destruction of their savings income? The point of democracy is to hold government to account. Yet how can this happen if the RBA is completely independent from government? It is important to note the distinction between an infrastructure bank and modern money, monetary theory. An infrastructure bank will create wealth by increasing the production of goods and services, whereas modern monetary theory will facilitate consumption rather than production of goods and services. To recover from COVID, Australia must abandon the policy of infrastructure privatisation and interest rate manipulation introduced by a reckless Labor Party and instead focus on building infrastructure that will provide a path to prosperity for our children. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, right now we're facing a global pandemic that is not only impacting our health, but has caused Australia's first recession in almost 30 years. And so many people are doing it tough right now. And too many people have lost their jobs and their livelihoods. But this crisis has shone a light on another crisis that Australia was already facing the crisis of low-paid, insecure work. Overwhelmingly, those industries that have been hardest hit by job losses are those with highly casualised and insecure workforces. And it is also casual, insecure workers that have often faced the terrible choice during this pandemic of whether to isolate at home when sick or risk going to work to pay the bills and keep their jobs. In Victoria and around the country, far too many people are in low-paid and insecure work. And long-term, we need a plan that will create good, secure jobs in Australia. But right now, we need a solution to support these workers through this pandemic, one that means they don't face the awful choice that I just mentioned, and one that helps us stop the spread of this virus. Because COVID-19 is spreading through our workplaces, and to stop it spreading in workplaces, people need to be able to stay home when they're sick. But 40 per cent of Australian workers have no entitlement to any form of paid leave today. In Victoria, the pandemic has been spreading along the fault lines of the existing epidemic of insecure work in our society. Too many people don't have sick leave. They can't afford to miss a shift. They can't afford to lose their job. And casual workers and gig workers know all too well that in so many cases the only way to hold on to their job is to just keep turning up. These workers in Victoria have faced a dilemma that no one should have to face. Should I go to work sick in the middle of a pandemic? Or should I stay home with no income and no ability to support myself and my family? Should I go to work and put my work mates at risk, my community at risk? Or should I stay home and risk my job? This dilemma is at the heart of the spread of COVID-19 in Victoria. The virus has been spreading through workplaces with high levels of insecure work, laundries, meatworks and aged care. It's been spreading in industries where people work one, two and even three jobs to make ends meet. It's been spreading in industries where people are in direct contact with each other and with the community and where working from home is just not an option. And it's been spreading in parts of the city in the north and the west that have high levels of disadvantage and high levels of insecure jobs. People in casual jobs, contract jobs, gig jobs, labour hire jobs, they want to do the right thing as much as anyone else does. But we have to make it straightforward for them to do what is necessary. And we have to make it clear to employers that we expect them to support their workers to stay home when they need to. Last month, 
Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews told us that about 80 per cent of the state's new infections since mid-May had been driven by transmission in workplaces. He's told us that this COVID crisis is a crisis of insecure work. An estimated 3.7 million Australians don't have any access to paid sick leave or the other protections of permanent employment, including those casuals, contractors, freelancers, sole traders and gig economy workers. And research by the ACTU shows that too many people say they would still attend work even if they had COVID-like symptoms. They would go to work sick, and the reason is because they were afraid of losing their jobs if they didn't. They were afraid of having their shifts or their hours reduced. Um, and in some cases, they just couldn't afford to have unpaid time off work. So it's well past time to address this problem and for the government to deliver a national paid pandemic leave scheme, something that Labor and the union movement have been calling for since March. A national paid pandemic leave scheme is just as much about the government telling employers that they expect people to be able to stay home. No threats, no risks, no loss of pay. It's just as much about that as it is about making it straightforward for workers to stay home. And to be clear, this is not just a Victorian problem. It's a national problem. We're being told over and again that we need to learn to live with this virus, that there'll be flare-ups and outbreaks. And paid pandemic leave is one of the vital tools in stopping those outbreaks from turning into second and third waves of the virus. So the idea that those opposite, those in government, who keep calling for the borders to be opened would make those calls without putting all the tools in place that we need to stop outbreaks and to stop new waves of the virus is nothing short of extraordinary. If government-funded paid pandemic leave ends up not being needed, then it won't cost a cent. And if it is needed, then it will save lives and livelihoods across the country. And this fact has been obvious for months. It was obvious back in March when Minister Porter told casual workers that they didn't need paid pandemic leave because they should have just saved up their casual loading. These comments have not aged well. And it's not enough for the Prime Minister to step in and fund pandemic crisis pay that the Victorian government had already put in place two months ago when cases spiked again. Two months ago, the Victorian government put a $1,500 worker support payment in place for people who needed to isolate with COVID-19. And the Prime Minister has rebadged that payment as a pandemic leave disaster payment for Victoria and taken over the funding. And that is welcome, it really is. But right now, today, it is just not enough. The scheme has to be national and it has to be a clear employment right. And it should be provided through employers who can then be reimbursed. And the federal government has to contribute. We need a national paid pandemic leave scheme. And until unless, and unless the Prime Minister announces that national paid pandemic leave, his decision to fund Victoria's existing payments will seem like just another photo op without follow through of what is really needed. A clear, consistent national funded paid pandemic leave plan and one that workers know is there for them. One that tells employers that they must allow their workers to stay at home and that they will be funded to do so. And just as important as a paid pandemic leave scheme to help support workers now, to help stop the spread of COVID-19 now, is the future. We need to address the problem of insecure work for good. We should be using this opportunity to rebuild the economy to work for everyone, to rebuild an economy where no one is left behind, an economy with good, secure jobs as our foundation, secure jobs that bring respect, that people can count on, that they can plan a future on. Australia can afford to do better, and as we recover from the COVID-19 crisis, let's focus on delivering the respect, the security, the opportunity that all Australians deserve. So I call on the government to deliver paid pandemic leave now, before it's too late. It will help stop new outbreaks. It will help prevent further lockdowns. It will help save jobs and lives. But I also call on them to deliver Australians a recovery plan for good, secure jobs deliver Australians a recovery and a future that they can count on. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. The Chinese Communist Party is paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to Australian academics to steal our country's intellectual property. 
Just more on the list when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. What do you know? It's called the Thousand Talents Plan. Australian university lecturers who sign up get flown over to China to share their research and share their knowledge of our latest technological developments with the Chinese government. Communist Party recruiters who sign up our lecturers get paid $40,000 for each person they get on board. How do you know? It's got to involve money. They have quietly set up 57 recruitment hubs around the country. 57 recruitment hubs? 57? Does that not scare anyone? It certainly doesn't in here, but I'll tell you what, it scares millions of Australians. They're recruiting from the ANU, the University of Sydney, Monash, the UWA and, of course, the University of Queensland. It's happening everywhere and it's been happening for years. But nobody in here in this big White House wants to talk about it. They don't want to talk about the Chinese Communist Party. God, don't mention them. Goodness me. Goodness me. We might upset them. Who cares? These people are some of the best we have. They're experts in the latest technology in artificial intelligence, in data mining and in automation. And our government... Our government is letting their sh them share their expertise with the Chinese military. And you want to speak to me about national security? Oh, this, just be this just keeps getting better in here, tell I tell you. So tell me, how does this make any sense? Do we not worry about our national security here in the country anymore? Because the next time you guys come to me with a plan to need my vote for national security, we're going to have a problem, I reckon. Here we've got the federal government spending an extra $270 billion, that's right, $270 billion, in improving our defence capabilities over the next 10 years. When they made that announcement, it came with a big song and dance, as it usually does, everything you'd expect from you guys over there. But at the same time, we've got our own experts and researchers going over to work with the Chinese military, and the government says, no worries, nothing to see here. As long as the Communist Party keeps the money flowing, they're happy to look the other way, and the universities are doing exactly the same. Mind you, that I imagine those universities are feeling the bite from not having those um, exchange students anymore. I tell you now, and probably you actually deserve it. That'll teach us. That'll serve you as right. Instead of investing in overseas students, especially those from China, you should have been doing it for your own backyard. So you universities out there that have been reliant on them, go suck it up, because quite frankly, you deserve it. There is a problem with our university system, and there has been for a long time. You have become reliant on the rivers of gold from international students, and you have been turning a blind eye to overt Chinese influence. This is where we're supposed to be training our kids, our kids. This is where our best ideas are supposed to come from. And what are those unis teaching our students? What are they sharing with our nation's competitors? What you're teaching is not courage. You're not teaching them that. What you're teaching them is, hey, take the money and roll over like a dog, because that's how apparently that's what we do now. That's what we do when we're frightened of another country. Don't show any leadership, don't show courage, just roll over, because apparently that's the Australian way for the 21st century. The fact is that those universities will always put their bottom line first and they don't care about free speech. It's all about cash. They don't care about academic integrity. That's all gone out the window. And all they care about is keeping the Chinese dollars flowing. That's why the University of New South Wales backed down so fast when they tweeted an article supporting protesters in Hong Kong. How gutless is that? How gutless is that? That is so un-Australian. It was only up for a couple of hours before their Chinese Communist Party masters pulled the puppet strings and forced the uni to take it down. Shameful. Shameful on you. The tweet was deleted and the article mysteriously disappeared from the university website. What a mystery that is, hey? Universities should be places where different ideas can be expressed and debated, because once again that is the Australian way. That's why those in the military, past and present, fight blood, sweat and tears and die for this country, to give it those freedoms. And you're throwing it in their face. New South Wales, University of New South Wales, pulling that article goes against everything it's supposed to stand for. It smacks in the face to anyone who cares about free speech in this country. The fact that one of our biggest universities in the country can be bullied by the Chinese Communist Party should scare the hell out of a lot of us. But it doesn't end there. It keeps getting better. Charles Darwin University apologised, because you know better either, for an assignment that stated coronavirus originated in China. Well, I don't know where, where they think it came from, but I think we already know, the rest of us know. 
So who's looking like the idiot? Oh, university that's supposed to be full of academics. Nice one. So the university apologised because Chinese students felt the statement was racist. Once again, teaching our kids in Australia to roll over. For what reason? Because of fear. How is it racist to tell the truth about the origin of this pandemic? How is that racist? What has truthfulness now turned into race, being a racist, has it? By telling the truth. Because China doesn't like it. Who cares? Who cares what China thinks? You have a perfect timing right now with this COVID-19 to loosen the strings with them a bit and stand on our own feet. My God, the, the opportunity is staring us in the face. What are we waiting for? I just can't believe that we've allowed ourselves to get to this point. It just makes me feel sick to the gut. And there'll be plenty of other millions of Australians out there that are saying the same thing, I can assure you. These latest incidents prove that our universities are prepared to look, up, look the other way as they invite the Chinese Communist Party surveillance state onto their Australian campuses. Well, aren't you just shameful? Are you teaching anything about national security in there? Because maybe it's about time your university started doing that and doing it in big lots, I reckon. Start teaching our, future, our kids of the future about national security, because, by God, we're going to need it at this rate. We need to toe the line because they have been propped up by government policies that encourage foreign students to come to Australia to study courses they have no particular interest in. They don't care. Mum and daddy's usually paying for them and they pay up front. Isn't that convenient for our universities? Those students know that is a pathway to permanent residency, residency as well and eventually citizenship. When's it all this going to stop? That is the great unspoken truth of our current university business model, and it is absolutely disgraceful. You are shameful, and that is where we are at. Now, I'm not saying that international students shouldn't come to study here, but things need to change. Now, before our academics and students are forced into invisible gags, although I'd say they're pretty much there, they can't be afraid to speak the truth in case they'll upset the Chinese Communist Party and end the rivers of gold. That's where we're at. Everyone can see that we have a problem. It's getting worse and worse every day, and yet neither, neither of you major parties, neither of you major parties has the courage to do anything about it. Now, you're just a shameful. Six times, six times the major parties have voted against Senator Patrick's motion to do a send inquiry on our economic reliance on China. Six times. Yet you sit here and you talk tough on China. You're kidding, right? You're kidding. You're not interested in dealing. You, you don't want to deal with this problem. You don't want to go there. You might upset them. God forbid. What's going to happen? What do you think is going? To, what's going to happen if you upset them? What's going to happen? Well, you'll have to become more self reliant in our own country. We'll have to start manufacturing again and and doing other things. Who needs who? That's what you need to work out. Who needs who? But by continually rolling over like a dog and not standing up and doing it the Australian way. We're going nowhere and the situation will continue to get worse. You might as well just roll over and say, come on in, take over, because that's where you're just about at. We're just about there. Because I can tell you now, right now, there's a wrecking ball heading our way. So right now where you say, nothing to see here when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, nothing to see here, you have got to be absolutely delusional. If you don't have the guts and courage to stand up as, a part, as your major parties, then maybe you shouldn't be in politics. If you're not putting your country, your kids and our own Aussie students first, then you shouldn't be in this place. You should not be in this place. So hopefully, when we put, this, when we put the motion back up again, hopefully you might actually come to your common senses and say, you know what, it's not in the best interest of this country not to examine the Chinese Communist Party and put them under the microscope. Because I want to see some courage coming out of here. I want to see some leadership. And so do our kids of the future. It'll make them more resilient. It'll make them ready for anything that's put in front of them. But right now, the leadership from both these parties when it comes to dealing with the Chinese Communist Party is not the way to do things. Senator Stoker. Adam Acting Deputy President. These are interesting and troubling times. Many Australians are fearful of COVID-19 and what it might do to their health 
or the health of someone they love who is either older or immunocompromised. It means that measures like border closures have been at least superficially very popular if we go by the polls. But there's a real problem with allowing mere popularity to drive policy because, as New Zealand, for instance, has shown us, mere hard border closures are not a long-term effective solution. Sure, while the hard lockdown is on, it might reduce numbers a bit, but it cripples the economy without providing a long-term strategy for living with this virus because that's what we have to learn to do. We can't eradicate it. That's not realistic. But what we need is a serious plan for living with it. So while the Queensland Premier has ramped up border closures, chasing base political advantage around two months out from an election, she knows in her heart that it's just a matter of time before this strategy falls apart. No doubt she'll time that for the day after the election. But the medical advice on how we need to learn to live with this virus is absolutely clear. There are three measures. High testing rates, quality tracing, and outbreak outbreak containment where those outbreaks occur. It's uncontroversial medical advice and it's borne out by all of those jurisdictions that are managing the virus well. Nowhere does the medical advice say that we should declare places without COVID cases like the ACT to be hotspots for exclusion or inflexibly close borders to deny proper medical care to people in border communities. Nowhere. And the very inflexibility of Queensland Labor merely compounds the problem. Here's an example that LNP leader Deb Frecklington has been fighting hard for. Ms Jane Brown, a woman of Caloundra, recently underwent major brain surgery in Sydney under the care of Professor Charles Teo. She requested an exemption with the support of her doctor from hotel quarantine to instead quarantine in her home given that she was recovering from major brain surgery and in fragile health. She and her partner had a home COVID safe health plan. But no, footballers and their coaches get exceptions, celebrities get exceptions, but not truly vulnerable Queenslanders. Here's another example. A Ballina mother pregnant with twins needing urgent medical care wasn't granted permission to cross the border to get that care. Instead, she was sent on a 16-hour journey to Sydney. It's just not on. That's especially so when Australian taxpayers as a whole overwhelmingly fund health care. It's not true to say that Queensland hospitals are for the use of Queenslanders only. In fact, to only allow Queenslanders to use them, even in critical cases like these, is nothing short of ugly. It's not the Queensland spirit at all. A Lismore mother was not allowed to accompany her newborn to Brisbane for urgent medical care. For four anxious days, she paced, waiting for her baby to be returned. With a newborn baby, even an hour apart can feel like torture. Could you imagine four days while your child is sick? And I could keep rattling off case after case of this kind of barbarism. But the inflexibility is harming Queensland's businesses too. I went to bat recently for a Queensland farming business that also has operations and staff in New South Wales. Their highly skilled staff operate in both states. They're not easily replaced. Yet when they sought an exemption for their workers to go to their North Queensland farm, they didn't even get the courtesy of a no. They couldn't get a decision at all, not even a return phone call from the decision maker's office. The date of the application had well passed before they even got a response, and only then once their federal representatives had been called in. At last, on Monday, there was finally some change in the policy. But it remains the case that the kinds of decisions that take, for instance, the WA government 24 hours, take Queensland Labor over two weeks. I had a South East Queensland film company tell me their terrible experience of comparing dealing with the Western Australian government and its border closures with the inflexibility and chaos of how Queensland Labor has approached it. And the reality is 
is that it just means the business goes elsewhere. Queenslanders pay for it. They mightn't feel it today because of the assistance that's being implemented by the federal government. But make no mistake, it is killing our businesses. It is driving mental health to the edge and it is taking a brutal toll on already vulnerable Queenslanders who are either needing compassionate exemptions or the economic lifeline of a job. An open economy within our national borders and a mobile population able to take advantage of markets and services is what has underwritten Australia's prosperity. And sure, we have to make some adjustments for the difficulties of managing the virus. But at least let it be driven by the medical evidence. At least let those who know how to manage a virus's advice be taken into account. The hypocrisy that those opposite feign for the mental health of individuals, for low-income people, for our vulnerable people, is nauseating in circumstances where those same people champion border closures that are fundamental in driving poor mental health and personal hardship. Queensland's health response is built on a lie. It's built on the lie that we can eliminate the virus from Queensland. A quest that might earn short-term political support because it has the illusion of offering the comfort everybody needs, the comfort that everybody wants in a complex world. But it can't be achieved. It isn't based on the advice of people with the expertise to understand how viruses like these operate. And it's based on a lie that was I think articulated quite well by Jennifer Westacott from the Business Council of Australia recently, where those opposite treat anything above zero as a serious policy failure. Now, you can guarantee that that's going to get you an unbalanced policy response. Because if we're only looking at the harm that is done in one sector and counting any numbers above zero, as a serious failure while closing our eyes to the harm done in other spheres without closing sorry without paying attention to the harm to mental health to the the suicides that are going on because of this hardship the hardship that's happening because businesses are closing because people can't plan out their economic future because people cannot cope with the economic impact of these draconian measures gosh it might be short-term populist politics, but it guarantees a flawed economic recovery. And it turns Australia into a fragmented place instead of banding together to confront one of the biggest policy challenges of our lifetime. And let's not forget this. While Queensland and the states more generally might bear primary responsibility for the health response, the economic responsibility is sheeted home to the federal government. The incentives are in all the wrong place. It means that we have a Queensland Labor government acting with reckless abandon for our economy, with reckless abandon, a lack of balance in the way that we need to confront this challenge because the economic questions, oh, they can just blame somebody else. Well, Australians deserve better. And you know what? Queenslanders are smarter than Premier Palaszczuk gives them credit for. Queenslanders can see through this shallow populist strategy and they understand that there's more to this. They understand that they should listen to the experts and they are being fought for relentlessly by the LNP state team, by Deb Frecklington and Tim Mander, who will relentlessly fight for the kind of mature, measured policy that will get us through this difficult time. Senator Green. Thank you. I want to begin by updating the Senate on a matter I raised yesterday on the Qantas job cuts, 
which will mean 30 Jetstar jobs will be lost in Cairns and a further 105 jobs will be affected. Uh, that's because 45 Qantas ground crew jobs are now under review and 60 aircraft staff will be transferred to Victoria. My thoughts are with those workers and their families who now face an uncertain time. But can I just say this? It is deeply disappointing that Qantas, an airline born in outback Queensland, is pulling jobs out of regional Queensland. It is a kick in the guts for Cairns. Qantas have received and continue to receive an enormous amount of taxpayer funding, and it is unacceptable that the Morrison government hasn't required conditions on that funding that prioritise keeping jobs in places like Cairns. Labor has been calling on the Morrison government to deliver a national aviation plan to protect these jobs, but they haven't listened. What regional Queenslanders need right now from the Morrison government is a jobs plan so they can have some certainty about what will happen when support is taken away. But instead of a jobs plan, instead of actual funding, there's just announcements and no delivery. You know, you always have to check the fine print with this government. You always have to check the fine print and you always have to check the delivery because that is where they let Queenslanders down. When it comes to NAIF, it's been five years since the $5 billion fund was announced and only $1.7 million Order. has been relieved in Queensland. Order. In far north Queensland, where the NAIF HQ is based, where they have a very nice corporate office, not a single cent of NAIF funding has been released. And when it comes to infrastructure, the Prime Minister said that he would fast track 15 projects across the country. But only one of those projects is in Queensland, and not a single project is north of Brisbane. That inland rail project, which, granted, takes up uh, for the majority is in New South Wales and Victoria, won't start construction in Queensland until 2023 or 2020, uh, 2022 or 2023. The officials weren't quite clear about the details of when, of when the one single project will begin. And despite announcements today about bringing defence upgrades forward, upgrades to HMAS Cairns, which had previously been announced, won't actually start construction until 2022. But it has to be the delivery of Indigenous housing that has been the biggest failure of this government in Queensland. Because during the final days of 2019 federal election, the Morrison government the member for Leichhardt, Warren Ench, promised a re-elected Morrison government would directly deliver $105 million in funding to remote far north communities to build social housing. We are now 15 months on from that announcement, and the LNP have only delivered 4.7 per cent of that funding. What is clear during COVID is that housing is necessary. It is a basic human right and it keeps people safe. I visited uh, Arakoon and Wujibuju uh, in the last couple of weeks, and I was shocked to find out that people in those communities are living in houses with 30 to 40 people in those homes. 30 to 40 people, and sometimes more than that, in a three-bedroom house in Australia, in a place that was promised funding from the Morrison government. And this is a one-off payment. It is not reoccurring funding. The federal government has responsibility to deliver this funding, but they've passed the buck and they haven't delivered. And that is absolutely disgraceful at a time during a pandemic when we know that overcrowding in houses will lead to a health risk to First Nations people. The Morrison government give as many pats on the back that it likes, but right now, under this government, there are first Australians who have been promised safe and secure housing 15 months ago and are still living in conditions that are putting their health at risk, and that is not good enough. And the other reason that this funding is so important is because of the extreme health risk that COVID relates to people living in those communities. The previous speaker, a senator from Queensland, said that the Palaszczuk government had uh, 
had been reckless abandonment when it came to protecting Queenslanders. This is high stakes because the government, the federal government, has failed to deliver housing funding to remote communities, which means that if there was a COVID outbreak in those communities, it Order. would be devastating. Senator Green, um, I will allow Senator, give senators a moment, um, showing courtesy to colleagues, to take their seats before we go to first question. I'm just seeing if we have anyone coming online for a moment before I allow senators to take their seat. Ah. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In July, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, said that the sudden withdrawal of aged care workers during a COVID-19 outbreak couldn't be anticipated or foreshadowed. Why did the Morrison government fail to implement the aged care workforce strategy promised by former Minister Fifield six years ago? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator Ciccone, for his question from um, Victoria online. Uh, Mr President, the, the government is actually in the process of implementing the workforce strategy that was uh, uh, developed uh, by the work of Professor Pelez. And, uh, in, in, in May last year, uh, Mr. President, uh, we uh, funded and established, or industries funded and uh, established, the Workforce Industry Council. That is industry led, which is quite appropriate, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, we continue to implement other reforms out of the work of uh, the Pelaire's report. Uh, that includes uh, the, the research institution that uh, Professor Pelaire's uh, recommended. Uh, the Workforce Industry Council appointed their first CEO in June this year. So, Mr. President, we continue to uh, apply the work of that was recommended by Professor Pelez, and, and I've had a number of conversations with him recently about that process and how we, uh, and in fact how we might um, how we might speed up the process because that's a concern that both he and I share, Mr. President. Uh, and so we can, we continue to not only consult and work with the sector with respect to the implementation of the Pelez report, but I continue to consult with, Prof with Professor Pelez. Uh, he put considerable work into that report, uh, and uh, we have had discussions only in recent times with respect to the process that we, that we may be able to speed up the work that was recommended by him, uh, given that uh, industry, Mr President, uh, quite rightly leads the Workforce Industry Council as they are the employers and trainers of their workforce. Uh, but there is some work that we, I think we can do together to increase the pace Order, of that work. Senator Colbeck. Order. I'm going to ask senators to remain silent because it can be occasionally difficult to hear people remotely. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. In 2018, the chair of the Aged Care Workforce Strategy Task Force, Professor Pelez, said about the government's handling of aged care, and I quote, they have known about these issues. There's plenty of reports that they have told them, but they have ducked it. The government has made no progress. They've sat on the report. Why has and has this government, the Morrison government, ignored the warnings of its own task force? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, I would not accept the premise of the question. I've clearly exchanged. I've clearly just Order. explained, uh, Mr. President. Order. I've clearly just explained the fact that we haven't ignored the work of Professor P P Pelaire's report. I've explained Order. the fact that we have, uh, following his report. Uh, with, with industry established the Workforce Industry Council. That was established by the sector in May last year. They appointed their first CEO in June this year, uh, so, and they continue to build their, their workforce plans. That is their role. Uh, that is their responsibility. And we have funded their work, Mr President, which is what the report recommended. So, Mr President, uh, I reject the premise of the question that we have not acted on the report of uh, Professor Pelaez. We continue to do that. Order. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. 
The Aged Care Royal Commission's interim report handed down in October of last year, titled Neglect, revealed significant understaffing across the sector. Brendan from Victoria said his 94-year-old mother, who was removed from a room after testing positive for COVID-19, was found not to have had been showered for four days due to staffing shortages. Why did the Morrison government ignore the Royal Commission's warning? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the Royal Commission in its interim report last year made a number of suggestions to the government, which we immediately took up. Uh, it talked to us about an additional investment Order. into uh, it, it talked to us about an additional investment into home care places. It talked to us about getting young people out of residential aged care. It talked to us about uh, a range of things that we have acted on and we acted on immediately, Mr. President. Mr. President, during the circumstance, and I, I'm not sure which facility Senator Chacon is talking about, uh, there were some circumstances which the government has said uh, we wished Order. hadn't occurred. We, we have had knowledge that in some circumstances uh, some residents didn't get the care that they received in, in the events that occurred in Victoria, particularly in about four facilities that weren't quite critical at the time. Order. So, Mr President, uh, we have acknowledged uh, and, and apologised for those Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan. Order. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Defence, uh, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the economic recovery measures announced by Defence today and how they are contributing to the Morrison government's COVID-19 recovery efforts? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I also thank Senator Molan, not only for his service but for his continuing support to our forces. Thank you. Uh, this morning, the Prime Minister and I had the great delight of announcing a $1 billion package to support Australia's economic recovery from COVID-19. This package of 22 discrete projects will support around 4,000 Australian jobs right around our nation, while complementing Defence's 2024 structure plan. Firstly, we are accelerating uh, existing capability projects and programs. This $200 million investment will support 445 Australian jobs. Secondly, we are delivering a national estate works program right across Australia, including in bushfire-affected areas. This $490 million investment will support 2,950 Australian jobs. Thirdly, we are enhancing sustainment for existing capabilities. This $200 million investment will support 440 Australian jobs. Fourthly, we are also boosting funding for defence industry grants and defence innovation hubs to support businesses, particularly small and medium businesses, to strengthen our skilled defence industry workforce. This $110 million investment will support 150 Australian jobs. I am so proud and are pleased to report that Australia's defence industry here in Australia has demonstrated remarkable resilience and versatility during this pandemic. We have worked very hard to keep defence capabilities and our Australian economy moving. I commend the Defence Force and also the Defence Department for so quickly adapting to new business as usual ways during COVID-19. And I'm so proud of the work that we are doing together to ensure the business of defending our nation continues both here and overseas. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the support provided to local businesses as part of these measures, including the capital region and surrounding areas? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Molan for his question. Uh, today, the Prime Minister and I made the announcement at Datapod, a Canberra-based company Order. that's been selected to deliver additional deployable data centres to support defence operations. Datapod is a 100 per cent Australian-owned and operated company. This decision will provide job security for Datapod's highly skilled workforce and over 80 manufacturing subcontractors. Datapod is a great Australian success story. It has adapted its business from mining now to defence and to other industries, both here and overseas. Datapod is providing opportunities for some of our most talented young STEM students and postgraduate workers, who I had the great pleasure of meeting here today. 
We will also deliver infrastructure and capability projects, Senator Molan, through you, President, uh, right across Australia, including in Jarvis Bay, Eden, Raff Wagga, and also at Kapuka. Order, Senator Reynolds. Fantastic. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the, can the minister advise, please, how these measures are supporting the income of ADF reservists during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and Senator Molan. Can I just say again, I am incredibly proud of our reserve forces who have made such an important contribution to our nation's defence. They have served with great honour both on operations overseas and increasingly now on domestic support operations, such as Operation Bushfire Assist and now Operation COVID-19 Assist. Over 3,500 ADF members are supporting all states and territories, and that includes 800 of our Defence Force Reserves. To support these Defence Force Reserves, who are now doing it tough during COVID-19, we're increasing the annual reserve days to, by 210,000 this financial year alone, and we are providing support to recruit an additional 500 Defence Reserves. The Morrison government is backing ADF reserves who have lost their primary form of civilian income. And today's measures will ensure we are best placed Order. to meet Senator the high Reynolds, risk weather season. The answer has expired. Senator Carr. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Aged Care and Seniors Australian, Senator Colbert. The Morrison government was warned of the risks to the aged care workforce in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak. Yet within three days, of the first COVID-19 case being detected at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge on the 3rd of March, all permanent carers were forced into isolation. Why did the Morrison government ignore this warning? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Well, Mr. President, I reject the premise of the question from Senator Carr. Mr. 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 President, uh, in, in fact, uh, we, we acted very, very quickly to ensure that there was capacity to provide surge workforce to the aged care sector in Australia, Mr. President. And in fact, I think the announcement of our funding was on about the 11th of March, was only a few days after the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak started. So we acted very, very quickly uh, and put over $100 million on the table to support the aged care sector with surge, surge workforce. So, Mr. President, I reject completely the assertion of the question from uh, Senator Carr, because uh, w we acted extremely quickly to ensure that there was capacity available, uh, and we have continued to build and grow that capacity as the scale of the outbreak has continued, particularly in Victoria, Mr. President. So, all through this process, we started engaging with the aged care sector back in January. We talked to them about their re re responsibilities with respect to having an infection control plan. We talked to them about uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, during February. Mr President, we continue to work with this sector and have been there uh, consistently with them all through this pandemic, providing them resources, ensuring they had information, providing advice from the AHPPC, Order. acting on the advice of the AHPPC Mr. President, in, in our response to the pandemic and ensuring that they had information resources available to them to be able to meet the requirements of an infection if in fact it occurred within their facility mr president and it is worth noting that we as we said yesterday 97 percent of facilities in this country haven't had an outbreak uh, which i think is uh, an incredibly good statistic for this country senator carr a supplementary thank question. you mr president within a week of the first covid 19 case being detected at the new march house on the 11th of april 87 per cent of its staff were forced into isolation. Why did the Morrison government also ignore this warning? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, Mr. President uh, not only did we not ignore it, and so I again reject the premise of Senator Carr's question, who just, just completely reject the premise of Senator Carr's question. We continue to build our workforce capacity uh, through uh, the pandemic. We continue to provide additional resources, uh, and we continue to do that, Mr. President. In fact, uh, we, are, we, are, we are working with other sectors to train staff to build on workforce capacity. Uh, one of the reasons that we uh, built the, the, the arrangement with the Victorian government to close 
Uh, elective surgery was to provide additional capacity in the workforce, but also beds within hospitals to relieve the stress on aged care facilities, Mr. President. We, and, and in fact, the hospital agreement, which was part of the national COVID-19 health plan, which predates all of these circumstances, uh, were put in place to ensure that we had the capacity to meet the Order, needs of Senator older Australians. Colbeck. Senator Carr, final supplementary question. Elizabeth from Victoria said hospital doctors found her mother also had a secondary chest infection and a UTI in addition to COVID-19. She had been left in soil nappies for hours on many occasions and for the whole day. How many more of the 1,100 older Australians with COVID-19 in aged care that were dehydrated, soiled and showing signs of neglect as a result of the Morrison Order, government Carr, ignoring these the warnings. Has expired. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I have said on a number of occasions, uh, the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, in a number of facilities, uh, the circumstances were not as we would have wanted. The, they were not as we would have wanted. And, the, and residents because Order. of the circumstances Order. that occurred did not get the care that we received. We've acknowledged that, Mr President, and we've apologised for Order on my left. But what we have done, Mr President, is we've co continued to build capacity to ensure that the facilities are well staffed, that they are providing the appropriate level of care, uh, and, we have, and, and we will continue to do that, Mr President. Fortunately, what we're seeing now in Victoria is that with the reduction in community transmission, there is also a reduction in the infection rate within aged care facilities, which is relieving pressure. And we are now seeing a reduction in the number of active cases in Victoria, both in staff and aged care residents. Order, Mr. President. So there is a direct Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister advise the Senate of what the Morrison government is doing to diversify and expand opportunities for Australian exporters and um, Australian businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Stoker for, uh, for her question and her advocacy for Australian exporters and, uh, and businesses, particularly those from Queensland. Mr. President, without ever compromising on Australia's values or interests, our government works continuously uh, to expand opportunities for our exporters right around our region and the world. Most notably, uh, during the recent parliamentary recess, we welcomed entry into force of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement on 5 July, which will allow over 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to Indonesia by value to enter duty-free or under significantly improved preferential arrangements compared to their counterparts. And Mr President, I am very pleased to advise the Senate that many Australian businesses and exporters are already taking advantage of the opportunities provided by our trade deal with Indonesia. Some 37 semi-trailer loads of duty-free oranges this year have already been shipped to Indonesia. Some 510 tonnes of duty-free lemon and lime exports have already been shipped. Some 963 tonnes of mandarins have already been shipped. Close to 46,000 head of cattle have already been shipped duty-free to Indonesia. We equally see, Mr President, huge opportunities for our grain growers. Ultimately, we will see next year more than 500,000 tonnes of grain able to enter Indonesia duty-free, growing year on year thereafter. Frozen beef and sheep meat tariffs have halved already, uh, and we see duty-free steel making its way to Indonesia as well, close to 5,000 tonnes already by Australian business. This, in addition to the services opportunities created, and to the enhancement of regional opportunities that we will put in place through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement show just how strongly we are working to help Australian business diversify their Order, trade Senator across Birmingham. our region. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for explaining those opportunities within our region. Can the Minister also advise the Senate of the measures being implemented to diversify and expand the opportunities for our exporters beyond our region? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Stoker. Indeed, beyond our region, our government continues to pursue and negotiate the opportunities for enhanced trade with the European Union and the United Kingdom. And together, there are more than 500 million consumers across those markets, consumers where we see high restrictions, high tariffs and limited and small quotas for many of our particularly agricultural exports. Wine Australia estimates that EU tariffs add up to 25 per cent on the import price of Australian wines into that market. Our beef and sheep meat exporters face small quotas but high tariffs, a significant imposition into those markets. Securing better, fairer access is the goal of our free trade agreements with both the EU and the UK. And I'm pleased to say that we have entered through virtual rounds of negotiations, through the eighth round of negotiations with the EU and two rounds now with the United Kingdom, continuing to make good progress on those and determined to provide further opportunities for Order our farmers Senator and exporters. Birmingham. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what practical steps are being taken to help Australian exporters take advantage of Australia's free trade agreements and help us grow a COVID-safe economy? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, opening access uh, and reducing barriers through trade agreements is one thing. We then need to provide advice and assistance to Australian businesses to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And yesterday I was pleased to launch the Indonesia-Australia Business Connect program, a three-month digital program of market webinars led by Austrade uh, to provide business with an Indonesia market entry guide, particularly for our food and beverage exporters. Uh, a program of webinars unpacking market access arrangements, especially for horticulture, meat, livestock and grain producers, online education, training and skills events. And this is uh, sitting alongside a 12-part free digital FTA seminar series that our government is providing. So far, almost 4,000 people have watched these free seminars, but importantly, they are part of the very significant growth in the number of Australian businesses we see exporting. And we've managed to see growth of more than 18 per cent of Australian businesses exporting in our term in office, Order, and we want Birmingham. to continue Time to help more businesses to do expired. so. Senator Griff. Hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Since 20 March, the federal government has paid an additional $1 billion to the sector to manage the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to provide care for senior Australians in care. What transparency requirements did the government place on the aged care sector to ensure how the additional $1 billion was spent? And is the minister confident that all of the federal funds provided were spent as intended by the Morrison government? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And uh, the $1 billion that we've made available to the aged care sector to manage the COVID-19 outbreak is not all just paid to the aged care sector. There are a range of programs that provide varying levels of different levels of support under different programs, uh, whether that be to pay for surge workforce, for example, uh, whether that be to support the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, whether that be to support mental health, uh, or whether that be uh, an uplift to provide capacity for the sector to deal with additional costs that they're facing with COVID-19. Uh, so one measure, in, in fact, in that sense was $205 million, which was a general uplift we provided to the sector, and we will be seeking a reconciliation of that amount. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, we are looking to have a sense of what's occurred with the funding that um, we provide into the sector because we, we think it's appropriate. Uh, the other measures, such as those that support a facility that might have had a COVID outbreak, uh, those funds will be re uh, repatriated to the facilities based on uh, an accounting and paid in arrears. So, Mr. President, there will be a clear uh, understanding of what that funding was used for uh, and, and the capacity for us to reconcile that against the accounts and the expenses that a facility may have occurred in, uh, in managing a particular outbreak. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. With reference, uh, Minister, to the $205 million that you referred to, which was paid on the, or announced on May the 1st. This was given to providers to cover the cost for additional staffing, training, visitations and connections and the provision of PPE during the pandemic. $900 was paid per resident in major metro areas and $1,350 in other areas. Can the minister advise how many additional staff were employed, how many additional training was undertaken and how much additional PPE was purchased per aged care facility? Senator Colbeck. 
Mr. Pre thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, Mr. President, we, don't, we have not uh, received those reconciliations at this point in time. That money was put out uh, through our uh, usual funding processes to ensure that the facilities had the capacity to meet those costs, uh, Mr. President, and we uh, believe that it was important that we provided that. We understood that the costs were higher in regional Australia than they were in uh, metro areas. That's why we made that important distinction. Uh, but we have not received those reconciliations at this point in time, Mr. President. Uh, uh, so I am not able to give the chamber any advice on that. Senator Griff, final supplementary uh, Minister, question. will you take on notice the uh, request on the previous um, question to actually provide that reconciliation? And do you concede that in order to restore trust with Australians, the government must implement financial transparency rules for the aged care sector to properly account for the billions in federal funds providers receive annually? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, I, I actually agree with the senator that um, financial accountability is a very, very important element of uh, where we go with the aged care sector post the Royal Commission and, and how we respond to the Royal Commission. Uh, in fact, that's one of the conversations that we've been having in our uh, policy development work towards the response to the Royal Commission. I think it's a very important issue. Uh, and transparency and quality indicators as well, which is, I know, something that else that you have uh, an interest in, Mr. President. So, uh, providing some visibility into the quality indicators that uh, uh, apply to the residential aged care sector and the home care sector, I might add, uh, are important. Uh, and we also do have some reporting publicly in respect of home care on the uh, My Aged Care website. So I th my view is that, uh, A, yes, it's important. Order. Senator and Wong on a point of order. Sorry, Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, point of order. I, I, and I, I apologise to Senator Griff for taking a point of order of his question, but the minister was asked to take on notice and come back to the chamber the question he couldn't answer. He hasn't responded to that in this answer as a matter of direct relevance. I'd ask him to do the chamber the courtesy of responding to that request. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <laughs> Minister Colbeck could not have been more directly relevant if he tried. He could order. not have been more directly relevant if he tried. Order on my like, left. You know, it's, and, and, and I think order on my the, left. Senator in terms Wong. of courtesies to the chamber, it would indeed be courteous to Senator Griff if he was uh, allowed to uh, pursue uh, his own questions. Uh, it, it, the minister can respond to an answer any way he sees fit as long as he is directly relevant. Um, I, I believe he was being directly relevant to the answer. Order on my left. Senator Cormann. Interjections are always disorderly. They are. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Wong. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I will note that the Royal Commission is looking at those financial disclosure issues, and so we will consider Order. that. Um, and, Mr. I'm President, afraid, I will I'm, take on notice. Time for the answer has concluded. There is therefore no option to have a point of order. Um, but once the answer concludes, uh, that was at one second. Um, once the answer has concluded, there is no point of order on the relevance of the question, unless Senator Griff wanted to ask, ask, uh, raise another point of order. I will then move to Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, how is the Morrison government supporting our skills system through the COVID-19 pandemic and putting in place the reforms for a better skills system on the other side? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic for the question. And I will take that interjection from Senator Ayres. Senator Ayres, it is a fact that the federal government does not fund TAFE. Uh, so every time someone on the Labor side opens their mouth and says the federal government has cut TAFE, you are actually wrong. You may want to speak to your own state government because they are responsible. Order but, on Mr. My President, left. this week is actually the tenth National Skills Week. And it is a week in which we celebrate uh, vocational education and training within Australia. And certainly, as Australia recovers from the economic effects of COVID-19, a skilled workforce has never been more important. And that is why the Morrison government has made such a large investment in making our skills system more responsive to the labour market demands of this country and more attractive to potential students uh, from all walks of life. Mr. President. 
As part of our economic response to COVID-19, uh, we have committed $2.8 billion across 2019, 2020 and 2021 to support small and medium businesses across Australia to retain their apprentices. And that is, of course, through our supporting apprentices and trainees measure. Mr. President, this subsidy will support around 90,000 businesses across Australia, employing around 180,000 apprentices. It will ensure that they are uh, in, make it allowed to continue on their jobs despite COVID-19. And in fact, since we launched this subsidy on the 2nd of April, as at the 13th of August, this measure has already supported. 87,570 apprentices across 50,260 employers, and it has resulted in $462 million in payments that have been paid out to employers so that they can keep on their apprentices and trainees. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, how will the government's job trainer fund support Australians to get skills in the area of demand and drive further reform of Australia's vocational education and training system? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, um, I've referred to the $2.8 billion that the government has committed to support apprentices and trainees uh, as a result of the impact of COVID-19. But we have also now partnered uh, with states and territories around Australia to establish a $1 billion job trainer fund. Mr. President, the Commonwealth has committed half a billion dollars uh, towards this fund, and I'm very pleased to say that all states and territories uh, have signed up and have agreed to commit the matched funding. This will now deliver an additional 340,700 places, training places across Australia. Those training places will be free or low cost. Um, they'll also be in identified areas of skills needs in individual states and territories. All states and territories have also uh, signed our heads of agreement for skills reform. We're working across Australia with our state and territory uh, counterparts to make positive Order, reform Senator to Cash. the skills Senator agenda. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's job maker plan support labour force recovery and build on the coalition's strong record of economic management and job creation? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, in terms of the investment in job trainer, in terms of the investment that we've made in ensuring that employers across Australia are able to keep on their apprentices and trainees, this obviously is all part of our broader job maker plan. Mr. President, the job maker plan is the Morrison government's plan for economic recovery as a result of COVID-19. And of course, at the heart of this plan is job Order creation, on my left. ensuring that Order. employers across Australia are Senator able Keneally. to stay in business, keep their doors Senator open, uh, and to the extent possible, prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And as part of that job maker plan, undertaking skills reform Order is an integral left. part of it. We need to ensure that we have a training system in place that responds to what industry and employers are telling us they need. We need to have a training system that ensures that the people going through it are job ready at the end of it. Order. And that is Senator what we are Cash, committed time to. For the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. My question is to Senator Cormann representing the Prime Minister. Senator, do actions speak louder than words? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yes. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Back, back in June, the Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian. He promised a COVID support package for the arts. Yet nothing has flowed. Order on my right. Nice words, no action. Why? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely disagree with the premise of the question. Uh, we have provided substantial support to the arts sector, and of course, large parts of the uh, arts sector and the entertainment sector, of course, uh, are receiving substantial support through JobKeeper. Uh, there was also an announcement in relation to a package to uh, help maximise the recovery uh, in what is an important sector in our economy, and of course, that is being implemented as planned. Senator Order, Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Two weeks ago, the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department told the Senate Committee that the money promised by the Prime Minister would not flow until restrictions were lifted. No money has been spent. 
Nice words, no action. What are you doing? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I again reject the premise of the question, and I refer you to my answer to your first supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General and relates to interlocutory matters and matters incidental to the proceedings of the Commonwealth versus Kaliri. During the proceedings, Mr. Kaliri has subpoenaed documents from the oil and gas producer Woodside. In response, the Attorney General sought first access to Woodside's return uh, to subpoena on the basis their documents could contain matters related to national security. How is it possible that an energy company such as Woodside could be in possession of documents that could contain matters related to national security? Or is this simply the attorney further abusing the NSI Act? The Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for some advance, uh, advice of his uh, question. Uh, Mr. President, while I obviously cannot and will not disclose national security uh, information, what I can say in response to Senator Patrick's question uh, is that the, uh, the NSI Act provides a framework for how national security information is disclosed and protected in legal proceedings. It seeks to balance the need to protect national security information with the principle of open justice. Uh, importantly, what protections are put in place are ultimately a matter for the court. With respect to the senator's specific question, I can advise that the Commonwealth made an application to the court seeking early access to any documents produced by Woodside Petroleum in response to the subpoena dated 2 March 2020. The subpoena called for Woodside to produce documents relating to its dealing with the Commonwealth in relation to negotiations between Australia and Timor-Leste in respect of revenue sharing arrangements under the CMATS Treaty. Given the nature of the information sought by the subpoena, documents produced by Woodside might have included national security information, the definition of which can include international relations, which in turn includes economic relations with foreign governments. It was appropriate for the Attorney-General to have an opportunity to consider whether to issue a certificate under the Act or whether any other form or application of application or claim ought to be made in relation to any documents produced by Woodside. Mr President, this was a precautionary approach. It's not uncommon where documents might reveal interaction with the Commonwealth. The application was allowed by the court. Ultimately, Mr. President, I would note to the Chamber and to Senator Patrick that the Commonwealth did not seek any protection orders and the documents were provided to the parties. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you for that answer, uh, Minister. Was the Attorney General's interest in the Woodside documents centred on a concern that they would reveal knowledge of a fraud on Timor Leste in relation to the giveaway of Timor's helium uh, assets? To, the, to Woodside and ConocoPhillips. Senator, thank you, Aye. Mr. President. I absolutely don't accept the premise of Senator Patrick's uh, question, and I refer the senator to my first answer. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr. President. Is the attorney aware of claims that Timor's helium, a highly valuable commodity, was wrongly characterised as waste in the production-sharing contracts? and therefore lost to Timor-Leste, but a nice profit for Woodside. Is that the dirty secret that is being concealed? Senator Payne. Again, Mr President, I absolutely do not accept the premise of the question from Senator Patrick, and I refer him to my first answer. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, my question without notice is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Victorian Liberal MP Russell Broadbent said the government ignored his pleas about the vulnerability of the aged care sector, describing it as, and I quote, disaster waiting to happen. Why did you ignore Mr Broadbent's warning? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator, for her question. Mr President, uh, uh, Mr Broadbent has a perspective on how he believes the aged care sector should be structured. Uh, and uh, I respect his perspective. He talks about the, the changes that were made in the late 90s uh, 
uh, and the opportunity for different forms of providers to come into the aged care sector. Um, Mr. President, I respect uh, um, Mr. Broadbent's perspective on that, but governments since that period of time, since the late 90s, have continued on a path that we see now where we have a range of provider types. We have government providers as uh, through states. We have uh, providers that are community-based. We have for-profit providers and we have not-for-profit providers. Mr. President, that is the current structure of the aged care sector in this country. I will point out the fact, that, Mr. President, that uh, we wanted an in, uh, a forensic inspection of the entire aged care sector, which is why the Prime Minister called a Royal Commission, which is currently underway. We look forward to the recommendations of the Royal Commission with respect to its structure of the sector. Point of order, Senator O'Neill. This question was very specific. It was about Mr Broadbent's claim that it was a disaster waiting to happen. That was a very significant warning. Why did you ignore Mr Broadbent's warning? I, I think with respect to the minister, he, he doesn't have to address a quotation when there's a question like why at the end of it. I think he has done that and he's continuing to be directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, uh, we acknowledge that there were issues with the, the aged care sector in this country, which is why the Prime Minister called the Royal Commission. And issues such as the structure of the sector uh, will be things that the Royal Commission can report on. Uh, we look forward to that report when it's brought down on the 26th of February next year, Mr. President. And, and All I have said, left. Mr. President, and the government has said that we will respond to that report uh, once the commission has uh, completed its work in February next year. We look forward to its report. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Broadbent also said he sounded warnings about the Morrison government's aged care system, but was, and I quote, ignored completely. If a member of the Morrison government's own party was ignored completely, what hope do older Australians who are suffering in the Morrison government's broken aged care system have of being heard by this government? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, I respect the views of my friend and colleague, Mr Broadbent, but given the fact that we have actually called a royal commission to look at the concerns and the issues within the aged care sector, and the opportunity exists for any of Mr Broadbent's concerns to be addressed as a part of that process, which I note have been contributed to by other of my colleagues. Senator Fever Andy Wells has made a submission to the Royal Commission appropriately, uh, Mr President, because she had some concerns that she wanted to raise with the Royal Commission and have them addressed. That opportunity has existed for any Australian to make those sorts of uh, for, make a submission to the Royal Commission. So, Mr. President, uh, I don't concede that the government has ignored or dismissed uh, Mr. Broadbent's concerns, because we are now conducting a Royal Commission to look, ha take a forensic look at the entire aged care sector, provide us with Order. recommendations, so that we can then act to improve the delivery of aged care in this country. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Broadbent was so disgusted that his warnings about the Morrison government's aged care system continued to be ignored, that he resigned from two parliamentary positions in protest. How many of the 335 older Australians who have died might be alive if the Morrison government had not ignored Mr Broadbent's warnings? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate that the opposition seeks to make the correlation that it does with respect to the circumstance of COVID-19 uh, and uh, other discussions that are, that are being undertaken. I, reckon it, I, th I think it's very, very unfortunate that they seek to, take, to make those sorts of correlations. Mr President, uh, I take very seriously the, the, the uh, views that uh, Mr Broadbent has made. And I've just, as I've just said in the first two answers to questions from uh, Senator, I, I believe the government is taking those in, things into account by conducting a royal commission, Mr. President. We are conducting a royal commission, Mr. President. Every single one of the deaths that have occurred in this country as a result of, of COVID-19 are an absolute tragedy. But I don't seek to make the correlations that the Labor Party quite unfortunately tried to do for political purposes. Order. 
Order on my left. Order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on what steps the government is taking in relation to COVID-19 vaccine access in the Pacific and Southeast Asia? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Car Scar for his uh, question and for his, uh, his interest. Uh, the coalition government is determined to ensure that our closest neighbours have access to safe, effective and affordable COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, today we announce that, the, that Australia will contribute $80 million to the Garvey COVAX Facility Advanced Market Commitment, or the AMC. The COVAX facility pulls the purchasing power and risk for participating countries. It's going to help fast-track manufacturing and prepare the largest, most diverse portfolio of potential COVID-19 vaccines under development. Importantly, when vaccines have completed full clinical trials and been assessed as safe and effective by the World Health Organization, they will be made available to eligible countries in our region. And Australia is very proud to work with key partners in support of the AMC's aim of mobilising one billion vaccine doses for developing countries in the acute phase of the pandemic. In making this investment, Australia joins contributors including the United Kingdom, Canada, Italy and Norway. We know that international investment in vaccine manufacturing and procurement is stronger when nations work together. I was very pleased during my recent visit to Washington to discuss Australia's commitment to supporting our region with the Garvey Chair, Dr Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala. This investment builds on our efforts to secure safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines for Australians. We know that our own security and prosperity are closely linked to that of our closest neighbours. When it comes to this pandemic, we are and we will continue to stand together. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Minister, how will support for COVID-19 vaccine access in the Pacific and Southeast Asia support recovery in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, Mr President, uh, we know that early access to vaccines will play a critical role in the economic recovery of our Pacific yeah. family and regional partners. The AMC itself will initially address, as I said, the acute phase of the pandemic, providing doses for up to 20 per cent of countries' populations, and that includes healthcare professionals, vulnerable groups, including, of course, the elderly. The Pacific countries that are eligible support through COVAX AMC include Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu and Kiribati. Eligible countries from Southeast Asia uh, are Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines and Vietnam. As we committed to when we announced our partnerships for recovery to respond to COVID-19, Australia's development assistance is focused on responding to our region's most pressing needs in the recovery from the pandemic. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate on the government's focus on regional health security? Senator Payne. Mr President, Australia's investment in the COVAX AMC builds on our work with neighbours on health security in the Indo-Pacific. And our Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security delivers our health response in the region, particularly relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our contribution to the WHO's Pacific Coronavirus Response Plan is helping Pacific countries to access medical supplies, to receive technical advice in areas such as inf infection prevention and control, uh, and in clinical management. We, of course, know that immunisation saves lives which is why we were also pleased to announce our $300 million contribution to Garvey's broader vaccine initiatives in June. Through all of Australia's international engagements, from the World Health Assembly to Osmin, working across government, we are, de we are work delivering on our commitment to improving health security in our region. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Senator Fioravanti Wells says, and I quote, the failure of the Abbott government and those advising it exacerbated the already deteriorating situation which has now resulted in the failures in the aged care sector of today. Why was the former Shadow Minister for Ageing and a senior New South Wales Liberal, Senator Fioravanti Wells, ignored by the Morrison government? 
The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't believe that uh, Senator Fiorandi Wells has been ignored by the Morrison government. Uh, in, just in the same way that uh, uh, I don't agree with uh, the assertion with respect to Mr. Broadbent, uh, Senator Fiorandi Wells, as I said in an answer to a question earlier, has, uh, has had the opportunity, by virtue of the fact that uh, Prime Minister Morrison called a royal commission into the aged care sector, to make a significant contribution to that royal commission. Uh, and, and, Mr. President, I welcome that. I welcome that. Senator Fiorandi Wells. I know because I interacted with her on a number of occasions when she was the shadow minister. In fact, she did some work with me in aged care facilities in the northwest of Tasmania. Uh, put significant amount of effort into the policy work uh, that she did, Mr. President. So not only do I respect the work that she's done and respect the, the opinion that she has, uh, Mr. President, Senator Fiorandi Wells has had the opportunity through the fact that Prime Minister Morrison called a royal commission to make a contribution to that process uh, and to the determination of this government under Prime Minister Morrison to improve the residential aged care sector in this country, Mr. President. So I, I don't accept the assertion of the question uh, from the minister, uh, and, and I look forward to the report of the Royal Commission, which is due on the 26th of February this year, uh, and, and I look forward to then implementing uh, measures off the back of the Royal Commission report to improve the delivery of aged care in this country. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. Senator Fioraventi Wells also said, and I quote, the coalition failed in their promise to reform aged care and simply opted for a shift that had no demonstrable positive outcome for the well-being of our older Australians. Why was the former Shadow Minister for Ageing and a senior New South Wales Liberal, Senator Fiorventi Wells, ignored by the Morrison government? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Mr President, I would refer you to uh, the, the, good, the good senator to the answer to my first question, but uh, can I say my view, and, and based on my conversations with the Prime Minister about what we will be doing uh, after the Royal Commission makes its final report in, on the 26th of February next year, is that the aged care sector will look very different after we uh, implement our, recommend, uh, our reforms off the back of the Royal Commission. Uh, there is a, a sincere determination to ensure that the sector uh, provides a higher quality of care, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, Order. Th the fact that Prime Minister Morrison very, very early in his prime, minister, prime ministership, called Order on a royal left. commission Order. into aged care is a Senator, clear demonstration of the determination of this government to improve the delivery of aged care in Australia. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Given that even warnings from within the government were ignored, isn't it clear the Morrison government was already failing and neglecting older Australians? in residential aged care even before COVID-19 reached our shores. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, we have acknowledged that there are issues in aged care, and if we did not acknowledge that there were issues in aged care, we would not have called the Royal Commission. As I said, one of the very first, one of the very first uh, actions of Prime Minister Morrison was to call the Royal Commission. And of course, Mr President, even though we have called the Royal Commission, we have continued to implement reforms to the aged care sector while the Royal Commission has continued. We have created the new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, which did not exist until the beginning of last year. We have put in place new aged care quality standards, which started on 1 July in 2019. We have commenced the uh, process of a, of aged care quality indicators and their public reporting. So we have continued to improve the aged care sector. We will continue to do that, particularly off the back of the Royal Commission when it reports on the 26th of February next year. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. How are enhancements to services Australia's digital services assisting Australians through the current pandemic and supporting a COVID safe economy. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much to Senator Davey for her question. 
quite clearly the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic has led to an unprecedented demand for access to government services and particularly Order. for Australians who are required to uh, register for income support payments. Um, the government has responded very quickly and we have surged thousands of extra staff into Services Australia to make sure that they are able to handle the increased demand um, to assist people who find themselves in extremely changed circumstances. I'm pleased to advise the Chamber that since the 24th of August— Order. Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Point of order. Interjections are always disorderly. Sorry, I, and, well, I, 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 I would describe that more as cross-chamber okay. chatter, but that is also disorderly to the extent that ministers can't hear Senator Wong. I was, Senator, S S Senator Wong is literally uh, interjecting during your uh, ruling. One, order. Order. Senator Wong, on the point uh, of order. Uh, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I was responding to Senator McKenzie. I, so, I did you know, not hear. A, a, who was responding yeah. to me? Order. Uh, who was responding to me? And I was asking, why is this bloke a protected species when she had order. to resign? Order, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. That was inappropriate. I grant leaders some latitude. Um, I did not see Senator McKenzie. If that is the case, I may have my, my I may have had my eyesight blocked. Cross chatter, chamber. Cross-chamber chatter is also disorderly, to the extent that it can be heard by other senators, and there are other places in this building to do that. Well spaced, of course. Um, I call, uh, I call um, Senator Rustin to continue. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, uh, but I would like to uh, reiterate Order. what Senator I. Senator Watt, count to ten. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And it's important that uh, the chamber hears that um, on the 24th of August, the government had paid out $8.8 .8 billion in two $750 uh, payments to eligible Australians as part of their economic uh, support payments. In addition to that, an additional $10.5 billion has been paid as part of the coronavirus supplement to Australians Order. who find themselves unemployed. So um, it's really important uh, that we are able to put in place um, assistance to people so that they are able to easily access the financial support that they need. Services Australia has made sure that we also are working in a COVID-safe environment. We've upgraded our, the capacity at MyGov. Uh, previously, 90,000 people could be on the system concurrently. Since our upgrade, 300,000 Australians are able to use it at any one time. We're making sure that claim forms are much simpler so that people are able to get access really quickly. And we've also made it available so that people can, can obtain a customer reference number and identify themselves online to save them having to attend a Services Australia um, physical site. At the height of the pandemic, we also put in an attempt to claim Senator to assist. Order, Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Through you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> what steps has the Liberal and Nationals in government taken to ensure access to government services for all Australians? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, it's absolutely important that anybody who is in a situation where they're required to self-isolate or quarantine uh, are assisted to be able to stay at home to stop the spread of COVID. Um, eligibility for the job seeker payment has been extended uh, and broadened to include access to people who find themselves sick. Uh, possibly with uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, who have to self-isolate or quarantine, or who may be caring for somebody who's in those circumstances. And we've also required that they do not have to provide a medical certificate for that period of time as well. Um, we announced uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago that a pandemic leave disaster payment would be made available to Victorians. And this morning, the Prime Minister has also announced that that is now extended to Tasmanians um, at their request, so that people who are required to isolate or self-quarantine will be able to get access to that two-week temporary payment. More than $9 million has been paid out in Victoria to people, uh, and we're also pleased to announce that people calling Order, up for the Senator first Rustin, time— Order, Senator Rustin. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question? Yes, thank you. How is the government supporting in particular the residents of our rural and regional border communities to access the services they need during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Davey. 
Well, Services Australia have focused um, also in boosting services in rural and regional Australia. And in fact, today I can announce that there is now a mobile service unit that is uh, providing assistance on the ground in Wodonga, on the other side of the river from Albury, um, for people in that area who may require face-to-face -face services. And can I acknowledge the uh, very strong advocacy of Senator McKenzie on behalf of her own community um, that has uh, allowed us to have the information to understand that the demand exists within that community for this mobile service centre. So we are now able to provide face-to-face -face services for people in that community, uh, and people can uh, start attending the service centre as of 8.30 this morning to 4.30 this afternoon uh, and ongoing at the Junction Square in Wodonga. Um, this will ensure that Victorian communities have access in their own location, but this is in addition, in addition to telephone and internet services Order. that are Senator also Ruskin, available. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Yeah. We, we were... Now, can I briefly make a couple of statements, Senators? Firstly, I inform the Senate that I have received a letter from Senator Di Natale resigning his place as a Senator of the State of Victoria, pursuant to the provisions of Section 1 of the Constitution, I have notified the Governor of Victoria of the vacancy in the represent representation of that state caused by the resignation. I tabled the letter and a copy of my letter to the Governor of Victoria. Senators, on another matter, um, I, bring it, I wanted to bring to your attention the Speaker's making a statement in the House about this. I normally don't replicate everything done in the other place, but on this occasion I thought I should. Um, I want to make a statement with respect to the medical advice that I and the Speaker have received about the wearing of masks. In doing so, I wish to correct the record with respect to a claim in The Australian today. The Speaker and I have advised that all of our decisions regarding the operations and restrictions in Parliament House since the beginning of the pandemic have been based on advice received from the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. Last Friday, the advice we received regarding the wearing of masks was communicated to all building occupants and the media. We said in the statement, while recognising that the wearing of masks is not mandatory in the ACT, at the specific request of the Acting Chief Medical Officer and out of an abundance of caution in the public common areas of Australian Parliament House, everyone is recommended to wear a mask at all times. As an additional precaution, the wearing of masks is encouraged in the presence of others, especially where physical distancing is not possible and by those at increased risk of COVID-19. The article today claims, according to a source, the CMO wanted a mandatory memorandum for the sitting fortnight but was overruled by the presiding officers. This is incorrect. To allow this to go uncorrected would be to suggest that the Speaker and I had not followed medical advice. Further, it would suggest our statement to all of you that we have always acted on medical advice was not accurate. To make it clear, we have always followed the advice from the Chief Medical Officer or his office when it comes to measures being adopted in Parliament House. Finally, if advice was received that recommended mandating masks here in Parliament House without that requirement being present in the rest of the ACT, the Speaker and I would present that advice to both chambers. I thank Senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Labor senators. Well, here we go again. Another woeful performance from the utterly out of his depth, incompetent Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. This week has truly been a sad series of days here in the Senate, watching Senator Colbeck flail around and demonstrate day after day why older Australians and their loved ones can have no confidence whatsoever in the man who is overseeing and running our aged care system in this country. Let's be really, really clear. It is the Australian government, the federal government, that is responsible for keeping older Australians safe in aged care. It's not the state governments, it's not the territory governments, it's not local governments. It's the federal government. It's the federal government that regulates aged care. It's the federal government that funds aged care. It's the federal government whose job it is to keep aged care residents safe. And they have grossly failed in that responsibility. The Prime Minister and the series of aged care ministers we have seen in this government have failed to plan for this aged care crisis. They have failed to act when the crisis hit, and they have completely failed to take responsibility 
for the problems that are of their own making. Now, the Prime Minister, as he is wont to do, says that it's not his fault, it's not responsibility, no responsibility here, and that none of these problems could have been anticipated. The only way you could not anticipate what we have seen play out in aged care homes across Victoria is if you had kept your eyes shut, closed your ears and closed your mouth and ignored the warning after warning after warning we have seen in the seven years this government has been in power about the state of the aged care system and the risk that it posed to residents. Now, today in question time, we have only gone to a small number of the warnings that this government have received. We would need weeks and weeks of question times to point out every warning that this government has received. But let's be generous to the government and just focus on a small number of them. Six years ago, this government was handed an aged care workforce strategy by a committee chaired by an expert, Professor Pelez, and that illustrated what needed to be done to make sure that the aged care sector in Australia had the workforce that it needed. But as we went on to see, with every other warning, that strategy was ignored. It was not implemented. And in fact, just recently, Professor Pelez, who conducted that uh, report, says that there has been no progress by this government in implementing it, and in fact that they have just sat on his report. Well, there, this government sitting on that report has put the lives of older Australians at risk. They had the opportunity to get the workforce in place. They had a report which told them what to do, and they couldn't get around to doing it over the next six years. And we are now seeing the result of that. Last year, we saw the Royal Commission interim report handed down, titled Neglect. It doesn't get more obvious than that. I mean, what, what, what exactly did the government need from its Royal Commission to realise how serious the problems in the aged care system were? And again, they failed to act. Then we get to this year, once we see COVID hit, we see all around the world the problems that are happening in the aged care system, but nothing is done here to prepare. In March, it starts impacting on Australian aged care centres, the Dorothy Henderson Lodge. Tragically, lives were lost. All the permanent carers were forced into isolation because COVID got into the aged care home. But still nothing was done. So a month later, in April, we see it again, New March House. 87 per cent of staff go into isolation. Again, older Australians' lives are lost because of the failures to take the precautionary measures needed. And of course, then we get to Victoria, where it's run like wildfire through Victorian aged care homes, and we are now seeing hundreds of older Australians die and over a thousand aged care workers contract COVID themselves. This government has known what needed to be done. It has had warnings repeatedly. It has failed to plan. It has failed you, to Senator act, Watt, and it failed to take responsibility. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And um, the coalition government, uh, and from the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister responsible, Minister Colbeck, uh, and the entire government, uh, has, from day one, taken uh, issues around aged care. Uh, the issues around protection uh, of the community in aged care homes and in other settings uh, we, and treated that with the utmost of seriousness and that is backed by our record, uh, by the amount of investment that we are putting in, by the way that we are responding. Uh, and it would be a lot easier to take seriously uh, the attacks coming from the Labor Party uh, if they didn't resort to the politics of smear uh, against the minister and if they didn't resort to outright lies uh, in order to make their case. Now, uh, the minister, the prime minister, and the government have uh, not only taken this seriously, of course, uh, expressed uh, our sincere condolences to those who have lost loved ones. Uh, but, and we are working to address these issues, and we are continuing to work with other governments. But when we have uh, Senator Watt come in here uh, and engage in the politics of smear, 
Uh, it needs to be seen for what it is. It needs to be seen for what it is. It would be a lot easier to take it seriously if they didn't have to resort to outright lies, as we have seen on a number of occasions, on a number of occasions in this space. If the attack, if the attack was to be taken seriously, if we were to believe that they were actually sincere, well, they wouldn't have to do bald-faced lies in this place and in the other place. We had it in question time again today, where they claim, and they did it in the House uh, today. Senator Seselja, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Polly, just bring, Madam Acting Deputy President, just want to bring to your attention the language that the good senator is using is unparliamentary, and I ask him to withdraw it. Uh, Senator Seselja, whilst you haven't named senators directly, it is, it's close to the wind, so I'd ask you to refrain, if you wouldn't mind. Please continue. Thank you, and I thank you for your guidance. And, and so there have been. The Labor Party has been going in there into the House of Representatives and the Senate and outright lying when it comes to aged care. And, and we can go to the facts, because, because Mr Albanese— uh, Senator Seselja, please resume your seat. Senator Polly. Yes, I just, uh, Madam Acting Deputy. Uh, President, raise with you again the issue mm -hmm. of the assertions of the senator is unacceptable and unparliamentary. I'd ask you to remind him or ask him to withdraw. Thank you. Uh, senator Seselja, you can't actually say people have come into this chamber. So, yes, that's my advice from the clerk. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator uh, so, the Labor Party has been going around the place lying uh, about this issue because. And, and it, it goes to the fact that this is about politics rather than getting to the substance of the issue. The, the substance of the issue is something this government takes uh, seriously and treats with the utmost seriousness. But when you have to come in and claim that we have cut funding, when you have to claim that we have cut funding, when we inherited a spend in aged care of $13 billion, a tick over $13 billion annually from the Labor Party. That has gone up to $22 billion and, in the forward estimates, will go to $25 billion. Wow. So when the Labor Party comes in here and pretends uh, that they are serious about the issue, that they are serious about accountability, well, let's go to the fact that they don't want to actually speak to the facts, that they want to actually make up their own numbers, false numbers, fake numbers. And that's what we've heard from Mr Albanese uh, in the other place, and that's what we've consistently heard from, from senior Labor. Well, we've got the budget papers where it goes, where it goes from $13 billion when we came to government to $22 billion. Uh, we are taking this issue seriously and we'll continue to take this issue seriously. But when, when you see this kind of smear from Senator Watt, and when you see this kind of dishonesty from other members of the Labor Party, well, it goes to the other fact. And that is that they are running a protection racket for the Victorian government, for the Victorian Labor government. You know, at no stage in considering the facts of the matter and considering the serious challenges uh, in aged care facilities in Victoria, do they go to the fact that these things are happening in Victoria because of the serious failings of Dan Andrews and the Victorian government uh, in quarantine, in testing and tracing. I mean, this is a government. This is um, a government that wouldn't Senator that had Seselja. the toughest lockdowns, Senator uh, but the biggest. Please resume your seat, Senator Polly. So, acting Deputy President, uh, Madam Deputy President, I just draw your attention that we should be using the correct titles. Uh, it is Premier Dan Andrews. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Seselja. Thank you, continue. thank you. And, and it is Premier Dan Andrews and his failings that this lot over here want to run a protection racket for. They want to ignore the failures of quarantine. They want to ignore the failures of testing and tracing. I mean, this is a government and Premier Dan Andrews, who, who, who acted like a dictator during this process, where he would be stopping people. He had the toughest lockdowns and the biggest failings. The toughest lockdowns and the biggest failings, and the people of Victoria are suffering the consequences. And those on the other side ignore that. I haven't heard a Victorian senator come in here, a Victorian Labor senator come in here and raise one iota of criticism of Dan Andrews and the Victorian Labor government. Why is it happening in Victoria and not in New South Wales? Has New South Wales not faced similar challenges? Of course they have, but they have responded differently. And this goes to the heart of the political attack. They will lie, they will smear, and they will continue to run a protection racket for their mate, Daniel Andrews, in Victoria. Uh, thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator Chisholm. 
Uh, thanks, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, what we saw is a performance there from Senator Zeldra that was completely unbecoming uh, of this chamber. Uh, one of the things that I have really uh, found difficult to deal Order. with over the last couple of months, uh, as I've spoken to some of my Victorian colleagues and heard the first-hand accounts from them of the work that they've been doing dealing with the aged care crisis in Victoria. And they have been uh, traumatised by the work that they have had to do helping out their constituents um, in aged care. And some of the stories that we have been highlighting as part of our work here this week have been really important to put a spotlight on the neglect of this government. And what we went through in question time today was not only the neglect that this government have been responsible for this year, but this goes back over many years that this government are responsible for the neglect in aged care. Uh, and we saw through the questions from uh, Senator Watt, from, uh, also from Senator Ciccone, Senator O'Neill, Senator Carr and myself, was they were warned by experts, they were warned by their own reports, but they were all also warned by people on their own team, by uh, Mr Broadbent, by Senator Fairventi wells that numerous times within their own show were they warned about their neglect of aged care. Uh, and what we saw from Senator Ciccone and Senator Carr is they focused on the workforce issues. As Senator Watt mentioned, they had a report on that years ago that they failed to actually take any action on. And Senator O'Neill and myself focused on the warnings from colleagues. But there is a history and a pattern with this issue and this government when it comes to difficult challenges. Uh, and there's a timeline through this that tells the story of the government's neglect of aged care now going back five or six years. Uh, and the timeline actually centres around the now Prime Minister, who was Treasurer at the time. And we know that uh, in December 15 and May 2016, as Treasurer, the now Prime Minister cut $2 billion from the aged care budget. This has real consequences, these decisions. Uh, in June 2018, the government received a report from the Aged Care Workforce Task Force, Strategy Task Force and fails to implement its recommendations. And what's happened after this? Uh, what we know, and the anniversary was recently, and I'm sure Senator Cormann recalls this as well, on the 24th of August, Scott Morrison becomes Prime Minister. And we saw uh, Minister Colbeck re re respond on this one numerous times today. We know that a few weeks later, he calls a royal commission into aged care. And what we know with this Prime Minister, before he makes any decision, it's politics first, it's politics second and it's politics third. So we know in those three weeks after he became Prime Minister, before he called a Royal Commission, he would have been sitting around with his colleagues, right, what do we have to try and neutralise to get through an election campaign? I know, let's have a Royal Commission into aged care. So their motivation wasn't to fix these problems. Uh, their motivation was to get this off the agenda so they don't have to deal with the real challenges of aged care between now and their election. Uh, and that's what their motivation was. Their motivation was always around the politics and not around fixing these challenges. Uh, and we know this because they received the interim report from the, the Royal Commission titled Neglect. Like, what could possibly get you more motivated to take action than receiving a report titled Neglect? And they fail to act on its findings. And then what we've seen this year is the devastation that this government needs to be held accountable for. Uh, we saw aged care homes hit throughout the world, providing a warning shot for Australian government to be ready. Uh, we know in March and April there were outbreaks, outbreaks in New South Wales. And then obviously over the last couple of months we've seen the devastation in Victoria. Uh, there's one figure that Senator Sajolja didn't mention, and that's the more than 300 deaths that we've had in Victoria as a result of this and more than 1,000 people battling the virus at the moment. So Minister Colbeck happens to be the one uh, who is in the job now that is bearing responsibility for these decisions that this government have made over numerous years. And the minister was warned and this government was warned of years of neglect, and he's the one there when it has all caught up with him in devastating fashion because they have been found wanting in aged care. They've been found wanting in their response to uh, COVID and how they deal with that. And there is no doubt that there is a lack of confidence in this minister um, to deal with this COVID outbreak. But the long-term worry for Australians is he's not going to be capable enough to actually put in the long-term reforms that aged care needs 
And this is what the Australians and this is what this government need to be held accountable for. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Molan. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy President. We have taken responsibility. We have acted. We will continue to act and we will act effectively from day one based on our record, and our record is known, and we will be accountable. We will not smear and we will not lie. What we've seen the last few days is a game of numbers that is a disgrace to those who have suffered in aged care or anywhere else in COVID-19. Perfection, perfection, Order. Deputy President, perfection might be something which exists in the world opposite. But in the real world in which we live, let's look. Let's look at how we have gone comparatively. Every death in Australia, as we know, due to COVID-19, including deaths of older Australians in residential aid care, of course, it's a tragedy. And I extend my deepest sympathy and condolences to the families and carers of those who have died. I also acknowledge the extraordinary work that's been put in by the workers, the dedicated aged care workforce, who turn up and work and face extraordinarily confronting situations each and every day. But, Deputy President, this is an important point. During the COVID-19 pandemic, no country has been able to avoid outbreaks in residential care, aged care or deaths when there has been widespread community transmission, as we saw in Premier Dan Andrews' Victoria. I reject the assertion totally that Australia has a high death rate in residential aged care by international comparisons. The contrary, in actual fact, is true. Of course that doesn't detract from the tragedy of every death, and I know that the opposition do not like facts, but these are the facts. Australia's overall COVID death rate as a proportion of cases is around 2.1 per cent, compared to 13.1 per cent in the UK and 3.2 per cent in the USA. Our death rate in aged care across Australia as a proportion of total aged care residents is around 0.18 per cent, or 1.2 per cent in the thousand, compared to 5.3 per cent in the UK, where nearly 20,000 deaths have been seen. These are the facts. The opposition has been playing some mathematical game, some fund catch-me-out mathematical game for a week or so. These are the mathematical facts. In the UK, of the 9,081 care homes included in a recent study, 56 reported at least one confirmed case of coronavirus by the staff or residents, compared to the 7.7 per cent in Australian aged care homes—56 per cent in the UK compared to 7.7 per cent in Australian aged care homes. Nationally, there have been 25,503 cases of COVID-19 including 525 deaths. Of those deaths, 342 have been aged care recipients, being residential—335 and home care—7. This represents, Deputy President, a national crude case fatality rate, fatality rate of 2.1 per cent and a per capita death rate of 2 per 100,000 population. Globally, there is a, these are the global figures. Globally, there is a crude case fatality, fatality rate of 3.7 per cent, whereas Australia's crude case fatality is comparatively lower at 2.1 per cent. So 3.7 per cent across the world, 2.1 per cent in Australia. By comparison, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada's crude case fatality rates are United Kingdom 13.1, United States 3.2, Canada 7.4. Deputy President, 
We have taken responsibility. We have acted. We will continue to act, and we will act effectively from day one, based on our record. And we will be accountable you, without Mullen. smearing or lying. Expired. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sure I'm not the only person in the chamber or listening to that last contribution who finds uh, the, the, the direct the, 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 effort, the effort to obscure the government's responsibility with a wall of figures as odious as, odious as we should. The idea, the idea Senator that Senator Ayres, Molan. Senator Ayres, resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Ayres has the right, Senator Wong, to be heard in peace. Silence. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in silence. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Ayres. I'd settle for a bit of peace at the moment. The, uh, comparing, comparing our performance in Australia, first world developed country, to Florida or the United Kingdom, old Jim's ideological bedfellows, where it's a complete and utter disaster, exactly where, exactly where Prime Minister Morrison would have taken the country if left to his own devices, Order. is absolutely odious. But this is about aged care. Minister Colbeck's performance in this chamber during question time today and yesterday and the day before has been excruciating. It should be a source of shame to him and embarrassment to his colleagues. But the problem is much deeper than Minister Colbeck's embarrassing performance. It's systemic. It's political. It's an abject failure of governance. And it's a symbol of the utter contempt that this government has for its most basic responsibilities, that is to govern in the interests of all Australians in this case, older Australians who deserve our respect, our love and the highest standards of service, not cuts or a system that's all about profiteering and neglect. There were plenty of warnings, and we went through those in some detail in question time today. 40 per cent of US COVID deaths have been in aged care facilities, 80 per cent of Canada's deaths. The outbreaks at New March and Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March. At the height of the New March crisis, 87 per cent of their staff were unable to attend work. No action from the government. Federal advice was to prepare for up to 30 per cent of staff being infected or quarantined. Yet this so-called surge funding, breathlessly announced in another press conference, another announcement, only 50 per cent of it has been spent. A report was handed to the government on April 14 from Professor Gilbert. It was only made sub public when it was submitted to the Royal Commission into Aged Care. It focused on the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak where six people died. The warnings unheeded. It's abundantly clear that Minister Colbeck isn't fit to run Australia's aged care system, uh, which is why, despite having the title of Australia's aged care minister, He's had much of his responsibilities in this pandemic stripped away from him. The safest bet in politics at the moment is that Senator Colbeck's ministry will not survive the next reshuffle. But why was Senator Colbeck ever put in charge of our aged care system? Senator Colbeck has got no experience in the sector, briefly served as Minister for Tourism and International Education, in 2016 was demoted to fifth place on the Liberal Party's Tasmanian Senate ticket and only returned to the parliament because former Senator Parry had to leave. A man who the Tasmanian Liberals didn't even want to put into an electable position on the Tasmanian Senate ticket has been put in charge of a system that provides care for 1.3 million older Australians. Beyond supporting the appointment of this Prime Minister, of this minister, the Prime Minister is deeply implicated in the aged care crisis. As determined as he always is to avoid responsibility, aged care is funded and regulated by the federal government. It is a core federal responsibility. There's no shortage of sympathetic words from the Prime Minister 
crocodile tears, focus group tested apologies for the residents of Australia's aged care system, but his fake empathy derives from only one thing, and that's fear of exposure of his role, of his role in the running down of Australia's aged care system, in the cuts to funding to Australia's aged care system, and for his role as an utter failure in doing what should have been done all of this year to make sure that we defended Australia's aged care residents against the coronavirus pandemic. The question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to my question today relating to the lack of action this government has taken to support the arts and entertainment industry. I asked the minister whether actions spoke louder than words. His response was yes. But of course, as we go through what the government has actually done in relation to the arts and entertainment sector in the midst of this pandemic, it's quite clear that they speak a lot, but they don't do a lot. There's a lot of promises made and very little delivered. The Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian, you know, the Australian Idol superstar, back in June. He promised that finally, after waiting for months, the arts and entertainment industry would receive some funding. Two months later, while arts industries, while workers in the arts, those in, creative, in the creative sector have struggled with very little support, we still see no money flowing. I was puzzled about this. So I asked the head of the Prime Minister's own department a couple of weeks ago in the middle of the, uh, as part of the Senate's COVID committee. Under questioning, the department secretary said, well, no, no, no money is going to flow until after restrictions have lifted. Well, that is simply not good enough. That is not what the Prime Minister had promised. It's not what he told Guy Sebastian he was going to do, and it's certainly not in the spirit of the announcement that he made. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the reason our Australian artists are struggling right now is because of the restrictions themselves. That is why it's the arts and the entertainment industry that have been the, amongst the hardest hit as soon as those restrictions were put in place in March, entire shows, productions, events were shut down overnight. People lost their jobs, they've lost income, they've lost access to insurance. And of course, the JobKeeper supplement has not been made accessible to many of these workers or these businesses because of the nature of the gig-to-gig -gig type of environment that they work in. So artists have been left out largely by JobKeeper, and now they are not even getting the money they were promised. So it seems under this government's watch, words are fine, but action is lacking. Under this government, as long as they can get a photo op with a few celebrities, they think they've done their job. They think they've done their job. Well, it is not good enough. Australian artists can see this for what it is. The Australian people can see this for what it is. You know, what's next? The Prime Minister lines up a press conference with Tina Arena. Is that what he's looking for? He wants to stand there with Tina Arena and say, oh, yes, sorry, we did promise the money. We'll try again. We can't trust this government. They just don't care about Australian artists, the music industry, the festival industry, our authors, our First Nations artists. These are all people who are struggling right now. A press conference with a few celebrities might look good for the nightly news, but as sure as hell doesn't deliver the support that's needed. This government needs to think very carefully. We are on the brink of losing an entire generation of artists in this country. Six months on and no money has flowed. It is precisely during the restrictions 
that money is needed. It is to ensure that businesses can stay afloat, that workers can be paid, that artists can keep paying their bills while continuing to create. It is precisely during the restrictions that this support is needed. So I ask the minister again to take on notice and to think very carefully. Is it really the view of this government that no money will flow to Australian artists until restrictions are lifted? Because if that is the case, this whole package is a sham. If that is the case, it is quite true that this government doesn't care about artists, they don't care about the creative industries in this country, and they simply don't get the cultural and artistic value to our society and our broader community. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall, uh, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I did notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs uh, 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020, allowing it to be considered in this period of sittings. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for the bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Carr for Tuesday, the 25th of August, for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call, unless there's any other, um, I'll call the clerk. General business notice of motion 739 standing in the name of Senator Billick for today has been postponed to the 27th of August. I remind senators that question may be put any, any on, at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I'll try and take them in an order, order most convenient to the chamber unless there's an objection. Could I go to government business motion number one, Senator Dunningham? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion number one and two uh, be taken together as formal. Is there, there being no objection, Minister. I move that the following bills be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes, and uh, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to sport and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, Minister. I present the bills and move that these bills be uh, may proceed rather without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to sport and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 6 October 2020. Senator Dunningham. I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I commence, Senators, with motion number 735, Senator Patrick? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 735 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, number 736, also in your name. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business, of, business notice of motion number 736 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McCarthy, perfect timing. I'll give you a moment to get to your seat. And we'll come to motion number 737. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
I ask that general business notice of motion number 737 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McCarthy. I move the motion. Question is that motion be. Oh, Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Aboriginal flag is a powerful and respected symbol for all Australians and to Minister White, who knows the creator and copyright owner Harold Thomas. And the government encourages all Australians to fly and show the flag with pride. The Australian government is aware of the concerns around the copyright of the Aboriginal flag and is seeking to resolve the matter in a way that respects the rights of the flag's creator while ensuring the flag continues to be a symbol of unity for Aboriginal people. Question is the motion moved by Senator McCarthy, number 737, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 741 in the name of Senators Davey and Mackenzie? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'll. I'll go to, in that case, number 742. In the name of Senator Chisholm and others, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 742 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question, Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government acknowledges the efforts of all workers in the aged care, health and disability sectors, regardless of their membership in a union. The government has implemented a pandemic leave disaster payment to support those who don't have paid leave entitlements, yet have been directed to isolate for 14 days when they otherwise would have been working. This includes workers in the aged care, health and disability sectors. The payment is currently available in Victoria and Tasmania, and the Prime Minister has written uh, to state premiers um, with the offer extending it if required. The question is that motion number 742 be agreed to. Oh, sorry, Senator Faruqi. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, thank you. The Greens support this motion. Paid pandemic leave should be for all workers. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the profound pre precarity and inequality that exists in workplaces. And no one, not a single person, should be forced to choose between protecting their health, the health of those around them, or being plunged into economic hardship. And well, yet, this is the exact forward? situation many workers find themselves in. The government needs to support workers and guarantee and fund a safety net so all workers have access to at least 14 days of paid pandemic leave. And right now, this needs to happen right now. We can't wait for a state of disaster to be declared. We need to act to prevent disasters. The Greens have a bill before the Senate to do just that, and we urge the Senate to pass the bill for the sake of workers, for the sake of communities, and for the sake of public health. So the seven four. I'm just going to look, checking the screen. Um, I'll put the motion then. The question is that motion number seven four two be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Davey will now go back to seven four one. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number seven four one relating to the Murray Darling Basin be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Davey. I move the motion standing in my name and in the name of Senator McKenzie. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. One Nation will support this motion. You're seeking leave to make a short statement, I assume, Senator yes. Roberts? Leave yes. is granted for yes, one minute. Mr. President. Thank you. One Nation will support this motion. National Senators Davey and McKenzie refer to, quote, outdated, fragmented and unfair regulations around water management. That is, in fact, federal law. The Water Act 2007 and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan water trading regulations. The Howard-Turnbull pair introduced both. Taken together, the Act and regulations implemented a globalist strategy to replace family farming and family-based communities with large corporate mono-agriculture and on-farm accommodation. They separated water allocations from land ownership. The ACCC report confirms the plan has produced unfair outcomes and potentially illegal behaviour. The Nationals should know these regulations are unfair because the Nationals passed them. Now, 13 years later, with disastrous opinion polls, the Nationals are now talking of family farms, yet coalition elites block their path. This motion has limited credibility. The question is that motion number 741 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. 
The ayes have it. Could I jump back now to 745 in the name of Senator Waters? I assume someone is moving it on her behalf. Sorry, you can seek the. Uh, I said. Um, yeah, I announced earlier Senator Wong was going to try and do it in an order for the chamber, but you can ask for them to be dealt with in the order on the notice paper if you wish. This is the last of the ones I do not expect to have to ring the bells for, I suppose. That's what I was... Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 745 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, domestic and family violence is a scourge and its impact is horrific. The government has swiftly committed $150 million for the domestic violence specific COVID 19 support package. This funding is on top of the $340 million the Commonwealth has already invested in the fourth action plan initiatives. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wong, you are seeking the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave. I ask that general business notice of motion number 744 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Wong. I thank the Senate. Um, uh, I move the motion. I seek. I ask that paragraphs, given that there is a different voting intention, I understand from One Nation in relation to different paragraphs. I would ask that. Paragraph A be voted on separately to paragraphs B, C and D. And I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, this is an important motion. It is a motion which goes to ministerial accountability. Uh, it is a motion which goes to the basic requirement that a minister should be required to attend the chamber should be required to respond to matters within his or her portfolio which are of such concern to the community. Uh, and I would argue or, uh, also enable the, would also empower the chamber to determine what action should be taken. Uh, so I would say to the crossbench, I would ask for support not only to require Minister Colbert to come down to the chamber uh, uh, to respond to the extraordinary maladministration in his portfolio. But I would also say, and I notice that Senator Roberts is on the monitor, the second part of the motion which currently One Nation is seeking to oppose gives the Senate the power to act. It gives the Senate the power to act. Uh, and Order. The, this Senator chamber Wong, time for the I seek minute. leave to continue to, I have to finish my statement, Mr President. Leave is grant. Another minute. Leave is granted for another I minute. I, I thank the chamber. Now I make this point. There are not many occasions in this place where we are in this place where we are confronted uh, with hundreds of Australians dying whilst we are sitting here day by day. Uh, and, and the fact that the government failed to act on multiple warnings. And I think it is demonstrably the case that they failed to do so, has caused enormous and tragic consequences. This minister should be held to account by this chamber. It is a basic principle of ministerial accountability. We will move this motion. We ask for support from the crossbench for all of the paragraphs in the interests of that accountability. Uh, and I, put, I flag here, we will continue to press ministerial accountability because Minister Colbeck has demonstrably failed to do what he ought to have done as a Minister of the Crown. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Our government, uh, I seek I leave to make a, a two-minute two statement. statement. Senator yes. Cormann? Yes. Leave is granted. Uh, our government uh, takes ministerial accountability and responsibility very seriously, very seriously indeed. And uh, Senator Colbeck, of course, uh, has been answering questions all week. I think he's fielded every uh, Labor question in the chamber this week, and he has uh, done his absolute best to provide the information that was sought of him. And of course, I mean, he is dealing with a very difficult, very, very difficult challenge in a very difficult yes, circumstance. And you know, in Victoria, we, uh, well, in, in Melbourne, I should say. Uh, there is a, a very significant outbreak of a, of, a of a terrible virus. There's a significant increase in infections, uh, which um, inevitably, sadly, exposes uh, those most vulnerable in our uh, community the most. And that, sadly, uh, includes 
uh, residents uh, in IHK care facilities. And of course we all are focused on doing the absolute best we can to ensure we uh, get on top of uh, that very challenging and, and tragic situation as swiftly as possible. And the Minister is being accountable and we absolutely think it's appropriate in these cir circumstances if the Chamber seeks the attendance of a Minister for the Minister to attend and for the Senate uh, to take note uh, in relation uh, to the Minister's explanation. That is not something that we do have a, a problem with. We do have a problem with paragraphs B, C and D because they seek to uh, provide unprecedented uh, power uh, to uh, Senator Wong to move without notice, to move without notice a motion, Order. to move without notice a motion, to have the motion dealt with uh, without amendment. It actually says so in the motion. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, point of order. The leader of the government is misleading. It is not unprecedented. It is like Senator a suspension Wong, of standing Senator orders Wong, to I'm move a motion. This is not, um, it is that's not, not unprecedented. Senator Wong, please don't, resume don't your lie. seat. Senator Wong, I ask you to withdraw that term. Don't mislead. That, it is not a point of order, I'm afraid, Senator Wong. Um, Senator, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, please cease interjecting. Senator Cormann. I think directly from the motion, Senator Wong is seeking uh, the power to move a motion without notice, without notice, uh, relating uh, to the explanation and the conduct of the minister. And a motion for that motion to be moved on the paragraph B may not be amended. Uh, if Senator Wong wants to move motions in relation to the minister, she should follow the normal processes of the parliament. This is just uh, an extension of Labour's attempt uh, to, to play politics with what is a very serious issue. So the question is, and I have separated the motion um, pursuant to the request of the Leader of the Opposition, um, that Clause A of Motion 744 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now that Clauses B, C and D of Motion 744 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that clauses B, C and D of motion 744 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The matter is therefore negative. Senators, there will be imminent divisions, so I urge you to remain in the chamber. We'll go to the top of the agenda and go to business of the Senate matter number one, which I know is in the name of Senators McAllister and Waters. Being debated. My notes are old, sorry. I'll then go to matter number 725. Senator Polly. I'll give you a moment to get to your seat. Oh, sorry. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 725 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Polly. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I believe to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Early access to super, in addition to the government's $314 billion economic response to the coronavirus, has been a lifeline for millions of Australians. Data from the ABS and from banks has shown that overwhelmingly those who have accessed their super have used it to pay down bills, personal loans, car loans, mortgages, and to put food on the table. It's enabled families to build financial resilience during a once in a 100 year global pandemic. The question is the motion moved by Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 725 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the negative. I remind senators we will have more divisions. Can I move to matter number 732 in the name of Senator Hanson Young? Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend uh, motion 732 in the, in the term circulated. Leave is granted, I presume. It is. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I amend the motion in the term circulated and ask that motion number 732 as amended standing in my name for today be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an irresponsible motion that stands in the way of a bipartisan national cabinet decision agreed by all states and territories. Moving towards a single touch approvals uh, process is a key reform that will assist with economic recovery post COVID and save industry over $426 million a year in regulatory costs by reducing duplica duplication. The single touch model will deliver greater certainty without reducing environmental protection. Yes. The question is that motion number 732 as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that motion number 732 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 24. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could we come to matter number 738 in the name of Senator McKim? Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I indicate that Senator Griff will also sponsor this motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 738 relating to the seventh anniversary of Australia's current policy of offshore detention, standing in my name and the name of Senator Griff, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government cannot uh, support Senator McKim's motion, which is just another example of the Greens abusing this chamber as a platform for cynical political stunts. Australians haven't forgotten what happened when Labor and the Greens weakened our borders. 50,000 people arrived on more than 800 Order. boats, and at least 1,200 lives were tragically lost at sea. 8,000 children McKim. were detained. The Greens want to give the keys to our borders back to people smugglers, just like they did during the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd border disaster. The Morrison government will never return to the failed policies of those opposite. We will not adopt policies which will condemn Order. vulnerable men, women and children to perilous sea voyages. The question is that motion number 738 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Yes, four. Can we do one? With the consent of the whips, I'm happy to change it to a one-minute bell. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 738 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Smith tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, uh, with the consent of the whips, the bells will ring for one minute for the next series of divisions. Could we move to matter number 740? Name of Senator Muriel Smith and Senator Urquhart is going to move that on her behalf. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 740 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Pensions are indexed according to formulas set out in legislation passed by the Rudd government in 2009. The Morrison government is supporting pensioners through the coronavirus period and has already provided two one off payments of $750 to pensioners and is further considering the implications of unanticipated changes to price indexes. The question is that motion number 740 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 740 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell the ayes. Senator Smith tell the noes. The result of the division is ayes 22, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, the final matter is number 743 in the name of Senator Rice, and I assume Senator Seawalt will be moving it on her behalf. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 743 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawalt. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion, oh, Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Um, the opposition won't be supporting this. The native timber industry is highly regulated, and with regards to the federal court decision, the matter is ongoing, and the Senate should allow these proceedings to continue without interference. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. All right, I'm going to put it again because I didn't hear two voices, but I will show a courtesy to the Senate. The question is that motion number 743 be agreed to. Um, th th those to the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. The question is that motion number 743 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt tell for the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 4, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Before we go to the MPI, there's a couple of housekeeping matters. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I receive leave to lodge a notice of motion for consideration during tomorrow's general business debate. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I ask that. Oops, my. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, I, ask, I, ask, I seek leave to move a motion relating to a leave of absence for Senator Canavan. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Canavan for today for personal reasons. Thank you. Uh, the motion is uh, that leave be granted. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. What are we up to? I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 15 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Billick. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's failure to act in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect and the warnings from COVID-19 outbreaks in the Northern Hemisphere at Dorothy Henderson Lodge at Newmarch House, resulting in the tragic and unnecessary deaths of 335 Australians in aged care. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And I'm pleased to uh, speak today on my <laughs> MPI. We've seen the disastrous outcomes of an aged care system. Sorry, we've seen the disastrous outcomes of an aged care system in crisis, and sadly, so far, COVID-19 has taken the lives of 335 Australians in aged care. Loving fathers and mothers, grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles and dear friends who should have had more time with their families. And we have to remember that the current, current government has been in power for seven years. It's a third term Liberal national government. And the world has known about COVID-19 since the beginning of the year with reports emerging very early this year of outbreaks in aged care facilities in Europe with high death tolls. We were warned the signs were there, and yet the Morrison government failed to act. The Aged Care Royal Commission has confirmed Mr Morrison had no workable plan to protect vulnerable older Australians in nursing homes from COVID-19. And then when they did say they had a plan, 
What did they, what did they do? They just renamed the CDNA. All spin, no substance, no responsibility over that side. And we're seeing now the tragic impact of this failure. And I have to say, Mr Morrison's attempts to deflect blame is an affront to older Australians and their loved ones. What hubris made the government think that these scenarios that have occurred around the world could not or would not happen here? Mr Acting Deputy President, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my Tasmanian colleague, Ms Julie Collins, the member for Franklin and the Shadow Minister for Ageing, for her tireless work in holding the government to account for these abysmal failures. Ms Collins has continued to highlight the government's failure to act, not just during the current crisis, but on the crisis in aged care over the last seven years. And whenever the government cops criticism on aged care, what do they do? Well, they commission a report and then they ignore the report's recommendations. In all the reports into aged care gathering dust, there are a total of 150 recommendations which the government has failed to act on. Aged care was already in crisis before the pandemic struck, and the government's failures leading up to the COVID-19 outbreak have exacerbated the problem. This is what the Aged Care Royal Commission has said, and I quote, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. Now, I suspect that everyone else in this place, like me, has had numerous calls to their offices from constituents who cannot get the support they need. Calls from people who are waiting to receive home care packages months or even years after they have been approved for them. Calls from people who are concerned about the health of their loved ones in residential aged care because they have been chemically restrained. Calls from people whose husband, wife, mother or father has had a fall or who has soiled themselves and has gone for hours unattended. And despite aged care clients at home or in residential aged care struggling to get the care they need and deserve, many providers are operating at a financial loss. Now, I know that our aged care workers and the providers they work for are doing the best they can with the resources they have, but they are working in an underfunded, under-resourced sector that has been neglected by this government for the past seven years. If aged care was already in crisis before the pandemic and those opposite failed to plan for the pandemic, how can aged care providers possibly be expected to manage the additional costs and logistical challenges presented by COVID-19? The simple answer is they can't, and hundreds of residents are suffering and dying because of it. Labor is pursuing this issue because we owe it to residents of Australian aged care facilities and their families to demand the answers that they seek. My heart goes out to the families who have lost members in residential aged care facilities, and I would like to pay my condolences to all those who have lost loved ones due to this pandemic. Not getting consistent news about their loved ones in a timely manner and not being able to hold them and say a proper goodbye has just added another layer of pain and grief to an already deeply painful experience. I once again reiterate the condolences I offered during the urgency debate yesterday Senator and Billick, today to the families for their tragic loss. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. It's, it's always wonderful to hear from Senator Billick because she is genuinely one of the big hearts of this place, and I mean that quite sincerely. But when it comes to this subject, um, I'm afraid she's operating with her heart only and not with her head because the facts just don't support the arguments that she has made to the chamber this afternoon. So I'll take that interjection from Senator Billick. She says, take a look at the budget papers. Well, you know what? I, I would love to take this chamber to the spending that has gone on under this government in the aged care space, because despite the fact that um, the Leader of the Opposition has in the other place today and members of this chamber have been repeating um, that misleading comment. Um, they, they keep saying that we have been cutting funding to aged care in the time we've been in government. They say it over and over again as though to repeat a lie often enough makes it true. But 
It simply doesn't work that way. And if you don't believe me, if you want to say, OK, well, she's partisan, she's part of the coalition, she's got a vested interest here, don't listen to me. That's OK. That's fine. Listen to a group that is, let's face it, no friend of the coalition's, the ABC. I, Senator Sassel is right. On most topics and on most opportunities, the ABC takes every opportunity it's got to criticise the coalition, and yet in its article, which was granted from November 2018, fact-checked, did the government cut $1.2 billion from aged care funding? Well, there's a big old red X here and the word misleading. It just isn't true. And then today they doubled down on that and said, no, 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 it's not $1.2 billion, it's $1.7 billion. Well, I can tell you, Mr Acting Deputy President, if we didn't cut $1.2 billion in 2018, we certainly didn't cut $1.7 billion in 2020. They are operating in a fantasy land where numbers can be plucked from the air and cast about with no correlation to reality whatsoever. So let's do something of a fact check because we know that what's being said by those opposite doesn't bear much correlation to fact. Um, the very ABC tells us that. Let's go to some facts. Total aged care spending under Labor was $13.3 billion when they left office per year. Compare that to this year. Under the coalition, $22.6 billion dollars. Now that doesn't sound like a cut to me, but hey, let's make an adjustment. Times pass, there's been inflation. Let's excuse me, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I am having a clumsy day. Um, the, let, let's assume there's inflation and so forth. It's still an enormous increase. And here is the kicker. In 2022 to 23, that figure continues to increase, rising to 25.44 billion dollars a year. That's not a cut. That's nothing even close to a cut. So I'd implore those opposite to either look at the numbers or reacquaint themselves with their fidelity to the facts because they are a long way off in what they're presenting to the chamber. How about this for another fact check? Every year under the coalition, the number of home care packages have increased. The number of residential care places have increased and, as I've mentioned, every year aged care funding has increased. It's a record investment over the forward estimates. It has never been higher than this. And When you add to that an additional $3 billion to go to an extra 50,000 additional packages since the 2018 to 2019 budget, Things are nothing like what's being painted by those opposite. Um, I'm, I'm loath to spend my precious time just labouring numbers, because sometimes people can glaze over when their numbers are just so big. But I'll finish with, with this important figure on the, on the funding and, and resourcing front. As at March 2020, 151,958 people had access to a home care package. That was an increase of 36 per cent on the year before. So 36 per cent better than we did the year before. So don't compare us against Labor's terrible underperformance. Compare us to how we performed last year, because every year, every day, every month, every week, we are trying to do this better because we recognise something that is quite serious in the future of this country, and that is that we have an ageing population. And we owe it to our parents and our grandparents, and if we're blessed enough to still have them, our great grandparents, to give them the very best life possible in their later years. And as their care needs increase, as health complications increase, we know that many families often need help. Of course, it's always better when people can be in their homes or be cared for by their loved ones. But the demand on aged care has never been higher because the combination of an ageing population and changes in the way that families are structured so that oftentimes we don't have um, our elders living in a broader extended family together in the way that people might have done um, in the past 
means there is a need for more of this kind of help. But you know, for all of the difficulties that come with providing a high level of service to a group of people in our community that have high needs, 98.5 per cent of senior Australians who were waiting for a package at their assessed level had been offered support by the Commonwealth as at the 31st of March this year. Now, it's not perfection, sure. And are there still problems uh, from time to time? Um, hiccups that have real life consequences for individuals and their families? Sure. But all of those numbers tell us an important story taken together, and that is that this coalition government has a commitment to aged care, has a commitment to its continual improvement, and that they are prepared to back that ambition with the resources that are necessary. So I'm just, I'm just loath to allow those opposite to continue this narrative of crisis when there is um, so many glimmers that should encourage us when it comes to the aged care sector. There's Plenty we can also do to take encouragement from the way Australia is performing during this COVID-19 outbreak as compared to other nations facing similar challenges. And while every person lost is a blow and every family's grief matters, sometimes the statistics that are cited by those opposite are in fact a measure of, when taken as a whole, relatively good management of a difficult situation. Now, I'll explain it this way. When those opposite cite figures that suggest a relatively high proportion of the number of people who pass away um, with COVID-19 come from the residential aged care home sector, that doesn't tell us that residential aged care homes are doing particularly terribly. In fact, by international comparisons, they're doing really very well. Um, and I'm sure that some of my colleagues will take you through those statistics in um, their addresses to the chamber shortly. What it tells us, though, is that our ability to keep COVID-19 deaths low in the broader community has really been very successful. And so when you consider the relatively low number of um, deaths in our broader community, it makes the number of people who have passed in aged care seem disproportionately high, when in fact it should be a measure not of failure um, in the aged care sector, though we acknowledge that every life matters, but rather as a measure of success in the broader community. But there's, there's plenty of measures you can look at. Um, to satisfy yourself that we are doing rather well, broadly speaking, um, when we are compared to other countries. Australia's death rate per million people in aged care is surprisingly low, given the tone of the debate in this place over the last two days. And indeed, our figures for the broader community are remarkably low too. We've got a lot to be proud of. Um, We've got a lot to grieve during this difficult time, but we Order. are doing everything that's necessary to give aged care Senator residents the dignity Dr. they deserve. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this motion on aged care uh, and around the uh, unimplemented recommendations from a number of uh, the reports over the years. Both the government and aged care providers had, in fact, ample opportunities and warnings about the devastating impact of COVID-19 and the impact it could particularly have on residential aged care facilities. As we have discussed in here before, there were examples from Spain, from Canada, from the United States. Despite these warnings, the government failed to put in place adequate preventive measures to stop the entry and spread of corona of COVID-19 in aged care facilities. They failed to learn from the examples here in Australia. They failed to show the leadership and action that was needed. I would like to touch on, for example, one facility um, that we've heard about in the media, 
um, which is Pinjarra Hills in Brisbane, which demonstrated that COVID-19 spreading through facilities is not inevitable. In July, a staff member from this facility in uh, Pinjarra Hills uh, tested positive for COVID-19. After identifying that, uh, that they had been at a number of high-risk sites, the staff member sought to test immediately. But the facility managed to squash a potential fatal outbreak through their strong primary and secondary preventative measures. Bolton Clark, who was the provider or is the provider uh, that runs this facility, started preparing facilities for potential outbreaks back in February and March this year. They created the Enhanced Resident Protection Measures Manual, which included 31 different measures focused on preventing the entry and spread of COVID-19 into aged care facilities. They implemented screening for staff and visitors back in March. They organised low-risk transport for staff that were previously relying on high-risk transportation. Critically, they put in place practices around cohorting staff and residents early on. Staff were co cohorted into specific wings within each facility to prevent mixing of staff and residents across the sites. They also implemented surge staffing, where in high-risk transmission sites, staff surged by 130 per cent of pre-pandemic levels. Where staff surging was not available, staff were required to wear full PPE when they moved outside their home wing within the facility. The combination of these preventative measures and preparedness allowed Penjara Hills to avoid a deadly outbreak of COVID-19. The infection was brought under uh, control quickly and no other staff or residents tested positive for COVID-19. As their CEO said on Radio uh, National Breakfast, there has been a focus in recent months on outbreak preparedness once COVID comes into the aged care service. From our perspective, that's not sufficient. By the time a service goes positive, it's too late. We need to get upstream. We need to identify what are those factors, what's the train of transmission. Outbreak measures are too late. Older Australians should ha shouldn't have to suffer, suffer because the government is focused on outbreak measures instead of preventative me measures. It's just not fair. If one provider understood the risks and did their homework back in February and March, why weren't other providers stepping up? But more importantly, why wasn't the government deriving that? Why weren't they in there instead of doing self-assessment? Why weren't they in there auditing them all, making sure they were prepared for an outbreak and not treating it as inevitable, which is what the minister, in his answers to both questions in the COVID committee and questions here, repeated questions here in the Senate, is keep saying. They've acted as if it was inevitable. It's not inevitable. This evidence shows it's not inevitable. The measures that this provider put in place are not rocket science. Screening and co-holding workers, wearing PPE, not providing additional PPE once you have an outbreak in a facility, cleaning high touch spots. They are the result of good infection and prevention controls. It is time to ask who is bearing the brunt of these failures. Older Australians are suffering and dying alone due to these failures. It's time we changed our approach. Do not rely on it's inevitable this is going to happen. Well, it's not inevitable. There are things that we can do. We need to be, of course, acting to prevent more outbreaks in Victoria, but we need to be acting now to stop outbreaks around this country, get ahead of the game, put preventative measures in Senator place. Senator Seawitt, your time has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We are witnessing the appalling failure of this government in a pandemic to protect our most vulnerable. Older Australians in care and those who love them and care for them are reduced to living in fear. The Morrison government has clearly failed to act in response to the Aged Care Royal Commission's interim report, tellingly entitled Neglect, and the warnings from COVID-19 outbreaks in the Northern Hemisphere at Dorothy Henderson Lodge at New March House, resulting in the tragic and unnecessary deaths of 335 Australians in aged care. This country has agreed that older Australians in care have specific rights, and I note here just some of the rights set out in the Aged Care Charter of Rights—a right to safe and high-quality care and services, 
to be treated with dignity and respect, have my identity, culture and diversity valued and supported, live without abuse and neglect, be informed about my care and services in a way I understand. And that's not even the full list. How can we possibly have any faith or confidence in a government so negligent in its responsibilities, with so little respect for these rights? How does a system that unravels to the extent that an older Australian in aged care is found in a soiled bed, unfed, unwashed, their wounds untended, ants crawling on their body, in any way, in any way reflect a respect for these basic, basic rights? How does leaving our vulnerable older Australians unable to communicate with family for days on end show respect for their rights? How does leaving them uninformed, afraid and isolated demonstrate any level of respect at all? How does knowingly letting aged care facilities experience critical staff shortages because of a pandemic demonstrate respect for the rights of the residents. It's time for the Prime Minister and his Minister for Aged Care to be honest. They knew about the potential for a disastrous withdrawal of staff because of coronavirus, but they did not do enough to pre prepare for this. Evidence to the Aged Care Royal Commission shows that Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House lost most of their workforce within hours or days of an outbreak, months, months before the Victorian outbreaks. And yet Mr Morrison said on the 29th of July, the events have tragically occurred in Victorian aged care homes could not have been anticipated or foreshadowed. But his government was repeatedly warned that it could happen. We are left shocked and questioning why did Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Colbeck not have a proper plan to deal with the loss of workforce in aged care homes? Why has this government grandly and publicly claimed it has established a surge workforce for aged care when closer examination reveals it has spent just half of the money it set aside for this workforce meant to assist aged care homes impacted by coronavirus? This is completely unacceptable. The whole point of having a responsibility is to be ready when the worst happens. Natural disasters, pandemics, catastrophic episodes where governments step up and leads. What do we have? A government that squibbles and shirks and puts out media releases and makes grand statements. But when we look at the substance of what they've done, it is too little and it is far, far too late. The Minister for Aged Care seems to think that community transmission of the COVID-19 virus somehow relieves him of responsibility for his ministry. Yesterday in this chamber he said, and I quote, unfortunately in Victoria, where we have uncontrolled community spread, the virus has inevitably got into re residential aged care. That is what happens. End quote. Unfortunately, inevitably, I don't think so. I offer to finish that last sentence for Senator Colbeck, and it goes like this. This is what happens when you don't have a plan, when you either aren't perceptive enough to look up the definition of the word pandemic, or you don't have a grasp on the faith and responsibility that has been bestowed on you by the Australian people. Yeah, yeah. That's how I would end that sentence. What is unfolding across the aged care system is extremely tragic, and it's very sad. And my heartfelt condolences go out to all those who have lost loved ones. But the saddest thing is that this has always been preventable. The structural flaws in the aged care sector were well known prior to this pandemic, and the government's response should have taken them into account. The sector abounds with committed, caring people who are working hard, stressed beyond belief, trying desperately to do their jobs with limited training, limited funds, too many residents to care for at one time, inadequate PPE and inadequate training. 
workers with no sick leave and no job security on ludicrously low wages for the level of skill and responsibility required. Workers who themselves live in constant fear that it might be them who inadvertently brings the virus into their workplace or home to their families. These workers and the residents they care for deserve better. They deserve reassurance that someone has got their back, that if they can't go to work because they feel unwell, there is someone else that can step up, step into wash and feed and tend to and care for the elderly residents in their workplace. They do not have that reassurance. Residents and their loved ones should be able to have the confidence to know that their rights will be respected, that they will receive quality care. Their voices will be heard and their dignity maintained. They do not have this confidence. And so we are left with the trauma and the wreckage of a system where everyone now lives in fear, the residents and their loved ones and the workers. At the recent Aged Care Royal Commission three-day hearing, Peter Rosen QC concluded the hearing by saying, and I quote, none of the problems that have been associated with the response of the aged care sector to COVID-19 was unforeseeable. Tragically, not all that could be done was done." End quote. And he reiterated that the Morrison government did not have a plan for aged care. Pandemics and natural disasters, by their very nature, create terrible fear in the community. Government's job is to do all in its power to allay that fear by acting, by doing, by leading, by having a plan, by spending the money, by working cooperatively, by being ready to stand by the states, the aged care workers, the families of residents and the residents themselves as they face this awful scourge. They don't allay fear by quibbling about states' responsibilities, by shirking responsibility, by not mobilising resources and training in a timely fashion by turning a blind eye to the harsh reality of insecure work, by failing to address staff ratios, by asserting that disastrous outcomes are inevitable and unfortunate. We are all frightened and we are all on the front line when it comes to fighting this pandemic, but none more so than our aged care community. This government's abrogation of its responsibility has left that community without the weapons that they need to adequately face this battle. It has left them vulnerable and afraid. And that is a disgrace, an utter disgrace. The woeful neglect of our elderly Australians demonstrated by this government time and time again should cause the Minister for Aged Care, the Prime Minister and all members of the government that they are part of to hang their heads in shame, while many, many Australians in aged care are fearful and distressed. Those who love them are frightened and feel powerless, and many others weep for their dead. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, now, the Morrison government's priority is, of course, the safety of the public, and along with that uh, goes the safety of aged care residents and the quality of care that is uh, provided to same. Now, the effects of this pandemic have, of course, been serious and they have been tragic. And I think we all acknowledge that through this crisis, uh, the crisis has been well managed by this government, but the loss of life has, as always, been tragic. So I would like to commence by uh, expressing the opportunity to express my sympathies to the families uh, and the loved ones who have tragically lost lives in the last six months. Uh, it goes without saying, of course, that every death is a tragedy. But, of course, it goes deeper than that. Many other Australians are doing it tough through isolation, they are struggling financially or just struggling with the realities of the world uh, in which they now find themselves. And so, for these reasons, it strikes me as being 
simply extraordinary that any one or any one group of people would try to politicise a situation like this, particularly over the last week. Uh, the attempts by the ALP to play politics with the memory of people's lives has been as staggering as it has been shameful. But of course, drawing more deeply into the equation, you can understand why it is that those opposite would seek to behave in this way. Um, because, Madam Acting Deputy President, we know that those opposite are hopelessly divided and devoid of a coherent agenda. And while we on this side of the chamber seek about getting on with the business of fighting the virus, delivering an economic lifeline to Australians, reopening the economy, building confidence and momentum with the economy and guaranteeing Australia's national security, those on the other side are busy fighting amongst themselves and failing to learn the lessons of elections past. And what do I mean by that, Madam Acting Deputy President? Well, to the extent that you did, I'm glad you asked. Because only this week we've seen two examples of that which I've outlined. And of course, the first was the news this week of the extraordinarily named Labor Environment Action Network, or LEAN, as it's been called, which is a campaign, I believe, in Victoria asking people to throw away their gas powered household appliances. It doesn't strike me as being a policy very good in the middle of one of the coldest winters we've seen for the elderly as well, for the side of politics that are claiming to be the friends uh, of the elderly. And of course, we've got Mark Butler from my home state of South Australia and Joel Fitzgibbon going toe-to-toe -to -toe on Labor's energy policy. And what it shows? They're hopelessly divided, looking for a distraction. Then yesterday, we heard allegations uh, of leaking to the press. Can you believe it, Madam Acting Deputy President? Leaking to the press by members of this chamber, and it was reported on Sky News that Labor's Senators O'Neill and Keneally had what was described as a tense altercation on Monday at some point. I didn't hear it, but it was somewhere over your left shoulder, Madam Acting Deputy President, and it all related to Ms O'Neill's entitlements. Um, she reportedly was accused of leaking stories about the entitlements and visits to, to Tasmania when they met inside the corridor outside this very chamber. Once again, hopelessly divided and devoid of uh, an agenda. So it's not surprising at all that those opposite are trying to run lines against the government, and it's not surprising at all that they're trying to distract from their own hopeless and divided opposition. But to put a bit of a, a positive spin on this, Australia is, of course, facing an extraordinary health challenge. And it's unfortunate that in circumstances where there are large clusters of transmission in a community, it is very, very hard to keep the virus out of aged care facilities. We know that. That's a simple fact. Those opposite love to preach the politics of evidence-based policy, but they like to choose the evidence based on their, own, on their own agenda. So these are some real facts that will assist those opposite to understand the very real facet of what is actually happening here. Because the Morrison government is committed to providing an unlimited amount of surge workforce uh, in facilities that have had an outbreak. And in fact, Commonwealth-funded surge staff have been deployed across to Victorian aged care services to date. ADF personnel uh, are on site in many residential facilities with uh, additional ADF uh, clinical reserve staff available for deployment. So I think it's instructive, Madam Acting Deputy President, to run a fact check. And I know those opposite love a fact check. And in fact, the one fact check they love the most is an ABC fact check. So I'm going to do something similar to that, except this one is going to be based in real facts, not partisan facts like we see on a national broadcaster. Because these are real facts. No country has been able to avoid an outbreak, as I said earlier, in residential care when there has been widespread community trans transmission of the virus. And in fact, Australia's total death rate as a proportion of cases is 2.1 per cent. Now, once again, it's instructive to understand what that means in real terms, because if we compare that to the United Kingdom's figures, they have a, a rate of 13.1 per cent. Now, my maths has never been great, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, but that is significantly higher, significantly higher for the benefit of Senator Polly there, who seems to need it reiterated. But in any event, it's also uh, instructive to point out that 3.2 per cent in the United States, Senator Polly, 3.2 per cent is also higher 
then here. This is, this is the non-ABC fact check. This is a real fact check. Total age care spending under Labor, when they left office, $13.3 billion when they left office, not long enough, compared to $22.6 billion this year under the coalition. Once again, once again, Senator Mullen, my maths not outstanding, seems to me to be a largely superior sum, a largely inflated sum, but also that is going to rise to $25.4 billion in 22-23. And what we see there is an extra $1.2 billion of support that only those opposite could call a billion dollar a year increase uh, a cut. Extraordinary stuff. And by the way, this is the same party across the way here which planned for $387 billion in new taxes at the election, but notwithstanding that enormous tax grab, had no plan for additional funding for home care, aged care or mainstream residential care. Extraordinary stuff. So when it comes to policy, the ALP, those opposite, are hypocritical. When it comes to aged care, those opposite are hypocritical. Uh, every year under the coalition government, these sectors have increased their funding. The Aged Care Workforce Industry Council work continues to progress under the leadership uh, of, of the uh, ACWIC, which was formed in May last year under this coalition government. And additionally, this government continues to improve vocational education tra training with the, um, with the Aged Services Industry Reference Committee by designing new VET qualifications for aged care workers. And then there's the uh, Serious Incident Response Scheme. And the Australian government's investing $23 million to introduce this scheme for residential aged care from 1 July 2021. There are so many different funding schemes here that I could talk to you about. I won't have time, Madam Acting Deputy President, but we are conducting a fact check, and I love facts, and I know those opposite love facts as well, so I'm going to continue to roll through them. These are achievements of this government, this coalition government, since the calling of the Royal Commission. This government has invested $3 billion since the 2018-19 budget into home care packages released 14,275 new residential care places, including 13,500 residential places and 773 short-term restorative care places, invested $21.9 million for my aged care operating costs. The list goes on. I could continue. I will continue. And in fact, this government has established $17.1 million in a specialist dementia care program $21 million in 13 research projects that will focus on risk reduction, prevention and tracking of dementia. Dementia, Madam Acting Deputy President, is Australia's second leading cause of death. This is not the information which fits the narrative being run by those opposite. In fact, this is the information which shows very clearly that those opposite are simply attempting to distract the Australian people from their own disunity and lacking a policy agenda. The Morrison government, in the meantime, as is evidenced by this fact check, is getting on with the job of protecting Australians and protecting the aged. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to thank all of our frontline healthcare and aged care workers. The new March House review undertaken by Professor Gilbert provides a clear example of the challenges faced by many aged care facilities as they tried to contain the coronavirus outbreak. It also demonstrates the lack of planning and the lack of preparation at all levels of government and our healthcare system were to face a pandemic. Simple things like casuals working across multiple facilities were missed as a key risk. Then there seems to have been a decision to block aged care COVID patients from our hospitals, to set aside the intensive care unit beds clearly for younger, fitter Australians. It's time the state health systems told us why they discriminated against the aged. Our older Australians worked and paid their taxes for many decades. So why are they now treated as second class citizens? Or maybe the government, the state and federal governments don't care about the age as one nation does. The Morrison government has proven they are better at patching holes on the run than they are at forward planning and solutions. COVID-19 and the Aged Care Royal Commission have proven this. We expect that all of our governments 
all of our governments could and should work together, but they are all out for what they can get, and that's quite clear. The result is nobody looking after our physical health, our mental health, and our economic health. We have a state premier in Queensland who's handed over running of the state to a health, chief health officer. And that chief health officer has admitted that she has only one goal, and that's to protect the physical health of Queenslanders. So our state now is being run into the ground with no one looking after the economic health and the mental health. That's abdication of a premier. We're looking for a premier in this state. I remind the government, the federal government, of the low level of support provided to recipients of home care packages. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's about time the minister and this government got their act together and respected older Australians. Both the Morrison government and the Queensland government need to step up and demonstrate leadership. They need to show us the data and the plan covering all aspects of managing our way out of this pandemic and the resulting recession. And in the process to ensure the security of our aged Australians. I'd like to continue by reiterating the comments from the President yesterday, uh, on Monday when he opened the Senate with the statement. The case of Tasmania, he said, the correspondence from the State Controller outlines consideration of exemption from the quarantine requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. The cl this claim discretion is particularly problematic on the grounds of differential treatment of members of the executives in the first instance and lack of transparency around the equality of treatment of senators in the second instance. I echo those comments. I, I support this, the Senate President for saying that. What we've seen from state governments is a desire to control people, particularly in Queensland and Victoria. They hide the data, and the Prime Minister is guilty of this too. They hide the data. I wrote uh, Premier Palaszczuk a letter requesting the data on which she has built, built her plan for the state. She pointed in her reply to two, two sources. We check both. There's no data justifying the, the plan she's put in place or the actions she has taken. In Taiwan, in comparison with Australia, they share their data with their people. They share their plan with the people. The leaders trust the people. They don't hide the data. And the people trust the leaders as a result. In the same time that we've had over 530 deaths in Australia from coronavirus, Taiwan has had seven. The figures get even more startling because they have a similar population to ours, 24 million versus our 25. They have a higher density population for easier transmission of the disease, and they have earlier and closer uh, exposure to the virus as a result of communist China being so clear, so, so near. What we've seen, though, is by focusing on the security and doing a good job, Taiwan is locked up or isolated the sick and the vulnerable, and allowed the rest of the people to go to work under conditions for which people take responsibility. That trust and that, that ability for people to be free to go about their work and their leisure has re resulted in Taiwan having an economy that is not, not hit a bump at all and that is thriving. What we need to do in Australia is to start sharing data from the people, with the people, not hide data from the people, and to provide solid leaders that the people can trust. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Polly. Thank you. In this debate today, the most important thing that we have to remember is we are talking about some of the most vulnerable older Australians in this country. With 335 deaths in aged care facilities in Victoria, in the last 24 hours, there's been an additional 24 deaths. 21 of those have been linked to, an age, to aged care homes. These are, these are the very stark figures. Now, what we know already about the Morrison government is they don't like accountability, they don't like transparency, they're not capable of having a competent minister for aged care that actually understands the sector and is prepared to develop a plan with the sector to ensure that vulnerable older Australians are, are safe. Now, what we've had is the Morrison government, after seven years of Liberal governments, four failed ministers, we now um, we've seen Mr Morrison call a royal commission into his own Liberal government's failings. We've had the interim report brought down, and it might be a hint with the title neglect 
to send out warning bells that there is a real crisis in the aged care sector. We have some fantastic staff, some very good homes, but we know they're under pressure. And what have we seen? We've seen nothing but evidence day after day, day after day, week after week, being provided to the Royal Commission, which demonstrates very clearly that this government has no plan. They were warned in March of the issues that the aged care sector were confronting in ensuring that they were able to provide the care, have the skills, have the training of their staff, have the adequate resourcing to ensure that their residents were going to be cared for and looked after. But what have we got? We have still got a situation where even one of the commissioners, Commissioner Pagon, has already acknowledged that this sector is not ready to deal with COVID-19. And what we've seen is, again, a display of government senators coming in saying, oh, this is just the Labor Party. All they're doing is trying to make political points. Well, if that's what you call caring about older Australians, and Senator Antic uh, mentioned people um, with dementia. Well, I've not heard the minister for aged care or the prime minister talk about those people who are living with dementia and how they are particularly being cared for in aged care homes. We know that it is the second leading cause of death in this country. But what we haven't seen is any real action. And we've had the minister come into this place day after day. We've seen Mr Morrison on, in that other place trying to deflect blame off to the Premier of Victoria, blame everyone else because I'm all spin, smoke and mirrors, nothing to do with me. All we do is fund it, but we're not going to take any responsibility. Well, you might be able to continue to talk that sort of nonsense, but I can assure you the Australian people see through you all. They know because it's their parents, it's their grandparents, it's their aunties, it's their uncles, it's their loved ones that have been dying because this government failed to take all the warnings, all the advice that was given not only to them directly, by the sector, by the unions, by this side of the chamber, that they have failed. They have failed. And instead of the minister acknowledging the mistakes and, and coming into this place with a real plan to restore the confidence of the sectors, the confidence of the workers, the confidence of the Australian people, we've seen nothing at all. Nothing at all. And the people that are suffering most are those that are residing in residential care. Now, this has always been acknowledged as being a very contagious virus. And yes, we do have to learn to live with it. But in doing so, you have to have a plan in place. You have to make sure the most stringent training skills, preparedness for those people caring for older Australians are in place. That's your role as a minister. That's your role as the Prime Minister. Now, the Prime Minister gave a commitment to the Australian people at election time that he was going to make older Australians number one priority. Well, if this is what he prioritises, his government's performance, his minister's commitment, then God help us. God help us if you're ranked further down the list of his priority. It's an as, actually a national Senator disgrace Crowley, and we should be— Senator Molan. <clears throat> uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, thank you very much uh, for the call. Uh, I, I guess what we've seen over the last couple of days is a very kind of clever mathematical game, a game which was aimed to catch people out and a game which was really a disgrace to those who have suffered. And we know who suffered and I certainly extend my deepest sympathy, and I have before in the House, only an hour or so ago. I acknowledge the incredible work that those that are working in the aged care sector have done for the people that they care for. They, ex they face extremely confronting circumstances, and they face them every single day. But uh, in a situation where we deny facts or even a reasonable explanation, where like Senator Polly makes the statement that we have seen nothing at all, I'd suggest, Madam Acting Deputy President, that she's not looking. The facts are there to be seen. 
and they are there for everyone who wants to look. Now, when an increase becomes a cut, go for the big lie. Now, we've seen this before. It's a magic approach. We've seen it the way that Labor considers that a cut, that an increase to the ABC becomes a cut. It's just a denial of reality. The most important fact in what we're considering here today is that the total aged care spending under Labor seven years ago was $13.3 billion compared to $22.6 billion. Not seen, not seen nothing at all. That's an increase by any stretch of the imagination, and it will continue to increase. It will increase to $25.4 billion in 2022-23. Only the Labor Party could call a billion dollar a year increase a cut. Now, Labor claims, uh, as uh, one of our previous speakers pointed out, Labor's claims uh, have been disproven by an ABC fact check. Now, it's your ABC. Thank God all I can say is that you're not in power. Because your ABC, even if they couldn't take an ideological view on this, would have been propping you up and assisting you in every way, shape or form. Despite Labor's plans for $387 billion in new tax at the election, including a retiree's tax, Labor provided no additional funding in their costings for home care places or any additional funding for aged care quality a workforce or mainstream residential age clear. No, they didn't. Labor has remained silent on any commitment to aged care since the election, providing no additional funding. We did. So suddenly, Labor cares. This really shows Labor's hypocrisy on aged care. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety Interim Report said that it was difficult not to be critical of successive governments, successive governments' failures to fix the aged care system. The long-standing problems in aged care are a failure of successive governments, but one that we have sought to address. And when, when Senator Polly says that she's seen nothing at all, she ain't looking. It is one that we have sought to address by calling a royal commission. We have made many advances, but large systemic changes over successive governments do not occur overnight. Now, many of us have gone through all the packages, all the, all the issues, all the figures, but that will make no impression on the Labor Party at all. But I just want to, uh, to, to repeat a key fact, a key fact which I spoke about earlier in the House today. And that very important point is that during the COVID-19 pandemic, no country has been able to avoid outbreaks in residential aged care or deaths when there has been widespread community transmission as there has been in Premier Daniel Andrews' Victoria. And that has been a failure. I reject the assertion that Australia has a high death rate in residential aged care by international comparisons. Senator Polly says she's seen nothing. Senator Polly and the Labor Party have not been looking. Madam Acting Deputy President, the alleged failure to act was in fact action after action after action. There was a plan, it was implemented, it was fact-checked closed minds of the opposition and the Greens is on display. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, President, sorry. Uh, I spoke in the chamber on Monday the need to look at aged care from the standpoint of the workers who are the care. Today I want to issue a call on behalf of all Australians for a historic reassessment of the funding and structures of aged care in this country. First, we need to be clear about who is responsible for fixing aged care. Whether the aged care facility is publicly owned, owned by a for-profit company, or not-for-profit like Anglicare's Newmarch House. Scott Morrison likes to pass the buck on a lot of things, on the bushfires, on the robo-debt scandal, on sports rorts, and now on aged care. But if the care of our older Australians is to be reformed, the federal government 
and only the federal government is able to lead the process. And we've had a lot of talk about fact-checking. Let's do a bit of fact-checking. Scott Morrison, his hapless minister, Richard Colbeck, can start by listening to and learning from one of their own, Liberal senator and former aged care minister for Verity Wells. Senator Wells, for Vanty Wells, sorry. Senator Vivanti Wells is very clear that it was the same Liberal government that, under the leadership of Tony Abbott, that utterly failed to act to fix the sector when they had the chance. Fact. The Senator did an interview recently with the Sydney Morning Herald, David Crow, and it did not get the attention it deserves, but this is the point. She said pointedly, fact, that Scott Morrison was one of the social service ministers responsible for aged care. And when this government squandered a change for a chance for reform, it failed to do it under his watch. Fact. I urge my colleagues from the Liberal and National parties to read the Senator's submission to the Aged Care Royal Commission. If you don't care to heed the voices from this side of the chamber, care to listen to your own. And just in the last day, Victorian MP Liberal Russell Broadbent issued a call to Scott Morrison to increase funding for not-for-profit aged care, saying that handling, handing over the care of older Australians to the private sector has been a disaster waiting to happen. Profit became more important than care, he said. We know that since aged care was privatised in the 1990s that people have built vast fortunes by taking billions in public money but with little or no accountability in return. That is not the news to anyone who has been paying attention. A recent story by investigative journalist Michael Bachelard in The Age exposed, not for the first time, the lavish lifestyles that have been built off the backs of vulnerable older Australians and the unpaid workers who take care of them. It is a grotesque, aged care has become the worst kind of predatory capitalism. Companies in the sector like Bupa, Opal, Aliti, Japara, Tricare and others have had a range of different corporate structures. But what they have often in common is the payment of extremely low or no tax in Australia, pay low pay and insecure work offered to their staff, and are more, most critically, all operate with little or an extreme no transparency on whether and how the billions they receive from taxpayers is actually spent on care. Let me just give you one example of privatised for profit care. Regis is the largest for profit aged care home chains listed in the Australian Stock Exchange. According to a 2018 report by the Tax Justice Network, the company is majority owned by two founders, Ian Roberts and Brian Bowen. And when Regis listed in the stock exchange, they instantly gained a $734 million fortune. So not only are these private aged care operators taking up to 70 per cent of their revenue, but from the public purse, with little requirement to account for that money, they receive additional money back from the taxpayer through calculated franking dividends. But what do these incredibly wealthy owners of this profitable company do when a global pandemic hits? Well, in the case of Regis, the Health Services Union wrote to them asking them to provide paid pandemic leave for staff that need to test and isolate due to illness. Of course, so far, like the vast majority of for-profit and not-for-profit care agency operators, they have re refused to pay anything. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. The time for the discussion on the MPI has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Do I have any senators wishing to take notes of any of those documents? Take note of any of those documents? No, I shall move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. I call the uh, Senator McGrath. Order, I present the report of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee on examination of annual reports tabled by 30 April 2020. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
I present the annual report of 2019 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and move that the Senate take note of the report. I'm pleased to present the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights 2019 annual report. This committee was formed in 2012 after the passage of the Human Rights Parliamentary Scrutiny Act. For the past eight years, it has operated to locate this, the scrutiny of legislation from a human rights point of view at the heart of the parliamentary process. In that vein, the committee's purpose is to enhance understanding of and respect for human rights in Australia and to ensure appropriate recognition of human rights issues in legislative and policy development. The establishment of the committee builds on the parliament's established traditions of legislative scrutiny. Accordingly, the committee undertakes its scrutiny function as a technical inquiry relating to Australia's international human rights obligations. The committee does not consider the broader policy merits of legislation when performing its technical scrutiny function. This report, covering the period from 1 January to 31 December 2019, details the significant volume of work the committee has undertaken during the reporting period. And during 2019, the committee tabled six scrutiny reports, examining a total of 213 bills and 1,385 legislative instruments. The committee commented on 86 of these bills and instruments, including requesting additional information in relation to 26 bills and nine legislative instruments. As this report notes, the committee's human rights analysis continues to be available in a timely manner to inform parliamentary deliberations. Pleasingly, during 2019, a human rights analysis of 96 per cent of new bills was available to inform members of parliament prior to the passage of legislation. The report also provides information about the work of the committee, including the major themes and scrutiny issues arising from the legislation which the committee examined. For example, the report notes that the right to privacy continues to be the most commonly engaged right with respect to the legislation considered. It also outlines several significant areas which attracted substantive comment from the committee including national security and foreign interference, immigration and citizenship, equality and non-discrimination, and privacy and information sharing. In addition, the report provides an overview of the committee's continued impact during the report period. For example, in presenting a revised version of the Crimes Legislation Amendment Police Powers at Airports Bill 2019, the minister noted that this committee's comments informed the rev revisions which have been made to better protect the right to peaceful protest. The report also notes the committee's 2019 inquiry into the Quality of Care Amendment, minimising the use of restraints principles 2019 which considered whether the regulation of the use of restraints in aged care facilities was consistent with a number of human rights. The committee held a one-day public hearing, taking evidence from 29 witnesses, including departmental officials, state and territory public guardians and medical experts. In addition, the committee received 17 written submissions. While the committee concluded that other laws continued to apply to regulate the use of restraints without informed consent, it considered the amending principles appeared to have created widespread confusion around the legal obligations of, of approved providers in relation to the use of restraint in residential age care facilities and uh, recommended that the principles be amended to address these concerns. Following the completion of this inquiry, the government amended these principles in a manner which addressed the committee's concerns, I'm very pleased to say. This inquiry is an excellent example of the committee's capacity to engage directly with the non-government sector and the public and with ministers and departments in order to inform legislative developments. I extend my thanks to the many witnesses and submitters for their contribution to this inquiry and commend the minister on the timely and responsive amendments to these principles. Finally, as senators will be aware, the committee undertakes legislative scrutiny through a dialogue with legislation proponents, um, most obviously ministers, and often seeks further information to inform its consideration of proposed measures. I thank the ministers, departments and others for their continued engagement with the committee, noting that responses may often be sought under considerable time pressure and may involve significant research and coordination. I want to particularly thank our ministers 
for assisting the committee during the last six months when, of course, they have been under so much pressure. The provision of timely and fulsome information to the committee is crucial to it completing its work. And I also would like to thank the previous chair, Mr Ian Goodenough MP, who was the chair of the committee for part of this reporting period, and my fellow committee members for all their hard work. I also wish to acknowledge the work of the committee's legal adviser, Associate Professor Jacqueline Mowbray, uh, and of course the very hard-working members of the committee's secretariat. I encourage my fellow senators and others to examine the committee's annual report to inform their considerations of the committee's work during the relevant period. And with these comments, I commend the committee's annual report 2019 to the chamber. Thank, thank you, Senator Henderson. I, I think I. Uh, oh, okay. I think Senator to speak on this report. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you um, very much. I just wanted to um, rise and make a few comments about uh, the annual report um, of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, of which I am a member. Uh, I wanted to um, draw the Senate's attention to the role of this committee in the same way that the, the chair has done, um, to alert the Senate to um, some grave concerns about human rights during COVID-19 and the fact that uh, during a crisis like this, it is incredibly important that scrutiny, particularly through a legislative um, uh, scrutiny committee such as this uh, is done meticulously and without any uh, judgment on the merits of the policy that is behind the legislation, but simply on whether the legislation stacks up from a human rights point of view. And we have seen an incredible amount of legislation uh, and delegated legislation. Uh, being passed quickly through through the government through um, Parliament, uh, particularly at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, to support people to get measures in place. There's been an incredible amount of delegated legislation, uh, but it is very clear that we need to make sure that this committee is operating in a way that uh, scrutinises that legislation very clearly. Um, as the chair said, this committee uh, was formed by an act of Parliament, and the functions of the committee are very clear. Um, the committee is required to examine bills and legislative instruments that come before the House to examine the compatibility with human rights and to report both houses, to both houses of Parliament on that issue. Um, a report uh, entitled The Role, Operation and Effectiveness of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights After Five Years by Zoe Hutchinson uh, really um, articulates I believe what the, what the purpose is behind this committee. Um, she says that in formation of this committee, it happened while the federal government um, was doing a review into human rights in Australia. And we know that we don't have a human rights bill, um, a, a federal one uh, in Australia. Um, so in, in order to make sure that we are meeting our human rights obligations, we need to have um, uh, something underlying that. And while the federal government at the time did not adopt more sweeping recommendations, they did recommend that there be this committee and that these mechanisms were created through the passage of legislation. The purpose of the committee was described by the Attorney General at, at the time as improving parliamentary scrutiny of new laws for consistency with Australia's human rights obligation and to encourage early and ongoing consideration of human rights issues in policy and legislative development. You see, the purpose of the committee is to uphold Australia's human rights obligations. And if the committee isn't doing its job, then those obligations are being let down. Uh, at the chair, a chair at the chair at the time, um, oh, sorry, the chair in 2017, speaking to a report, said um, the difference between a, a committee, a legislative or um, references committee in the Senate, for example, with a technical committee is that, like all parliamentarians, scrutiny committee members may and often do have different views in relation to the policy merits of legislation. The report does not assess the broader merits or policy objectives of particular measures, but rather seeks to provide Parliament with a credible technical examination of the human rights implications of legislation. 
Committee members performing a scrutiny function are not and have never been bound by the contents or conclusions of scrutiny committee reports. That is very true. But it is also important to point out that a significant element of technical scrutiny approach, which is also different to other portfolio committees, is the provision of legal advice as a mechanism to support the committee to perform its legislative scrutiny function. Uh, that is why the committee does have an independent part-time legal advisor, and it is the committee's uh, the committee can accept that legal advice, but it certainly should consider it with great reference. It should be taking that legislation, uh, sorry, that legal advice, um, uh, at its uh, core and and really concentrating on what that legal advice is, because it's such an important role of the committee. Um, in saying that, unfortunately. Uh, it has become necessary in recent times for uh, members of the committee to provide dissenting, dissenting reports um, to a number of reports of this committee. And that is incredibly disappointing because although we know there are, we, there are disagreements, and perhaps there might be disagreements about the way that the law is interpreted, um, but also the, the proportionality of some human rights legislation uh, in this particularly um, acute time during COVID-19. The fact that there are so many dissenting reports should alert people to the um, concerns that members in this committee have about the way that, this, um, that the, re the reports that are being delivered to this parliament are not actually highlighting some of the human rights uh, issues that are being uh, raised in these bills. And I just wanted to uh, quickly, with the short amount of time I have left, um, just talk about some of these dissenting reports and the legislation where it was necessary to actually put a dissenting report in on, on what should be something that isn't political party politics, that isn't about the merits of the policy, but just should be the interpretation of that legislation. Um, a dissenting report um, from uh, Labor and Greens members on the Australian Citizenship Amendment uh, Bill, um, you know, a, a pretty important piece of legislation that can strip people of their citizenship. It was necessary to put a dissenting report through on that. The Social Security Administration Amendment Income Management to Cashless Debit Card Transition Bill also required a um, dissenting report because it wasn't clear in the actual report that, as dissenting report uh, members considered, that it wasn't clear enough that it was demonstrated that an extension of the cashless debit card trial is a justifiable limit on the rights to social security and privacy or to the extent that the trial has a disproportionate impact on First Nations people, and that it is reasonable and proportionate measure and therefore not discriminatory. That wasn't made clear enough in the report, and that's, that is a grave concern. Another dissenting report that uh, members were uh, needed to include um, was on the Fair Work Registered Organisation Amendment Bill, ensuring integrity number two. And we know that this was a politicised bill, and we know that the policy behind this bill was highly politicised. But when it comes to human rights and the rights of people to be represented by their unions and to uh, freely associate, that should be above party politics, and yet it was necessary to put a dissenting report in about this bill. And dissenting members in the report said that noting the importance under international human rights law of registration as an essential facet of the rights to organise, the dissenting members consider there is a significant risk that this measure may result in the cancellation of union registration in circumstances that would be incompatible with the right to freedom of association. And finally, the, another, the last um, legislation I want to draw to the Senate's attention is the Australian Security Intelligent Organisation Amendment Bill. A, re a dissenting report uh, was required when it came to this legislation. Um, when it comes to uh, national security. Of course, determining what is proportionate is always a difficult matter, uh, and, and I want to make clear that dissenting reports around human rights legislation or, or the um, compatibility of human rights isn't a, a method of, of saying that a party or a, per, a um, committee member doesn't support the bill itself. Um, but it is necessary to point out 
the very grave issues when it comes to human rights with this bill, and it wasn't in the actual committee report. We had to provide a dissenting report on this issue. What was the issue? Well, uh, this bill included um, the ability for the Attorney General to issue a warrant without a judicial officer overseeing that warrant. Dissenting members considered that the proposed capacity for the Attorney General, a political officer, to issue a warrant and to authorise the apprehension of a person rather than or absent the additional oversight of a judicial officer raises particular concern as to whether the proposed apprehension power permissibly limits the rights of liberty and freedom of movement. Yeah. And I raise this not because I'm a legal eagle who has their head stuck in textbooks, because when, human, when the human rights uh, legislation isn't uphold, held, and we have uh, legislation that's made that limits people's human rights. I can tell you that it's vulnerable people in our society that are the ones that can't go and get the fancy lawyers and run off to court to try to uphold their human rights. It is a concern that this is the way that the, that the reports have had to be tabled, and I draw that to the attention of the Senate. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator McKim. Uh, yes, thank you. On the same report, um, Acting Deputy President, I do associate myself entirely with the remarks uh, just made by uh, Senator Green. And I want to place on the record that given Australia remains the only liberal democracy in the world that has no form of either constitutionally enshrined or legislated charter or bill of rights, the work of this committee is absolutely critical in informing not only members of this parliament, but in fact members, uh, people who live in this country about the human rights implications of legislation that is being considered by us here in this place. And it's very interesting that this annual report makes it clear that this is a technical scrutiny committee and that, in fact, the committee ought not consider the broader policy merits of legislation that it is examining. But not only is the committee under the chair considering the broader policy merits, it is also considering the broader political implications of legislation that the committee is examining. And that is a matter of extreme regret to me as someone who sat on this committee for about five years now. This committee has been politicised by the chair with the support of every single other government member of this committee. And I thank uh, Senator Green and her colleagues from the Labor Party, including the deputy chair uh, of this committee, Mr Perrett, um, for uh, their view that, in fact, uh, this committee should operate as a technical scrutiny committee. Now, I've made some public comments um, recently. I've made comments in this place on more than one occasion about the fact that this committee has been politicised by the chair. And in response, the chair has accused me of suggesting that the committee should rubber stamp the legal advice. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. I agree the committee ought not rubber stamp legal advice, but I want to place it firmly on the record that if the committee or any member of it wants to depart from the legal advice, then, then, uh, then uh, when departing from that advice, there should be given cogent, rational and coherent reasons why the committee is not acquiescing and to and supporting that legal advice. And that is not what we are seeing. The majority report, uh, the most recent majority report uh, of this committee uh, has significant departures from the independent legal advice that the committee relies on, with no rational, cogent or coherent reasons given as to why that advice should be departed from. So I want everyone in this place to know you cannot rely on you cannot necessarily rely on the majority reports of this committee if you want to know 
what the best advice is to the committee in regards to whether any particular piece of legislation is in accordance with Australia's international human rights obligations, I refer members to the dissenting reports that have already been issued and I have no doubt will need to continue to be issued by Labor and Greens members. It is extremely disappointing that the chair, for political purposes, has chosen to rampantly politicise this committee. And uh, I say again, uh, do not trust or rely upon the majority report of this committee for an unbiased and technical assessment of whether legislation complies with Australia's international human rights obligations. I truly hope that the chair, ch that the chair changes tack here and either relies on the legal advice or at least tries to mount a rational and coherent argument as to why that advice should be departed from in the future. I won't be holding my breath because I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be a good day for human rights in this country and a good day for people's capacity to understand human rights in this country if that was to occur. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator. The question is the motion moved by the chair be agreed to. The question is that the motion moved by the chair be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the 10th report of 2020 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, Human Rights Scrutiny Report, and move that the Senate take note of the report. I am pleased to table the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights 10th Scrutiny Report of 2020. As usual, this report contains a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. In this report, the committee considered 173 new legislative instruments and commented on two of these. For example, the committee seeks further information about the human rights compatibility of an instrument which exempts childcare workers from the JobKeeper wage subsidy and one which suspends an employee's right to workers' compensation in Nor Norfolk Island. For those who are unfamiliar with the work of the committee, I take this opportunity to reiterate that the committee has not formed a concluded view on the human rights implications of these instruments, as is the case with the committee's preliminary report on any bill or instrument. In addition, the committee makes concluding comments on two bills after receiving ministerial responses, including the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Strengthening Banning Orders Bill 2020. The committee considers that the bill, which would broaden the circumstances in which the NDIS commissioner could make a banning order in relation to NDIS providers and their current and former employees, is designed to help prevent the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of persons with disabilities and so promotes and protects the rights of persons with disabilities. The committee also notes that publishing on a register, which is available as a public website, the details of any employees who have been banned also engages and limits the rights to privacy. This right may be permissibly limited if it is shown to be reasonable, necessary and proportionate. The committee notes the legal advice that in assessing the proportionality of the measure, it is necessary to consider whether there are less restrictive rights or ways to achieve the same aim, such as making the register available on request to the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission rather than it being publicly available on a website by default, which of course provides easier access for people with disability. However, in this um, particular report, and I do uh, assume that there is no dissenting report, um, but I'm yet to find that out, it's only when the report is tabled, um, 
my expectation is that the committee has respectfully disagreed um, that it is appropriate to impose additional barriers on people with disabilities seeking to access information about band providers or employers, given the critical importance of protecting people with disability from abuse, violence, neglect or exploitation. If people with disability are required, for instance, to contact the Commission in order to obtain information about banned providers or employees, the committee considers this would impose an unacceptable additional administrative burden on people with disabilities, their families and carers, such that it might give rise to a real risk that people with disability may inadvertently engage a banned provider or employee. Accordingly, accordingly, we have concluded that the measure constitutes a proportionate limit on the right to privacy. In reaching this view, we appreciate that this involves balancing the competing rights of persons with disability with the right of privacy, but that protecting people with disability from abuse, violence, neglect or exploitation, including conduct so serious that it may result in the permanent injury or death of a person with disability is of paramount importance. In the committee reaching this conclusion, and as I say, I do this on, this on the basis that I don't believe there will be any dissenting report, and so I make my comments subject to that, I make the very important point in this instance that all committee members uh, have not, in all respects, accepted the advice of the independent legal adviser to the committee, advice that we obviously greatly value. Uh, in, in my view and in the view of the committee, uh, it cannot be justified that the rights to privacy of someone who's been banned for providing services as an NDIS provider or employee uh, prevail, and these are of, of course people who may have engaged in the most heinous of acts the most heinous of conduct, uh, those rights prevail over the rights to people with disability. And this is a matter of proportionality and a matter of consideration. And I do also say this as a former Assistant Minister for Disability Services, cognizant of the need to provide the maximum protection to NDIS participants and impose the least amount of administrative burden on participants. As I reiterated in, my, reiterated in my contribution yesterday, the committee considers the minister's response, the independent legal advice and other relevant material in its consideration of the compatibility of the bill or instrument with Australia's human rights obligations. In our parliamentary democracy, committee members are required to independently consider the human rights implications and that is our role in determining whether a legislative measure constitutes a permissible limitation on the specific human right. Uh, committee members are invariably required to weigh up various considerations, including competing human rights, as is the case here. So on this note, I want to reference the contributions in the, the debate today on the annual report of, of both Senator McKim and Senator Green, and also um, reference some very regrettable comments made by Senator McKim, as published in The Guardian yesterday, in an article entitled Greens Accused Coalition of Aiding and Abetting Formation of a Police and Surveillance State. And I want to firstly reject those very improper and inaccurate comments that have been made by Senator McKim in The Guardian, which has reflected on my motives in a most improper way, and accused me in relation to our consideration of the ASIO bill in Report 9 of 2020 of aiding and abetting the government building a police and surveillance state. These are really quite disgraceful comments. They are not supported by the facts. And I would ask Senator McKim, who is in the chamber right now, to withdraw those particular comments. Senator McKim also told The Guardian in relation to not accepting the legal advice in all respects in report number nine 
of 2020 that it beggars belief that the chair has once again ignored the independent legal advice. Well, that's inappropriate for a start because uh, in report number nine, uh, the coalition members of the committee did not in all respects accept the independent legal advice. And yesterday, despite what Senator McKim said, yesterday in this place I gave some very cogent reasons why well, Senator McKim says, I'll take the interjection, he says, no, I didn't. Well, in fact, I did. I gave some very cogent reasons as to why not in every respect did the legal advice be accepted by the coalition members. But it is quite hypocritical of Senator McKim to criticise coalition members of this committee for not accepting the legal advice in all respects. And he's made these comments on two occasions in this place and also to The Guardian, when in fact this report, all committee members, and I say this subject to there not being a dissenting report, all committee members appeared to have not accepted the legal advice in all respects um, and, of course, have determined that it is proportionate and it is proper that the rights of people with disability in this case prevail such that the measure is proportionate. So I do, uh, I, I do want to state very clearly my disappointment, particularly at the comments that Senator McKim has made. I, I have a lot of personal respect for Senator McKim, um, but I am very, very disappointed that he would reflect on my motives in such a way uh, including in making some what I think are completely disgraceful, disgraceful comments. Um, <clears throat> Madam Acting Deputy President, determining what is proportionate is not a black and white exercise. And I also say this in relation to Senator Green's contribution. It is Thank a you. matter of judgment. Thank you, and in this Thank you Senator Henderson. And, no, and in this report, we are, continu we are continuing yes, to do that. If I can just, by uh, leave. Your, just time, your time's expired. Thank you. Oh, you're seeking leave to, you're seeking leave to finish your comments. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for for one minute. So um, thank you very much. This conclusion demonstrates that it is correct and proper that the committee reaches its own conclusions without fear or favour, and under my chairmanship we will continue to do so. I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis, and with these comments I commend the report to the chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Are there any other contributions on this report? Uh, if not, the question is that the motion of the chair be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Are there any other reports? <clears throat> Senator Green. Uh, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for Scrutiny of Bills, I uh, present Scrutiny Digest 10 of 2020. Do you wish to move a motion in relation to that or just, just table, table it? Yep. Thank you, Senator Green. Are there any other committee reports? Um, are there any ministerial statements? Senator Hume. I table a document relating to the orders for production of documents concerning COVID-19 aged care cases. Senator Watt. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to take note of the response tabled by Minister Colbeck to the Senate's order to produce documents related to his failings as the Minister for Aged Care. Thank you, Senator Watt. Before I begin, I want to put on the record that my contribution will be short and the only one from Labor senators. Many of my colleagues wish to speak on this, but in the interests of allowing the chamber to function and return to government business as soon as possible, we will limit our remarks to say this. As of yesterday, 335 residents of aged care facilities in Australia had died from COVID-19. More than 1,100 older Australians were fighting active cases of the coronavirus. 
The Senate voted for transparency and accountability with this motion, two things that we have not seen from either Minister Colbeck or the Prime Minister at any stage during this unfolding tragedy. We thank the crossbench for their support of this motion yesterday. Unfortunately, Minister Colbeck's response that we've just received today should come as no surprise to anyone. Look at this. A tiny letter from Minister Colbeck, three-paragraph letter responding to the Senate's request uh, that he produce important documents which would reveal the scale of his and the government's failings in aged care. And on display in this letter is the same disdain, arrogance and apathy that has directly led to hundreds of preventable deaths in aged care homes under the Morrison government. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it many challenges for all Australians. This is especially true in our aged care facilities. But the challenges there weren't unfathomable, they weren't unforeseeable and they weren't inevitable. We have known for a long time that there are fundamental flaws in Australia's aged care sector as a result of this government's lack of care for elderly Australians. The warning bells were ringing loud and clear when the Royal Commission released its interim report titled Neglect. But Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, was not listening. COVID-19 then hit the Northern Hemisphere. It was clear that aged care homes were at risk. The warning bells were ringing. But again, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, was not listening. Then came Earlhaven, Dorothy Henderson Lodge, Newmarch House. More warning bells, but again, the Prime Minister was not listening. Australia's aged care workforce was placed under immense pressure due to a lack of training, funding and support by this Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. All of this was known and avoidable. Now, good government plans and good government acts. Bad government does neither. Bad government does nothing beyond self-preservation. Bad government lies and hides and runs away. And what we are seeing now is bad government. And it starts at the very top with the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. The Prime Minister chooses his cabinet. The Prime Minister chooses his ministry. The Prime Minister chose Senator Richard Colbeck to be in charge of aged care in this country. And the Prime Minister continues to support him in that role today. Despite every warning on this long march toward calamity, the Prime Minister left an incompetent junior minister in charge of the health and well-being of tens of thousands of vulnerable Australians. They now reap what they sow. If he had just listened, he wouldn't now be sidelining his own hand-picked minister after hundreds of preventable, tragic deaths have occurred. More people are dying every day. They're not just numbers in a report or a news scroll. They're our parents, our neighbours, our friends, our family. An entire generation of Australians whose health and well-being was put in the too hard basket by a prime minister and a minister who are not up to the job. I was told of a gentleman named Patrick who passed away last week. He was fit and healthy at 90, a man who loved his family dearly and who could answer more questions on who wants to be a millionaire than you or me. He thought he'd be safe from COVID-19 at his aged care home in Sunbury. His daughter describes Minister Colbeck's, quote, complete lack of care and concern as a complete slap in the face. We mourn Patrick and every life lost by this, horrible, by this horrible virus. These deaths are reported through facts and figures today, but we can't fathom how it will be felt in time. Family stories never told, memories never made. Children and grandchildren whose lives are emptier today 
because bad government is easier than good government. It says something about Minister Colbeck that he can so casually defy the will of the Senate through his response here today. He can't answer questions. He can't produce documents. He can't even come to the chamber and deliver his own three-paragraph response. It is pathetic, Senator McAllister. It is pathetic. We have an aged care system in crisis run by a pathetic, incompetent minister. The see something, say nothing minister with no plan and no action. He is the quietest of the quiet Australians when the topic is the bare basics of his job. This was preventable. This was avoidable. This did not have to be. What will it take for this Prime Minister to publicly acknowledge that thing he's done privately, and that is bench Minister Colbeck due to his sheer incompetence? The Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for his failings and the failings of his minister. We are all wondering now, what does this minister do? He's had core responsibilities stripped from him because his own Prime Minister knows he's not up to the job. But he continues to draw a ministerial salary paid by the taxpayers of Australia. Senator Richard Colbeck is in fact Australia's most expensive job keeper. Australians are paying far too high a price for Minister Richard Colbeck. He has to go. We've seen hundreds of avoidable deaths, more than a thousand elderly Australians fighting the virus today. Overworked and undersupported staff waging war against a shocking disease with no training and a single glove. That's the kind of PPE that our aged care workers have been provided with. Not even two gloves, because not enough PPE has been supplied by this government. The Australian people deserve better than this. Our grandparents deserved better. Our parents deserved better. And instead, they got this Morrison government and this incompetent minister. He has to go. Thank you, Senator. Are there any more uh, speakers? If not, Yes. Um, the motion uh, before us is whether we note and support the motion moved by Senator Watt. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, declare it carried. Clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senators McAllister and Waters, proposing the disallowance of an industry research and development instrument. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the motion. Well, there is one party in this chamber that wants Queenslanders to pay more for their electricity, and their name is the Liberal National Party. This government's preference for endless culture Senators. wars and stunts over real policy, real outcomes has seen them brush Senator aside Esker. every conceivable concern with the proposed new coal-fired power station in Collinsville. They've brushed aside concerns about whether the business case stacks up. They've brushed aside concerns about the environment. They've brushed aside concerns about whether it will raise energy prices. And they've brushed aside concerns about the probity of the project. And it makes you wonder, doesn't it? It makes you wonder what would happen if they showed the same commitment to protecting older Australians in aged care as they have shown to progressing a project that even the Queensland LNP opposition doesn't believe deserves public Your funds. Party. This project does not stack up economically. And if it goes ahead, it will increase power prices for Queenslanders and leave taxpayers on the hook for billions. And this isn't back of the envelope analysis. It is the considered opinion of industry and experts. The weight of analysis says that new 
coal-fired power stations in Queensland would increase power prices because it is more expensive to build and more expensive to run than alternatives. Independent analysis you, undertaken by consultants Energy Edge found a new ultra-supercritical coal-fired power station was only commercially viable if there were high wholesale prices. And let that sink in, because that's what these people are arguing for. And it reflects what analysts have been saying generally about new coal-fired power. Bloomberg New Energy Finance says even if the government were to completely de-risk coal by paying for the whole plant and guaranteeing an exemption from any future liabilities, the lowest cost of energy that could be achieved is still well above wind, solar or gas. AIG, AIG says new coal-fired generators are unlikely to bring current prices down because they require even higher prices to be bankable. They are a poor fit to stabilise the grid. Why don't we have a look at what the Prime Minister said? Yeah. What did Mr Morrison say when he was the Treasurer? He said, we shouldn't kid ourselves that a new heli coal plant would bring down electricity prices any time soon. And why? Why? Because, as Mr Morrison went on to say, new cheap coal is a bit of a myth. That's his words. His words, not mine. So not only is the government putting almost $4 million of taxpayer funds to investigate the feasibility of what the Prime Minister has described as a myth, the public could be on the hook for billions, billions more for this project. Shine Energy have requested that the government provide an indemnity against climate risk, and the Australian Industry Group has estimated that this could cost the government $17 billion. That would be on top of whatever other contribution of public money would be required to actually build this multi-million billion dollar project. And Senator Canavan and others supporting this project should be upfront with Australians about just how much it will cost them. Now that is only if the plant ends up being built. And the government knows that the project doesn't stand up unlikely to be built and the promised jobs will not materialise. Senator Canavan and others are out there in the media saying that a new coal-fired power plant will generate jobs for Queensland. Well, it's not what his colleagues think. Mr Zimmerman, Mr Sharma, Mr Falinski have all gone on the record to say that the project does not stack up economically or environmentally and it won't go ahead. As Mr Falinski says, and I'll quote him, this will not lead to a new coal-fired power station being built because there are more economically efficient and environmentally cleaner options for power generation in Australia. Now, it's backed up by the analysis from the Australian Energy Council, that is the peak body for electricity generators and retailers, and they found that there was not a pressing commercial case for the construction of a coal-fired generator in North Queensland. In fact, the government came to a very similar conclusion. The government this government has a specific program to underwrite new generation investment. And when this project submitted its business case, it wasn't strong enough even to be shortlisted, let alone offered a grant. And how'd the government get around this? Well, Minister Taylor's department announced that Shine would get a grant for a feasibility study into Collinsville, and then two days later invited the company to apply for the grant. Now, it's the reversal of the usual order of things, isn't it? Because normally, normally you invite applications and then you announce the results. It's unusual enough that the Auditor-General has agreed to investigate it, meaning that Minister Taylor's actions are subject to yet another property investigation, an experience he must be deeply familiar with by now. And even the Queensland LNP opposition has declined to commit public funds for the project. Those opposite are playing a cruel hoax on the people of Queensland. The promised jobs do not exist. They exist in the press releases, stunts and media statements of those opposite. And you listen to what Mr Zimmerman, Mr Sharma and Mr Falinski have said, because they have been very clear. They have said that this project does not stack up and it will never proceed. But there are jobs in energy for North Queensland and, indeed, across Australia. They are real jobs being generated by real investments in renewable energy right now. And in Queensland, 40 large-scale renewable projects have commenced operating, Senators. are currently being constructed or have been financially committed. There are solar parks in Wide Bay, Darling Downs, Mackay, Chinchilla, Clare, Barcaldon, Claremont, Toowoomba and Warwick. 
There are even renewable projects in Senators. Collinsville, the site of this ill-fated new proposal. Thank you. In total, the projects across the state total $7.5 billion in investment, with a forecast of more than 6,000 construction jobs arising as a result. And there are more large-scale projects in the pipeline, more than 20, uh, 20 megawatts worth, which have the potential to generate another 28,000 jobs for Queenslanders. Just last week, the state government committed hundreds of millions for renewable energy zones, and this could help fund projects such as a two gigawatt wind, solar, storage and transmission project dubbed the Central Queensland Power, which will assist Gladstone to support its heavy industry and stimulate the development of new industries such as green hydrogen. Renewals, renewables have the potential to create export income as well. An undersea cable from a planned major solar farm project in the Northern Territory could supply Singapore with sustainable energy by 2027. It has been described as the largest solar farm and the largest battery under development anywhere in the world. It's not a pipe dream. It's been granted major project status by the Northern Territory government. The thing is that Australia's rich natural resources give us the opportunity to be a renewable energy superpower, exporting into our region. And you'd think that would be of interest to a government that claims to be interested in jobs, but instead they are obsessed with a feasibility study for a new power station that doesn't stack up. And what more can you expect from a man who found time to bring a lump of coal into parliament as a stunt, but who leads a party that has 19 separate energy policies in seven years? And the government's lack of an energy policy is projected to cost this country 11,000 renewable energy jobs in the next two years. Well, enough is enough. The government has shown over the last seven years that they are indifferent to our international commitments. They are ambivalent about the risks that climate change pose to our natural world and our way of life, and they are hostile to renewable energy. They are environmental vandals, and they can add economic vandals to their CV as well. The government's obsession with stunts will raise electricity prices for Queensland and cost the nation thousands of jobs in renewables. Thank you, Senator. Senator Waters has a call. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are again. It's deja vu. The Greens are begging the Chamber to not give yet more free public money to fossil fuel donors. We're really proud to be co-sponsoring this disallowance motion, um, which is just cooked from whichever angle you look at it. So the chamber could actually stand in the way. We could do our job and properly allocate public money, $3.3 million of taxpayer money, and we could stop it being allocated to coal, and we could block this climate-destroying coal-fired power station from going ahead. Um, what has happened here is a thoroughly inexperienced company has proposed a coal-fired power station and a feasibility study for same in the middle of a climate crisis after the nation just had the most destructive bushfires that our history has ever recorded. And we here in the Senate have the ability to stop this rotting and stop this destruction. And that's precisely why the Greens are moving this uh, disallowance. So not only is it cooked to give public money to a coal fire power station in a climate crisis after those bushfires, but it is cooked to dish out public money as a pre-election slush fund to try to shore up your own power. Unfortunately, we've seen quite a bit of that, and I'll come back to that point. But surprise, surprise, the company that would get this windfall gain, Shine Energy, has connections with mega political donor and coal uh, giant Glencore. And, you know, incidentally, Glencore would directly benefit from the power station's construction, and it's been lobbying the government to support SAME and to support the coal industry. But it gets worse. Shine Energy has no relevant experience. They couldn't get funding from any existing program. And so the government just created an entirely new grants fund. And then the government awarded it to Shine Energy two or three days before the money had even been applied for. I'll go through the, the, the dates. On the 8th of February, 
fantastic day for anyone born on that day, such as myself. Minister Taylor announced that Shine would receive up to $4 million of public money for a feasibility study into a so-called low emissions coal-fired power plant, which is the biggest misnomer of the century. And then two days later, Shine Energy was asked to apply. It's two days after they've been announced as the winner of this public money. And this is despite the fact that stakeholders, including the Queensland government, have strongly questioned either the need for and the validity of a power station. Um, but no, the government just charged on regardless and they set up the Supporting Reliable Energy Infrastructure Program and then they developed guidelines specific to the Collinsville Power Station and then they asked only Shine Energy to apply for that money. So this is despite the fact that Shine's got no relevant experience, no past projects, Project's been rejected by Ungi um, for funding. And since the funding has been announced, Shine's already said that it's not even enough money. They're going to need more public money to do a feasibility study. Well, I was trying to think of an analogy here. It would be like me asking for public money to open a video store, something that I've never done before and that nobody wants because we have more efficient alternatives. But the only difference in that analogy is, of course, I'm not a massive donor to the LNP, and nor am I promising them a cushy job once they leave Parliament. So we've seen in this uh, too long history of this cooked government, grants awarded with no criteria. We've seen grants awarded that ignored the criteria but happened to be in marginal seats just before an election. And now we've got a grant awarded with criteria that's been specifically drafted to justify a winner that's already been chosen. This is exactly why we need a Senate inquiry into all of these pre-election slush funds. And that's on uh, the books for next week, and I'll be having some conversations with my colleagues about this latest example of the need for more scrutiny of how this government is misusing taxpayer dollars to shore up their own flailing political fortunes uh, in a climate crisis to give it to uh, coal-fired power. And it doesn't escape anyone's notice that this latest scandal is by serial offender, Minister Angus Taylor. Uh, and it's nothing more than a misuse of taxpayer funds to prop up fossil fuels. Well, we can save everyone a little bit of money on a feasibility study. It is not feasible to build a new coal-fired power station in an already crowded market in a climate crisis. None of the experts are saying this is economically feasible. Nobody wants to put in any money to fund it. And the previous speaker just noted how the Prime Minister himself had acknowledged that this wasn't even a viable option. So <laughs> public money should not be wasted on fanciful, uh, self-interested projects. This sort of money should be spent on supporting workers to retrain uh, workers who are watching the coal industry dwindle and are worried about their futures. And we want to make sure they're looked after and retrained and supported into new industries that have a long term future and that won't damage their health um, with black lung syndrome. But this sort of money could be used to shore up um, and to re establish a domestic manufacturing base. Um, Central Queensland and North Queensland could be building solar panels and wind turbines. We could be then mandating the use of those locally built components in clean energy projects. We could be putting money into public housing to end homelessness. We could be investing in clean energy and giving young people uh, the chance to find work as we recover from a global pandemic. There is nothing low emissions about a coal fire power station. And yet this is the so-called emissions reduction minister who's championing a highly polluting coal fire power station. One renewable energy expert has, uh, uh, commentator has described this as $3.6 million to a company that lacks the competency to pull off a project that will never stack up. And so this is just yet, yet another pre-election slush fund with taxpayer dollars to try to shore up seats. We all know the Nats needed an announceable in the lead up to the last election, um, but this project is such a dog that not even the Queensland LNP want money to go to it. They have already distanced themselves from it. So I'm afraid uh, 
uh, former Minister Canavan and his uh, national counterparts are really out on their own on this one, which is exactly why this money should be disallowed. Um, Arena is running out of money in a few months, and they've had a billion dollars stripped from their budget, thanks to, uh, sadly, Liberal and Labor teaming up in the last parliament. That's $3.6 million that this grant uh, could be usefully and meaningfully uh, allocated to. So this coal fire power station will never get built. The Liberal backbenchers know it. The Prime Minister even knows it. Um, and even uh, Labor's spokesperson on, I think it's mining, surprise, surprise, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon knows it. No investor is going to sink money into a steam turbine technology in one of the most congested parts of the grid in the world um, when the world is acting on global warming. This company has not even built a fence, let alone a coal fire power station. The only people that are clueless enough to commit money to this project is the current bunch of cabinet ministers who take donations from the coal industry, who probably will go off and work for the coal industry once they leave parliament, and who are using somebody else's money to pay for it. Your money, taxpayer money. This is a culture war and taxpayer money is being frittered as a result. This feasibility study is going to tell us what everybody knows, um, it is a waste of money, and it's a waste of money that could be better spent on actually creating real jobs, not phantom fake promises, but real jobs for regional Queenslanders like they deserve, like they need. We could be spending it on manufacturing. We could be spending it on building clean energy components. We could be spending it on schools and hospitals to give people the services that they deserve and that they pay for. This is taxpayer money. Even outfits like the AIG, um, the AI group, have said that it will never happen. And again, I think uh, the previous senator mentioned that if there was proper indemnification of this project against future carbon liabilities, if we ever have a carbon price brought back in in this nation, like we did 10 years ago when we had world leading climate laws, it would be $17 billion in payments that would be required. The reason that we have this slush fund that's been proposed and announced as an election commitment and then hastily patched up and uh, a whole special grant created um, and allocated to a company that's got zero experience doing this sort of thing is the millions of dollars in donations that the Liberal, National and Labor parties, I might add, receive from the coal industry, from the fossil fuel industry. The government is actually, with this proposal, standing in the way of the wave of clean, lasting, reliable jobs that could be created if public mon money um, and private money was invested in genuinely clean, renewable energy, not the nonsense that is low emissions coal. As I said before, it's the biggest misnomer in history. And if this coal firepower plant were miraculously to go ahead, massively subsidised by the taxpayer in an age of a climate crisis, um, not creating anywhere near uh, the jobs that that region needs, then it will actually drive regional jobs out of regional Queensland. The climate impacts that could flow from yet more coal in the system would further endanger the tourism industry, the agriculture industry and any other industry that relies on a livable, safe climate. The government's got a choice here. They could see reason, they could listen to uh, almost every single expert on this topic and understand that this is a dog of an investment. It is a waste of public money. Some of their own backbenchers are in the papers today acknowledging that. And they could actually redirect this money into where it will genuinely do good, where it will help people, where it will create jobs, where it will invest in the sort of services that people deserve. This is yet another test for the government that I fear they will fail because sadly they are dominated by a rump of climate denying dinosaurs who accept donations from the coal and gas and oil industry, who are concerned about their own future employment prospects 
lining up lobbying jobs with uh, industry representative bodies or directly with companies, as we have already seen happen in the last 10, 20 years. Um, and they're getting in the way of actually a livable climate for all of us and a prosperous economy that creates jobs in areas of regional Queensland that are desperate for a plan for what comes next when the rest of the world continues to turn away from our dirty coal. Um, this is the sort of choice that the government has before us. This is why um, the Greens, and thankfully joined by Labor uh, this time around, um, although I suspect they've got just a little bit of internal uh, dissent on this matter. We'll see how long they can hold the ship together on, 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 this, uh, on this issue. But we've got a chance here to ensure that public money is spent wisely, to ensure that it doesn't worsen the climate crisis, to ensure that it doesn't go to a two-bit company that's never done anything like this before, but that has some convenient connections to a big political donor. This is the chance that the Senate's got to disallow this instrument. And I understand that, um, you know, we've got 15 sitting days for, for this to be laid on the table before we, we have the chance to vote on this issue. Um, but our, our, uh, our position has always been very clear. We do not support public money going to prop up an industry that is damaging all of us and damaging the natural world. So I'm really proud to be um, co-sponsoring the disallowance of this uh, instrument. And what I hope will happen next week when um, we bring on a suggestion for a Senate inquiry into all of the different rorts and grants funds that this government has established in the lead up to the last election to try to shore up their own flailing fortunes, I hope that we get some support uh, from uh, across the chamber. Because it is clear that this government has no respect for public money. It's simply using your money to do favours for its corporate mates, who then, in a bizarre sort of washing machine move, donate money back to those same, um, that same coalition. So, you know, let's do the right thing here, folks. We've got the chance to have a good outcome, to use public money to help people and invest in projects that um, can stack up and can address the climate crisis, um, help make people's lives better. Uh, let's go for it, hey? Thanks, Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. The next speaker will be Senator McKenzie, followed by Senator Roberts and then Senator Davey. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, as leader of the National Party, to stand in the chamber tonight and speak against the disallowance moved by one of the great coalitions, the Labor Party and the Australian Greens. Was there any greater uh, example of what Queenslanders actually think about a feasibility study into the Collinsville uh, high efficiency, low emission uh, coal fired power station? Just look at the federal election results. Just check them out. The LNP rocked it in. And can I say, central and northern Queensland absolutely stood behind initiatives such as this that our government put on the table, took to the election, and we are very proud to deliver on looking into the feasibility study of whether this power station should actually be built and therefore drive down power prices for Queenslanders so that they can enjoy uh, a post-COVID-19 recovery plan from this government that does include advanced manufacturing. So we are not just talking about the potential new jobs that the power station will bring nor the mining jobs that getting the coal for this power station will bring, but indeed those value-adding industries out in regional Queensland from an advanced manufacturing plan that this government has uh, post-COVID that needs low-cost uh, low energy to power and drive it. Look, for those of you who can't see the chamber tonight, we've got a full bench of the Greens. We've got a pretty full bench from the National and the Liberal parties and the LNP Senate team. But it is cooey crickets on the Labor side of the chamber tonight. Other than the Labor senator that moved this disallowance, let's be fair, there is not a Queenslander in sight tonight. And you know why? You know why? They tried to pull this motion. They tried to pull away from that. No, no, the Greens, no, Senator Waters, we've, we've locked you in. We know the Greens, Queenslanders are here. Trouble is, regional Queensland doesn't vote for you. So, 
I just want to read from uh, this morning's Courier Mail. There might be a reason we don't have a Queensland senator here to actually speak uh, for this feasibility study. And it's not very often, senators, that I agree with the old uh, CFMEU. Sometimes the forestry division in my home state of Victoria can get excited about the sustainable and renewable uh, forestry industry that the Greens and now the Labor Party want to end. But can I just talk about what happened in Queensland and why there is not a Labor Party senator here to stand up for this disallowance? It is appalling. It's not just Joel Fitzgibbon and Otis Group that's cottoned on to what's wrong with the Labor Party. All of the Labor senators know that they have lost their way, that they do not stand for the working class in this country anymore, and that who stands for jobs in the regions, jobs in traditional industries and jobs in the mining industry and construction industry, it is the LNP, it is the Liberal Party and it is the National Party, and we are very proud to do that. So what does the CFMEU, the Mining and Construction Division, do today? They walked away. They walked away. I, I'm happy to quote Senator Scar. I'm happy because, as the union boss Michael Ravbar said, the leadership vacuum in the left has seen a once powerful voice for working Queenslanders atrophy to the point where today it is little more than a crèche for party hacks. Now that you could have been quoting Senator Matt Canavan, you could have been quoting Senator Matt Canavan, but no, that is the Mining and Construction Division of Queensland. Now we've also he goes on the left, left faction, which is the powerful ally of the Australian Greens and running the Labor Party. Poor old Joel Fitzgibbon, a true believer, representing coal mining country, trying to do his best to hold back the tide. Um, I'm happy to send him a membership form to the National Party. The left faction, as Mr Ravbar goes on, is now merely an impotent and self-serving echo chamber for a cabal of Peel Street elite who have totally lost touch with their working class roots. I couldn't have said it better myself. I just would have substituted Spring Street. Uh, you know, and he goes on and on and on. And those of us in this chamber that actually care about uh, working Australians, that actually care to see growth and development in industries that underpin regional economies and our export tasks, uh, know how important the mining industry is and how important it is in this country to have cheap, uh, reliable power. You'll hear those opposite talk about all the jobs available in renewable energy, uh, all the jobs that are available, but what we've seen it do is push up energy prices in this country. And our government is absolutely committed to meeting our international commitments on emissions, keeping jobs in regional Australia and, gro and growth and uh, economic underpinning industries, and also ensuring we get the price of electricity down. Because you cannot run manufacturing plant lines uh, if you keep getting breaks in your electricity. It just doesn't work. In my home state, and I'm sure it is the same, the Queensland senators tonight are loud and proud on the floor of the Senate standing up for their state and getting this feasibility uh, study done. But I think you know, even in uh, you know, you have a break, I think, of about 15 seconds and can cost you up to hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So reliability is important. And you know what? They don't want to actually understand that. They want to talk about the fact that solar renewables doesn't provide you with the reliability yet. That is a fact. Senator Waters, it is a scientific fact. And I look forward to prosecuting this. I hope we have 15 days, uh, these guys, to disallow this motion. I hope we get to do this every single day, because we have speakers lined up on this side of the chamber, lined up to stand up for our policy. But it is cooey crickets and, uh, on, at the Labor Party. So we're not surprised that Greens all want to take their 15 minutes of fame to talk about uh, why this is a bad thing for Queensland. Go for it. Go for it. Knock yourselves out because you hold so many seats. You really speak for particularly regional Queensland. Have you checked out your vote? They, uh, they walk away from you. They walk away from you. Um, an independent strategic study has found system strength is a real thank you, Senator Scar. I hope you get an opportunity tonight to make that contribution. 
The, the independent strategic study has found system strength is a real concern in central and north Queensland, and new synchronous generation like coal, gas or pumped hydro is a priority to meet the energy needs of the region. The only evangelicals in this particular public debate are the Greens and are the Labor Party that only see one way to produce electricity. Here on our side, we are not uh, acolytes to one particular form of energy generation. We accept renewables have a role—solar, hydro, wind. We also understand and appreciate the increasing uh, contribution that gas will make. And we look to state governments to get serious about opening up that resource so that we can build a 21st century advanced manufacturing system in this country like the great Black Jack McEwen did through the 50s and 60s post-war. Great man. Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, we also understand that coal uh, has a role, and I was very excited today to see that the New South Wales state government has lifted uh, the moratorium on uranium. So watch this space. We've got a really exciting technological solutions for our country that are going to put world-class science to the task of low emission, high energy uh, production that will power our communities and our industries going forward. So, absolutely, Senator Senator um, Senator McMahon. Thank you so much from the NT. You've got a lot of uranium in your space and place. Um, so I'm proud we're delivering on that election commitment. I know everybody is excited to talk about uh, how we're doing that. I thank the minister. I know that um, Michelle Landry in uh, central Queensland in Rockhampton was out today on this particular topic. I know Senator Matt Canavan, incredibly passionate about this project. We hope the feasibility uh, study stacks up, but you know what? If it doesn't, well, then we'll make the sensible decision of how to use our taxpayer taxpayer dollars. At least we will have the facts at hand instead of, instead of blindly following the religion of catastrophic climate change and, and also not fully appreciating that doing your due diligence with taxpayers' money, understanding that the public has a right to go to work in, in sustaining and exciting uh, long-term careers out in the regions that includes the mining industry, and it is very, very tragic tonight that here, as we debate the future of mining in this country, that we could not find one Queensland senator from a great mining state to actually stand up and put uh, their voice to this motion. Uh, senator. Uh, Lab S S senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I wonder whether people know that Liberal, Labor, Nationals, Greens, climate policies and renewable subsidies are costing households $13 billion every year. That's $1,300 per household. I wonder whether Senator McAllister is aware of the growing anger within the Parliamentary Labor Party towards new Labor's insane anti-coal position, killing workers' jobs and killing Australian industry. At least the new Labor Party, in abandoning blue-collar workers, abandoning small businesses, abandoning large employers in trade-exposed industries, abandoning mine workers, abandoning rural communities, abandoning manufacturers and abandoning families, city and rural families, across our country is clear in its message. I wonder what, Senator, uh, what sorry, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon thinks of this disallowance motion from New Labor. What about Senator Stirl, Senator Gallagher, Senator Farrell? These senators are trying to be true to their working roots, yet find it increasingly difficult facing the unicorns who ride their rainbow-coloured bikes to Parliament in a vain attempt to mimic their virtue signalling yet hollow greens. These senators try to put the U back in Labor, vainly, and we support them. I've just acknowledged the quote myself from, Senator, uh, from Mr. Michael Ravba and the head of the CFMMEU in Queensland. The Greens, he says, sorry, the Labor Party, he says, is a crash for the party hacks. Labor is a crash for party hacks. Lost touch with the working, working uh, with workers. The Greens, 
Well, it's now day 352 since I last challenged Senator Waters to debate me, and she still won't debate me. It's day 352 since I asked her to provide the empirical scientific evidence for doing something about human carbon dioxide. And all she can do is shriek climate crisis. No data, no facts. Here's what drives One Nation. Facts, not slogans. Facts. And Senator McKenzie, uh, through you, Acting Deputy President, Senator McKenzie mentioned the, the uh, New South Wales Parliament lifted the, the ban on United Nations on, on uranium mining. That was driven by Mark Latham from One Nation. So here are some facts. 39% of electricity bills are due to climate policies that have driven $8 billion in private sector malinvestment, destabilizing and destroying baseload power. These costs are the work of respected economist Dr. Alan Moran, who used the government's own data, and this cannot, thus cannot be sensibly refuted. Energy intensive industries and value adding food processing and mineral processing are moving to countries with cheap energy like China, India and Asia, who use our high quality co clean coal to generate cheap power, while the same power from our clean coal under Australian climate policies has a price three times as high, thanks to Liberal, Labor, Nationals and Greens. Australia once had the world's cheapest electricity, yet now prices are amongst the world's highest. Manufacturing in our country has dropped from 17% of our national economy in the 1980s to now be just 6%, and many hundreds of thousands of blue-collar work jobs have been sent overseas. And the Greens, the Greens say we could be rebuilding manufacturing, like China, that uses coal, hydro and nuclear, and has one third the cost for electricity because it doesn't have the Greens, Labor, Liberals and Nationals climate policies and subsidies. As a kid, I, I rode in first year high school on my bike from the bush, we lived in the bush and cycled every day to school. We rode past the Curry Curry aluminium smelter in the Hunter Valley. That was built in the Hunter Valley because of cheap, reliable, stable, secure, environmentally responsible coal-fired power in the Hunter. It's now shut due to climate policies, driving power prices to double what they were just 10 years ago. Kaput, gone, and gone are the jobs. Climate policies are ravaging agriculture after stealing farmers' rights to use their own land thanks to the uh, policies that were put in place by Prime Minister John Howard's government and, and uh, John Anderson's government. This is destroying food security and increasing food prices. High electricity prices are gutting manufacturing, gutting agriculture, gutting small and gutting large businesses. A nation's productive capacity, economic sovereignty, economic re resilience are being decimated and turning our country from being independent to dependence on other nations. Climate alarmists are pushing policies aimed at fundamentally decarbonising the economy from 2050. That means de-industrialising Australia. Such a radical change with severe consequences on lifestyle and livelihoods should be based on extraordinary evidence, empirical data from solid measurement and with specified, quantified impacts which must first justify fundamental change. High cost policies need solid scientific evidence as justification for the policies whose impacts must be specified before implementation and measured during implementation. None of this has been done in this country. And I'll discuss this next week. For now, I'll discuss some of the specifics from the Moran Report's insights into electricity prices. The government claims that the, the proportion of, of uh, household electricity bills due to renewables is $90 a year. Dr. Moran's report, which cannot be sensibly refuted because it includes the government's own information, says direct costs of 536 per family, per household. The total costs per household are $1,300. The additional cost of climate policies and our power bills is not the 6.5% that the government claims, it's 39%. Renewables distort low-cost coal-based power and more than double the wholesale electricity price from $45.50 to $92.50. China and India use our clean coal to sell electricity at $0.08 cents a kilowatt. Australia is three times that, $0.25 cents a kilowatt hour. 
all Australians have a right to benefit from our rich natural resources. The true cost of electricity, Australians need to know, would be $13 billion per year less if cheap, affordable, reliable coal production was not lumbered with policies that distort the market toward expensive and unreliable wind and solar. These renewables or intermittents destroy jobs, kill productive capacity and waste investment. As I said, Dr Moran uses the government's own data and can't be sensibly refuted. And what he's also found out is that this data, while it's still available, is not easily found by the layman because it used to be consolidated, no longer. It's, hi it's hidden so that people can't see the real cost of these um, intermittent energy sources that create artificially high electricity and energy prices, savage our living standards and undermine our economic resilience and competitiveness. And that's going to be needed during COVID recovery. Ironically, in the last 170 years, we have got away from being at the whim of nature, famines, impacts of climate, impacts of weather. We've become independent of that. Now we're going back to weather dependent wind and solar. And we've got $8 billion per year in private investment diverted to these, these inefficient destroyers of, of, uh, of industry. And after two decades, these, these uh, generators still continue to receive subsidies. After 20 years, without, without subsidies, renewables remain unviable and are a parasitic malinvestment on our energy systems. And why do I say parasitic? Well, they kill their hosts, the people of Australia. Wind and solar have inherently high consumption of resources for, and very low energy density, which means it's even less efficient. For a coal power station, it needs 35 tonnes of steel per kilowatt hour generated. Wind requires 543 tonnes of steel per kilowatt hour generated. That's why they're such inherently high cost items. Weather dependent, wind and solar will never move beyond dependent parasitic infants and taxpayers who will forever pay for the inherent deficiencies. Climate policies and renewables are a malinvestment in the economy. If the same money was invested in the real economy, it would increase productivity, jobs and health. For every subsidised green, so-called green energy job, 2.2 jobs are lost elsewhere in the real economy or could have been created in the real economy with that same money that's wasted on subsidised green energy jobs. They're parasitic and they're killing their host. There's been a study by the former head of the Bureau of Agricultural Economics using the government's model that he has updated, Dr. Brian Fisher. He, his study of renewables sh showed that Labor's 50% renewable energy target would cause Australia to lose income between now and 2030 of $1.2 trillion. That's more than half of this year's gross domestic product. So we'd be basically working for the next half of the year and it would be wiped out in the next nine years just from the renewable energy target. Think about these facts. It would require a price, an electricity price of $157 per megawatt hour, more than double what it was in 2016. Plus, think about this, Labor Party. Wages would be cut 23% below what they would have been and there would be 568,000 fewer jobs. And the biggest falls would be in coal, oil and gas and energy intensive industries and export, uh, export uh, off offset industries. But the Liberals Nationals policy is to increase intermittence 40% above the current to 28%, more than half of Labor's. That would also be devastating. One nation has zero intermittence, zero renewables, zero subsidies. That's because we are the party of the worker. We are the party of the investor, the party of the small businessman and woman. Long, Labor is no longer the party of the worker. The Greens never were. The Liberals, Nationals were, never were. And the Queensland Premier, I ask you, who looks after Queenslanders when you've got an absurd 50% renewable policy? Uh, the Queensland Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, has committed to Queensland having a 50% renewables and intermittence target. She sneers at the plight of coal miners, 
farmers and all Queenslanders who use electricity, all families who use electricity. Deb Frecklington, her opponent, commits Queensland to higher levels of intermittent. Senator Canavan spins like a wind turbine, at first a climate sceptic, then in Cabinet, a believer who spoke of the anti-coal need to cut carbon dioxide from human activity. Then facing the exodus of voters from the Nationals and finding him outside Cabinet, started murmuring for coal. The Liberal Nationals are split into three groups. The Zimmerman Wets, wanting to embrace Green's policy and serve the United Nations strategies to achieve UN goals. Secondly, the true Liberals and Nationals who want to return to serving Australia, a shrinking yet nonetheless admirable group containing people like Craig Kelly, Lou O'Brien, Senators Rennick, Abetz, Fierra Venti Wells. And then we have the somersaulters, the third group, like Mr Barnaby Joyce and Senator Canavan, who say one thing before entering Cabinet, say the opposite in Cabinet, and then after leaving Cabinet, meekly try to squeeze out pro coal words. What to believe of this assorted combination? And then we have these additional costs just coming on board today, introduced in the lower house today, I believe. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation bill being introduced, an extra billion dollars to upgrade transmission and grid security due to destabilising intermittent wind and solar sources. That's half the cost of a new coal-fired power station. And coal-fired power stations do not need stabilising because their power, like hydro and nuclear, is synchronous, it's stable. What about the cost of the Howard Liberal National Government's stated desire to comply with the UN's Kyoto Proto Climate Protocol in 1996 that led to the stealing of farmers' rights to, to use their land that they paid for, that the farmers paid for. In 1996, in Canberra, the Liberal Prime Minister, the National's Deputy Prime Minister, the Liberal Environment Minister, uh, Senator Robert Hill, did a partnership deal with the Queensland National's Premier Borbidge and Ministers Little Proud and Hobbs, a Liberal National Consortium. They did a deal uh, to call the Partnership Agreement. Then Mr Howard and his government did a deal with Premier Beattie from the Labor Party, then Premier Bly. And on that foundation did Anastasia Palaszczuk and Jackie Trad build their latest strangling of farmers' rights to use the land that those farmers bought and own lawfully but cannot use. And why do Queensland's Premier and Labor Party remain silent on the theft of one and a half billion dollars each year from Queensland electricity users due to high power prices under the corporatized Queensland electricity supply. What a shameful mess. What we need to do is to build a coal-fired power station. We're very pleased that the Liberal Nationals are now supporting coal, at least in words and in a feasibility study. One Nation says build the damn thing now. Get on with it. Actions speak louder than words. And we invite the Liberal Nationals to review the facts on climate and to reverse all climate policies. Stop shrieking climate crisis like the Greens. Stop all destruction of our nation's vital electricity supply. Get real. This disallows Thank motion. You, Senator insanity. Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Senator Davey. Thank you. What we're seeing today is a dark day for working men and women across Australia and particularly in the regions. Because what we see today is Labor, the party born of central Queensland, the party born of workers, turn its back on both its history and contemporary workers of today. It is like their connection to their roots died along with the famed tree of knowledge, like that tree that was maliciously poisoned the Labor Party is now being poisoned by green ideology. To think, we now have a party born in Var Colden, Queensland, that fantastic central Queensland community, that is allowing the New South Wales socialist left faction to lead the Greens in a motion to deny Queenslanders jobs to deny an entrepreneurial Indigenous enterprise an opportunity to prove the business case for those jobs and to deny the potential development of reliable and affordable power. I wonder how Senator Murray Watt—oh, that's right, he's left, isn't he? Yeah. Or Senator Nita Green—oh, what faction chief? 
I wonder how they feel, though, about being told what industries they can have in their state by their New South Wales branch. It is no wonder, as referred to by my colleague, Senator Mackenzie, the CFMEU in Queensland have quit the Labor left faction. But I say that's not going far enough, because what today shows us is that the rest of Labor is being led by the nose by the left. They are being led to side with the Greens and to disregard workers their very roots. It is no wonder that the CFMEU's Queensland Mining Division has vowed to stop donating to Labor and will instead fund candidates committed to our strong and viable resource industries, because those industries support Queensland. They support our nation. They support our economy. We have heard time and time again that our economic recovery will be led by the regions, including forestry, agriculture and mining, the very industries Labor has turned its back on. And in these industries, there are jobs. It is through these industries that we produce our key exports and bring in billions for our economy. But Labor continue to prove they've got no regard for these jobs or these industries, particularly in Queensland. The new Ackland mine has been waiting for an approval to expand their mine since 2007. There are 150 jobs, immediate jobs, direct jobs, contingent on that approval. But Labor doesn't care about those jobs. As they've proved, when they voted against a motion put in this place by my colleague Paul Scar earlier this year calling on Queensland to approve that expansion. Labor voted against that. They voted against jobs. The failure of Labor to be able to support jobs in Queensland should be ringing alarm bells for workers across Australia. The fact that this motion is being brought on by the New South Wales Socialist faction shows that the New South Wales branch also has no regard for workers. It is no wonder the member for Hunter is quaking in his boots. It is no wonder when the whole of his electorate is dependent on mining and Labor are turning their back on mining. Well, I say to the people of Hunter, remember which party stands in this place and supports your jobs. Remember which party will ensure your job has a future. And I say to the people of Queensland that despite the fact that my colleagues couldn't be here due to COVID travel restrictions, Senator Matt Canavan, Senator Susan Macdonald, they stand up for your jobs. They stand up for your industries and they support your workers. And Senator Paul Scar reminded me of that fact just today too. Labor doesn't care about jobs. They don't care about the hundreds of jobs that could be created through the development of high energy, low emissions power plant in central Queensland, just like they don't care about the flow on jobs created when Queensland's commercial and industrial sector gain access to affordable and reliable power. But we care. And that is why we are funding this study to determine the feasibility of such a project. And can I just say, Labor should not hide behind climate change, because this party, who are willing to throw workers out into the cold in the name of climate change, still do not have an emissions reduction target. Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. No, I, it was, I've got Senator Patrick, uh, and then Senator Faruqi, and then I'll come to you, Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I will be relatively uh, brief. Uh, I would actually uh, ask that as uh, coalition senators stand up that uh, they may ask some, uh, answer some questions which I'm a little bit uh, confused about uh, in their contributions, and that is that uh, it appears that on the 8th of February the minister announced up to $4 million of funding uh, for a feasibility study to uh, shine. 
uh, and then on the 10th of February, two days later, then asked them to make a, to, uh, make a submission for a grant. So it seems out of order, and, and I'm hoping that uh, someone might, might be able to explain that. And I do note that a grant has been uh, um, awarded to the company, uh, and uh, that is available on, on the grant's website. Uh, the Commonwealth Grant we the Grants website. So I, I'm guessing that if this disallowance goes ahead, uh, that that uh, that will have to be reversed, or perhaps it's contingent on uh, on the regulation not being disallowed. Now I will uh, actually be supporting this disallowance, and uh, I won't be doing so because of the politics of the Greens or the politics of the Labor Party, or in spite of the politics of the Liberal Party. Um, I come from an engineering background, so I tend to look at the, these things from an engineering uh, perspective. And uh, what I'll say is there are three really important things we need to have when we look at power for Australians. The first is that the power needs to be clean. Okay? And I know uh, people uh, might uh, on, on uh, the other side may uh, question that in some way, but uh, I'll remind the history of uh, the coalition in its support for an, uh, or, or in the proposition for a, uh, an, an emissions intensity scheme. Then they went to a clean energy target, supported by, of course, Dr Finkel, and then uh, moved from there to a, uh, uh, a national energy guarantee. So uh, on the other side of the chamber there has always been uh, some a notion somewhere that uh, that we do need to have uh, clean energy, and so people shouldn't stand up and suggest that there isn't a problem because for a long period of time, at least some people on the other side have recognised that that, that that there is a problem in that space. So clean clean energy is is an in, in, is important. Affordable energy is also important. We have to make sure that the energy uh, that that we have supplied around the country is affordable. The last thing any one of us want is to have someone, uh, an elderly person, uh, someone uh, uh, not being able to turn the heater on at, uh, uh, during winter or the air conditioner on during summer. That's something that we should all seek to avoid. And the last uh, requirement, uh, moving on from cleanliness and from affordability, is to make sure that it's reliable. And as a South Australian, I'm only too mindful of the need to have reliable uh, energy available. And I'm, all, I'm very aware. Uh, in fact, just recently, I've asked questions of uh, the minister, of Minister Taylor, through the minister representing, asking questions about how many times AEMO is intervening in the South Australian energy uh, market. And the, the, the facts of the matter are that about three times a day, on average, AEMO in, in, uh, interferes or, or intervenes into the market to uh, ensure solid supply. And what that tells you is that there is a problem with renewables in respect of reliability. We're not there yet. Okay, so I just wanted to be very uh, forensic and factual about my contribution tonight. Uh, but here's why I won't. Uh, here's why I will be supporting the disallowance. We have a situation where we don't have that reliability, but. Um, uh, you know, there are mechanisms for dealing with that right now. Uh, uh, you know, in, in South Australia, what happens is we, 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 we direct uh, gas turbines to ma make sure that the, the demand is met. But there's no question that uh, as time moves forward, we will get that reliability with renewable energy and the combination of, uh, of batteries and other uh, types of energy. We will get there. There's no question that we will. We're not there yet. Uh, we're not there yet, but we will get there. And um, uh, it's for that reason uh, that it is a backward step to try and invest in in coal. Um, it, it has its place. It, it does provide stability, uh, but it does, but it's the wrong direction. We shouldn't be moving forward with uh, energy that we know is likely to be, uh, well, it is uh, not, not clean. It's unlikely to be uh, affordable um, in comparison and in circumstances where renewable energy will become reliable. Again, so I will be supporting 
the disallowance. Thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. Senator Faruqi. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I rise to support the disallowance motion and associate myself with the comments made by my colleague, Green Senator Waters, Green Senator from Queensland, and I'll say that loud and clear, Green Senator from Qu Queensland, who cares about Queenslanders, who cares about the workers in Queensland, who cares about an environment that they work in is safe and healthy, and who cares about a healthy planet for everyone. I mean, this government is just shameless. And I have to say, I am actually tired of rising up again and again in this chamber to speak about this government's dodgy use of public money and their refusal to act on the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe that is staring down on us. If you can't see it, then you've closed your eyes deliberately. We are in the Order. middle of a climate emergency and things are only going to get worse as this government refuses to take any meaningful action to mitigate the crisis. Bushfires, extreme heat events, drought, flooding and ecological failure of our rivers are becoming more and more common. Millions of lives are at, are at risk. Millions of animals are dying. Across the world, you know, people are suffering the impacts of the climate crisis. Our neighbors in the Pacific are telling us to stop digging up and shipping out coal because they are going underwater. The country that I grew up in, Pakistan, the snows on the absolutely majestic Himalayas are melting as we speak, and they are creating havoc downstream for millions and millions of people who are being flooded every other year. You know, when I started teaching at the University of New South Wales, and that was about 20 years ago, um, I used to ask my student to imagine a time where there would be raging bushfires increasing in intensity every year, where some parts of the world would be in extreme drought and some parts of the world would be flooded, extreme floods, you know, where we would have record levels of species extinction. And you know what? That world is upon us now. So try and do something about it. But instead of doing something about it, this government keeps making things worse by propping up some of their favorite donors, the fossil fuel industry, the coal industry, the coal seam gas industry, and the gas industry, and using public money to buy election outcomes over and over we hear from the fossil fuel lobby and this coal-addicted government that coal is equal to jobs and that coal is equal to cheaper electricity prices. And over and over again, that's been shown to be a lie. It doesn't work anymore. It does not work Order. anymore, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Order. The proposed Collinsville power plant is a great example of that. Even members of the government and some of the most ardent coal fans in the Labour Party have spoken against this coal-fired plant, saying that it's an economic dead end um, and it doesn't stack up either environmentally or economically. So maybe it would be wise for you to listen to them. The government doesn't need a $4 million feasibility study to tell us what we already know, that this is a dud, that this, it's a bloody waste of money. Taxpayers deserve so much better from their government, but obviously you're not going to give it to them. When will you pull your fingers out of your ears and start listening and hearing what people are telling you? When will you open your eyes and face the reality that is in front of us? Coal is a dead end. Coal is a stranded asset. Coal is causing the climate crisis. And coal kills. Have you heard of black lung disease? Do you know how much pollution coal and coal-fired power plants cause? Yeah, go and have a look. See, if you do actually care about workers, if you do care about their health, and if you do care about the health of this planet and people and animals living around the world, then you must wean yourselves off coal. That is the only way. We know that our use and export 
of coal is killing the planet. We are the largest exporter of coal in the world. We can do much better than that. We could be exporting energy produced from hydrogen, from renewable energy. Let's come into the 21st century. We must transition to 100% renewable energy, and we must do it in the next decade. And why we must do it in the next decade is because if we are to have a chance of avoiding the worst of the climate catastrophe, then it has to be done urgently. We must stop new coal-fired power stations and new coal mines and phase out existing coal mines. There are alternatives. It's happening across the world. You must all have heard about renewable energy. You must all have heard about energy from hydrogen. And if you haven't, then maybe you should be listening more to scientists. We must leave the coal in the hole and the oil in the soil. That's the way it has to be, and it must start now. The Greens have a plan to transition our energy system from one we currently have, which is the oldest and the dirtiest in the world. That's where we are at. We could be leaders. We could be leaders in renewable energy. We could move from the oldest and dirtiest system in the world to one of the cleanest, one of the greenest. It would reduce pollution, and it would create thousands of jobs in that process. With large-scale investment in renewable energy, and we do need investment, the government needs to take responsibility for the health of the planet, for the health of Australians, and for the health of the workers. We must have large-scale investment in renewable energy infrastructure and in local manufacturing. Like Senator Patrick, I'm an engineer as well. And I think we need a huge investment to have a renaissance of our manufacturing sector. We've seen through the COVID crisis how lacking in manufacturing we are. This is a real opportunity for us to actually start manufacturing, you know, 21st century manufacturing, that it's sustainable manufacturing. This is why we need to invest in renewable energy. And we can, through that, we can create good, steady, dignified, unionized jobs for hundreds of thousands of people. And that's what an emerging sustainable economy and society looks like. The time has really come. The time is upon us. The time is here to build our way out of the economic and climate crisis we find ourselves in. We don't have to choose between action on climate change and secure, dignified jobs for workers, jobs that keep workers healthy and safe, and that those jobs are not in coal. Those jobs are in sustainable manufacturing in renewable energy. And we can wean ourselves off coal. We can stop burning coal for electricity and move to 100% renewable energy. We can do that. You can keep denying that till the cows come home. That doesn't make it true. That does not make it true, Mr. Acting Deputy President. We, we want to move to a sustainable future for us in Australia and for everyone across the world. And we want to move to this 100% renewable energy future with a just transition for workers who are in the coal industry at the moment. There was an inquiry that went around regional Australia, which I was part of, and people were telling us that that's what they want to do. People in the Hunter Valley were telling us that they want a just transition. They want a plan for this government till, till there are no options left for those communities. Because we know that moving to 100% renewable energy, weaning ourselves off Senate, coal, Senator is affordable, Faru Senator possible, Faruqi, and necessary. In being uh, 7.20, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In these unprecedented times, Australians are reminded that our sovereignty and self-reliance are not abstract concepts unimportant to their daily lives. Australia's economic sovereignty should never be undermined by misplaced economic philosophy. The Hawke-Keating government of the 80s and 90s, in the name of an ideological fantasism known as neoliberalism, neo 
put through a raft of economic reforms that destroyed Australia's economic sovereignty. These reforms facilitated the takeover of our infrastructure by foreign banks, destroyed manufacturing, stole the savings of workers via superannuation and turned higher education into a degree factory that is more concerned about profits rather than ensuring our children reach their full potential. The rot started when Hawke took the Tasmanian government to court, arguing that non-elected foreign bodies should have greater powers than the states. You've got to love it. The United Nations has greater power over our states today than the Prime Minister. But then again, that's what Labor is all about, one world power. And, and they have no respect for the rights and liberties of the Australian people. Then in 1985, Keating as Treasurer allowed foreign banks into Australia. In that year, financial corporations had $10 billion in foreign debt on their books, and non-financial corporations had $35 billion. By 2008, 30 years later, financial corporations had $800 billion in foreign debt an increase of over 80 times since 1985. This explosion in foreign debt was used to turbocharge house prices, enslaving the foreign worker to foreign, uh, Australian worker to foreign banks. Except for compulsory superannuation, no other economic policy has had such a devastating impact on our way of life. Today, house prices are 13 times average earnings. In 1985, it was four times average earnings. This, of course, was Labor's plan to destroy worker independence, enslave the worker to foreign banks run by foreigners and force their parents to send their children to childcare. This entrapment was completed by the introduction of compulsory superannuation, which further impoverished the worker, bonding them closer and closer to the hand of the communists in the government bureaucracy. The long march of the left continues into our individual lives today. Keating's exemption on capital gains tax on housing led to a massive overinvestment in the residential housing market at the expense of productive industries that helped destroy the manufacturing industry. Then there was the Button Plan, created to make Australia competitive. In the end, it only turned Victoria from a mighty manufacturing state to one where very little primary industry takes place, or secondary industry. And might I add, ending what is left seems to be the goal of uh, Daniel Andrews, a deliberate policy of state-forced rationalisation while ending tariffs did not produce a stronger, more efficient industry. It produced nothing, nothing other than a burgeoning communist utopia, or should I say dystopia, in the state of Victoria. Another one of Labor's failed policies was the Dawkins Plan, named after the then Education Minister John Dawkins, where once universities were, were institutions where rigorous intellectual debate, research and training took place, their combination with technical colleges pushed them down a path of becoming nothing more than degree factories. Of course, the greatest damage ever wrought on the Australian public economy was the Hawke-Keating Labor government's superannuation. With assets now reaching approximately 150 per cent of GDP, one third of that superannuation, or almost one third of that superannuation, is invested offshore. Superannuation has shifted money out of the real economy and out of the Australian economy. Over $600 billion in superannuation has been invested offshore. Imagine the economic dividends our country could reap if all this capital was flowing through it. Despite their assertions that superannuation was to safeguard retirement, the fact is there are almost as many people on the pension today as there was in 1992. It has failed to the, deliver the very thing it promised to do—security in retirement. The final destruction of the economy by the Hawke-Keating Labor government came with the decision to sell off CBA. CBA was sold to Commonwealth Bank for a measly $8 billion. Today, it makes more money than that in a year. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As COVID-19 continues to send shockwaves throughout our nation, I wanted to stand here tonight to draw to light some of the particular challenges being faced in my home state of South Australia. 
Because whilst on the health front we're doing pretty well in South Australia, largely in part to the work of our chief medical officer and our health department, we know that many of the economic and social consequences of this pandemic are still hitting us. These consequences are without precedent and they're consequences which my state just simply isn't able to afford. Because my state was already doing it pretty tough economically before the pandemic hit. And in June, we reached our highest rate of unemployment in 20 years at 8.8 per cent. We saw a welcome drop in July, but we know that that figure really is likely to be much higher than the figures reveal. The Treasurer himself said that nationally the real unemployment rate is probably well over what the reported figures are. As of July 2020, for the first time in our history, more than one million Australians are unemployed. Almost 346,000 are young people, at an unacceptable rate of 16.3 per cent. Many of those are in my state of South Australia. And of course, behind each one of these statistics lies a person, lies a family who's lost their jobs, their livelihoods and their security. Families who are desperately clinging on to hope that we'll see this turn around, that we'll see better economic and social days ahead of us soon. And of course, there are those who are still lucky enough to be in work in my state, but for whom work is extremely challenging during this pandemic. I'm thinking here of our retail staff who have seen a 400 per cent increase in customer abuse since the start of the pandemic. Utterly unacceptable treatment of our retail workers at a time that they are working harder than ever. There is no excuse for this behaviour. There is no excuse to take frustration out on our retail workers. They are doing their job. They are doing it well. We are all relying on them now, and it has been unacceptable what they've gone through during this pandemic. Our healthcare workers, too, many have reported being verbally and physically abused by members of the public. This is on top of the stress and pressure they've been facing on the front line of our response to the pandemic. We've seen our nursing staff and our doctors reach out, calling for additional PPE, raising the alarm where they feel like they don't have this concerned about their security at work, concerned about their ability to do their job protecting the people that they care for, doing their job protecting all of us. And our early childhood educators, who have suffered more than many during this pandemic. Along with my colleague, the member for Adelaide, and my, my friend, the Shadow Minister, Amanda Wishworth, the member for Kingston, I recently held a, a forum in Adelaide with these educators. And some of the issues raised included lack of basic and necessary PPE, their fears about a potential second wave of the virus and whether they'd be left on the front line of this and how they could possibly deal with that without support or resources. They reported a lack of consultation from the government as it made hasty and at times radical changes to the way our early childhood sector operates. And of course, their dismay at being the only ones kicked off JobKeeper inexplicably, as if somehow this pandemic didn't reach into the early childhood sector when we know it was one of the places it reached in the deepest and caused the most havoc. All these workers, in addition to our cleaners, our truck drivers, our teachers, our police officers, everyone out there working on the front line of the pandemic, yes, lucky to have a job, but my goodness, what tough jobs they are at the moment and how much they deserve our support and our respect. They deserve our thanks, but they don't just deserve our thanks in words. They deserve our thanks in wages and conditions which reflect the hard work, the incredible work they do, not just during times of the pandemic, but all of the time. If there's ever been a moment in our history to stop and look at our essential workers and say, yes, we see you, we acknowledge you, we know what you are doing, and we value you, we value you in what we pay you. We value you in how we treat you at work. It is now. But instead, from this government, we don't see that. We see an attack on their superannuation, one of the most basic and fundamental principles of equity and equality and fairness in Australia. That's what's coming for these workers. It's a fight that Labor has ahead of us, and we will continue to fight with you on your super, on the way you're treated at work. We will continue to show you our thanks by fighting for you here. There are no easy solutions to this pandemic, of course not, but we must support our vulnerable. We must support those supporting us. It's the only way out of this crisis. We must ensure no one is left behind. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I have spoken numerous times in this chamber about the government's failure to support international students during COVID-19. 
since I sadly, since I spoke on this matter in June, the situation has deteriorated even further for the hundreds of thousands of international students who have been left high and dry. Students who are greedily welcomed here, students who are then treated as cash cows. I'll read out verbatim some of the media headlines from the last few months, which tell you all you need to know about this government's treatment of international students. International students warn livelihoods at risk without welfare safety net. Australia gets poor score on international students. Stranded without support, international students across Australia rely on free food to survive. International students turn to food banks as casual work dries up in second Melbourne lockdown. International students are telling me that they have lost hope, that their troubles have been dismissed, that they are suffering anxiety and depression. They want something more than fake empathy from this government. A survey of temporary visa holders released by Unions New South Wales this month found that between March and May, 60% of international students had lost their jobs and 46% were forced to skip meals on a regular basis because they don't have access to JobKeeper or JobSeeker like others living in Australia. There is no safety net. There is no stopgap. There is only destitution, desperation and poverty. These statistics are completely damning and outrageous. Australia is quite isolated among similar destination countries for international students in our failure to support students during the COVID crisis. In the UK, New Zealand and Canada, there are measures in place to help keep students from going hungry or becoming homeless. There is a lot of anxiety at the moment within Australian tertiary, tertiary education about the return of international students during the COVID crisis. And of course, we should be making safe pathways for international students to fly in and study in Australia if they wish to do so. We should be encouraging diverse global communities at our universities. But after this abject failure to support international students during the pandemic, you have to ask, what is being done to Australia's reputation? Will students continue to want to study here after the terrible treatment that they have been subjected to? I, don't, I wouldn't blame them for striking Australia off from the list of countries that they are considering. The latest data indicates that international student visa applications have plummeted by more than a third during the COVID crisis. And it would be all too easy to blame this squarely on the current border situation and the uncertainty of access to Australia for next years and the years afterwards. International students have been treated like cash cows and denied basic government support during COVID. And this is evidently having an impact on Australia's reputation. A survey of 6,000 international students and temporary visa holders to be released soon by UTS and UNSW academics has found that 59% of international students and backpackers say that following their experience here during the pandemic, they would now be somewhat less likely or far less likely to recommend Australia as a place for others to study or for a working holiday. That's a clear majority. It should terrify the government and it should terrify universities. And it is not helped by the Prime Minister telling international students to go home at the start of the pandemic, nor is it helped by the contributions of government backbenchers like Senator Molan earlier this week saying that our international student intake has led to our universities losing their Australianness. Pushing this us and them division is vile, it is shameful, and it is disgraceful. Associate Professors Lori Berg and Bessina Farbenblum have rightly said in the conversation, Australia has obligations under international human rights laws to ensure every person within its borders has a safe and secure place to live, adequate food and basic health care. Advising temporary visa holders to go home does not diminish these obligations, nor does it absolve Australia of its moral obligations to these people. It encouraged to greatly invest in studying and working here. This government only sees dollar signs when they see international students, not the people who contribute in so many ways to our society and our economy. My heart goes out to students who are doing it incredibly tough right now as a result of this government's heartlessness. Order, Senator Faruqi. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, 
Energy Minister Angus Taylor announced that he has asked the Clean Energy Regulator, with the support of the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, to lead an independent investigation into rooftop solar. Now, this follows a range of really concerning reports about consumer issues arising from that sector, defective installations, the misuse of accreditations, safety and quality concerns and ongoing issues that simply must be addressed. A recent report by the Clean Energy Regulator found that 2.2 per cent of rooftop solar systems were unsafe, while 20 per cent were substandard. Now, this is another really important piece of work from our Energy Minister. It reminds me of the excellent technology roadmap that he published a few months ago, a groundbreaking piece of work that's all about taking the ideology out of how we go about generating energy in this country and focusing on what works, on balance and on delivering the kind of reliability that our market depends upon. The roadmap looked objectively at the baseload generation method used right across the world that has almost no emissions, and that's nuclear energy. This level of objective, science-based policy consideration speaks to the political courage that we can see from the Energy Minister and, indeed, from the Morrison government more generally. Now, those opposite tend to scoff and interject at the mere mention of coal or, indeed, of nuclear energy. They ignore the science of energy generation and are driven instead by their religious-like devotion to renewables themselves. But there's a few facts that they can't get away from. The first is that the best performing sector in Queensland during the COVID pandemic has been the coal industry. The second is that without government subsidies, Queensland's coal mines have seen an increase in jobs of 15 per cent over the May quarter, one of the only sectors in the country that has had great expansion while other parts of the country have struggled. Indeed, I was listening to 4BC this morning and I heard a call in from a bloke named Russell from Dysart. And he called into Neil Breen's show and said that while his community had been utterly abandoned by Queensland Labor with heavy-handed Brisbane-centric restrictions when it came to COVID, local businesses had a lifeline. And that lifeline that was keeping their head above water was coal. And so it's very easy for people in this chamber or people who live in the comfort of our cities to be condescending to people who depend on the coal industry. But every single one of them should think of Russell before they get sanctimonious in here, because a lot of Australia is like Dysart, and these are communities that we can't walk away from. But more and more, those opposite are tempted by the chasing of green preferences in the cities, and they've walked away from the industrial base that once so loyally supported them. But there's a couple of glimmers of light for Labor. Not everybody has completely abandoned Australia's miners, farmers and manufacturers yet. Joel Fitzgibbon, for, in for instance, knows how important baseload energy is. That's why he's effectively threatened to split labour in two. Most sensible people understand how sensible an agnostic energy policy is. The best and most reliable form of energies of forms of energy must not be sacrificed for the sake of fairy tale dreams of cupcakes and rainbows. Coal still matters. It's still an important part of Australia's energy mix. This doesn't have to be a tribal matter. Australia doesn't have to be split in two on the basis of you're either for coal or you're for the environment. You're either for jobs or you're for renewables. It is possible to walk and chew gum. It is possible to have balance in our system, and it is vital that we never forget those regional communities that depend on us here as we make policy to stand up for them.
Senator Polly. We've spoken, and I know I have, on a number of occasions in this place in relation to COVID-19 and the impact that it has had on the country and on my home state of Tasmania. But I think we also have to highlight the good things that have come out of this pandemic and the experience that people are having. I actually think people in Tasmania are kinder to each other, and I hope that doesn't change when we emerge out of this pandemic. We know that our economy is suffering. We know that there's in excess of 30,000 Tasmanians that have either lost their jobs or are underemployed. We know small business is doing it tough. We know our tourism sector is doing it really tough. We know the impact that the shutting down of the airline sector, what that's done to our local economy. But there's been some really good things that have happened. I think there is now a greater appreciation of people who work in retail. The experience that our retail workers had during, particularly in the early weeks of this pandemic, the panic buying at the supermarkets, which was proven to be unnecessary, you know, the abuse uh, that those retail workers had to endure was unfortunate. And I do think, though, people, uh, at least in my home state, have re-evaluated people that have been on the front line, whether it's um, the postie delivering your mail, whether it's the retail workers in your supermarkets or in other outlets. I think there's been a recognition that we are all really reliant on one another. You know, if you're a truckie, we've had to rely on them to ensure that our supplies come through in a timely manner. We know when we had the outbreak, uh, down the northwest coast of Tasmania, that really impacted on the entire state. People were scared. People still are scared uh, about the impact and whether or not once Tasmanians' borders are reopened, whether there is a real risk of a second wave of the pandemic and whether or not there'll be a worse strain that hits our shores. These are all real concerns that people have in the community. And yes, there have been some good things, but there's also been some bad decisions that have been made. We haven't ensured, for instance, in Tasmania that there was enough PPE uh, in our hospital systems. We know we certainly have missed that opportunity in the aged care sector, and I've spoken many times about that. We know we've had to fight very hard to get pandemic leave, and we know that still isn't available for all workers. We know the JobKeeper, we were on about that. Labor has been for quite some time before the government got on board, but they did. So I give them credit for that. They did get on board. We have to ensure, though, that JobKeeper is there for as long as we need it in our communities. Job seeker. I mean, it is really tough. You know, there were aspects of the Tasmanian uh, economy that was doing really quite well before the pandemic. And I give credit where credit's due. But it is going to be tough going forward because the effects of this pandemic aren't going to be over in a matter of weeks and months. It'll be years. It could be a decade. It's going to take a long time to rebuild and gain the confidence. But what we have to do, the most important thing that we can do as elected representatives of the Australian community is to make sure that people feel safe. People feel safe. That's whether it's our older Australians, our older Tasmanians in aged care, residential care, whether it's the most vulnerable, the people that are living on the street, the homeless. We have to be there to give all of these people the reassurance that the Commonwealth government is there doing the right thing by them. So I know that you know, politics is politics, and people will come in this chamber and they'll accuse each other of trying to make political points. At the end of the day, I actually believe that everybody in this chamber is here trying to do the best that they can. But we do have to acknowledge when there's need for the government of the day to step up. There are many occasions, many areas of policy, and aged care is one of those, where we have offered for the last seven years to work with them to address the crisis in aged care. It is now out of control. We've got a Royal Commission that the Prime Minister has used to stall having to resource this sector the way it needs to happen. 
We are always willing to sit down and talk to the government to resolve this aged care Order, crisis. Senator Polly. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a strange world we live in when we need scientific reports to advise a major international sporting body that it's not safe or fair for males to play full contact rugby against women. World Rugby has recently published on its website research findings from a range of experts in biology, physiology, sports science and sports medicine who participated in a process looking at the inclusion of trans athletes in rugby. One of the findings is that there is likely to be at least a 20 to 30 per cent greater risk of injury when a female player is tackled by someone who has gone through male puberty. This research has been reported in some sections of the media recently. Strangely, many mainstream media outlets haven't mentioned it. When Australians hear about this research showing that males have advantages over females in sport, the most common sense a uh, common response, rather, is a complete lack of surprise. Who needs scientific research to tell us that the average male has major advantages in speed, strength and power over the average female? The people who do need to read this research are the CEOs of our peak sporting bodies, because when it comes to protecting the integrity and safety of women's sports, they've completely taken leave of their senses. Sport Australia's guidelines for the inclusion of transgender and gender diverse people in sport make the statement that Australian sporting organisations should base participation in sport on a person's, and I quote, affirmed gender identity and not the sex they were assigned at birth. Along with Sport Australia and the Australian Human Rights Commission, who else has signed up to these guidelines and the idea that your sex should be irrelevant to whether you can compete in women's sport? Just the coalition of major professional and participation sports, which includes Rugby Australia, the Australian Football League, the NRL. These full contact sports have taken the position that women in their competitions had better brace themselves for a 30 per cent increase in their risk of injury so that administrators can pat themselves on the back for being inclusive. The good news is that right now, Rugby Australia has the opportunity to reset the balance and stand up for female athletes. World Rugby has given them the science which quantifies the risks and the disadvantages to women. Rugby Australia should make a stand that women's sport is for females and men's sport is for males. And the other major Australian sports should pull their heads out of the sand, look at the publicly available research and come to the same common sense conclusion. It is not good enough for organised sport to hide behind activist interpretations of the Sex Discrimination Act and claim that the law compels them to prioritise gender identity over sex. It doesn't. If Sport Australia and Australia's major sporting codes won't look at the facts and use their common sense to ensure integrity of their women's competitions at every level, not just at elite competitions, then we've got to start to seriously ask the question as to why Australian taxpayers hand over public money to these sporting codes to promote female participation in sport. On top of ignoring the unfairness and the safety concerns of encouraging biological males to play women's sport, the environment Sport Australia and the major codes have created at the moment is that if you're a female or maybe the parent of a 16-year-old who wants to enjoy playing women's football or women's rugby on a level playing field, well, you better not have a problem with that, because your league is probably signed up to an inclusion policy, like the one advocated in Sport Australia's guidelines, Order. which stipulates that sporting organisations should have a publicly available inclusion policy in place, which clearly articulates that participation in sport should be based on a person's affirmed gender identity. So if you say Order. you're not comfortable Senator playing women's Pratt. contact sports against biological males, you're at risk of breaching your league's inclusion policy and being suspended or even banned. So many women have contacted me with concerns about this issue, but they are worried if they speak publicly or even internally, they might face consequences at their club or at their place of work. Just this week, we've seen yet another example in the United States of a woman being fired by her employer, a literary agent, for tweeting about sex and gender issues. We've seen this happen in the US and in the United Kingdom. How do Australians know that they are able to speak freely about women's rights and the reality of biological sex without being censured or fired by their employer? 
The idea that someone could lose their job or be banned from the sport they love for acknowledging that sex exists should be alarming to every fair-minded Australian. Thank you, Senator Chandler. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30am. See you tomorrow.